This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll, Volume 1. Chapter 1 Ingersoll's Lecture on Gods. Ladies and gentlemen, an honest god is the noblest work of man. Each nation has created a god, and the god has always resembled his creators. He hated and loved what they hated and loved, and he was invariably found on the side of those in power. Each god was intensely patriotic, and detested all nations but his own. All these gods demanded praise, flattery, and worship. Most of them were pleased with sacrifice, and the smell of innocent blood has ever been considered a divine perfume. All these gods have insisted upon having a vast number of priests, and the priests have always insisted upon being supported by the people, and the principal business of these priests has been to boast about their god, and to insist that he could easily vanquish all the other gods put together. These gods have been manufactured after numberless models, and according to the most grotesque fashions. Some have a thousand arms, some a hundred heads, some are adorned with necklaces of living snakes, some are armed with clubs, some with sword and shield, some with bucklers, and some with wings as a cherub. Some were invisible, some would show themselves entire, and some would only show their backs. Some were jealous, some were foolish, some turned themselves into men, some into swans, some into bulls, some into doves, and some into holy ghosts, and made love to the beautiful daughters of men. Some were married, all ought to have been, and some were considered as old bachelors from all eternity. Some had children, and the children were turned into gods and worshipped as their fathers had been. Most of these gods were revengeful, savage, lustful, and ignorant. As they generally depended upon their priests for information, their ignorance can hardly excite our astonishment. These gods did not even know the shape of the worlds they had created, but supposed them perfectly flat. Some thought the day could be lengthened by stopping the sun, that the blowing of horns could throw down the walls of a city, and all knew so little of the real nature of the people they had created that they commanded the people to love them. Some were so ignorant as to suppose that man could believe just as he might desire, or as might command, and to be governed by observation, reason, and experience was a most foul and damning sin. None of these gods could give a true account of the creation of this little earth. All were woefully deficient in geology and astronomy. As a rule, they were most miserable legislators, and as executives they were far inferior to the average of American presidents. The deities have demanded the most abject and degrading obedience. In order to please them, man must lay his very face in the dust. Of course, they have always been partial to the people who created them, and they have generally shown their partiality by assisting those people to rob and destroy others, and to ravish their wives and daughters. Nothing is so pleasing to these gods as the butchery of unbelievers. Nothing so enrages them, even now, as to have someone deny their existence. Few nations have been so poor as to have but one god. Gods were made so easily, and the raw material cost so little, that generally the god market was fairly glutted, and heaven crammed with these phantoms. These gods not only attended to the skies, but were supposed to interfere in all the affairs of men. They presided over everybody and everything. They attended to every department. 
all was supposed to be under their immediate control nothing was too small nothing too large the falling of sparrows and the motions of planets were alike attended to by these industrious and observing deities from their starry thrones they frequently came to the earth for the purpose of imparting information to man it is related of one that he came amid thunderings and lightnings in order to tell the people they should not cook a kid in its mother's milk some left their shining abode to tell women that they should or should not have children to inform a priest how to cut and wear his apron and to give directions as to the proper manner for cleaning the intestines of a bird when the people failed to worship one of these gods or failed to feed and clothe his priests which was much the same thing he generally visited them with pestilence and famine sometimes he allowed some other nation to drag them into slavery to sell their wives and children but generally he glutted his vengeance by murdering their firstborn the priests always did their whole duty not only in predicting these calamities but in proving when they did happen that they were brought upon the people because they had not given quite enough to them these gods differed just as the nations differed the greatest and most powerful had the most powerful gods while the weaker ones were obliged to content themselves with the very offscourings of the heavens each of these gods promised happiness here and hereafter to all his slaves and threatened to eternally punish all who either disbelieved in his existence or suspected that some other god might be his superior but to deny the existence of all gods was and is the crime of crimes redden your hands with human blood blast by slander the fair fame of the innocent strangle the smiling child upon its mother's knees deceive ruin and desert the beautiful girl who loves and trusts you and your case is not hopeless for all this and for all these you may be forgiven for all this and for all these that bankrupt court established by the gospel will give you a discharge but deny the existence of these divine ghosts of these gods and the sweet and tearful face of mercy becomes livid with eternal hate heaven's golden gates are shut and you with an infinite curse ringing in your ears with the brand of infamy upon your brow commence your endless wanderings in the lurid gloom of hell an immortal vagrant an eternal outcast a deathless convict one of these gods and one who demands our love our admiration and our worship and one who is worshipped if mere heartless ceremony is worship gave to his chosen people for their guidance the following laws of war when thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it then proclaim peace unto it and it shall be if it make the answer of peace and open unto thee then it shall be that all people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee and they shall serve thee and if it will make no peace with thee but will make war against thee then thou shalt besiege it and when the lord thy god hath delivered it into thine hands thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword but the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city even all the spoil thereof shalt thou take unto thyself and thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies which the lord thy god hath given thee thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee which are not of the cities of these nations but of the cities of these people which the lord thy god doth give thee for an inheritance thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth is it possible for man to conceive of anything more perfectly infamous can you believe that such directions were given by any except an infinite fiend remember that the army receiving these instructions was one of invasion peace was offered on condition that the people submitting should be the slaves of the invader 
but if any should have the courage to defend their home to fight for the love of wife and child then the sword was to spare none not even the prattling dimpled babe and we are called upon to worship such a god to get upon our knees and tell him that he is good that he is merciful that he is just that he is love we are asked to stifle every noble sentiment of the soul and to trample under foot all the sweet charities of the heart because we refuse to stultify ourselves refuse to become liars we are denounced hated traduced and ostracized here and this same god threatens to torment us in eternal fire the moment death allows him to fiercely clutch our naked helpless souls let the people hate let the god threaten we will educate them and we will despise and defy him the book called the bible is filled with passages equally horrible unjust and atrocious this is the book to read in schools in order to make our children loving kind and gentle this is the book recognized in our constitution as the source of authority and justice strange that no one has ever been persecuted by the church for believing god bad while hundreds of millions have been destroyed for thinking him good the orthodox church will never forgive the universalist for saying god is love it has always been considered as one of the very highest evidence of true and undefiled religion to insist that all men women and children deserve eternal damnation it has always been heresy to say god will at last save all we are asked to justify these frightful passages these infamous laws of war because the bible is the word of god as a matter of fact there never was and there never can be an argument even tending to prove the inspiration of any book whatever in the absence of positive evidence analogy and experience argument is simply impossible and at the very best can only amount to a useless agitation of the air the instant we admit that a book is too sacred to be doubted or even reasoned about we are mental serfs it is infinitely absurd to suppose that a god would address a communication to intelligent beings and yet make it a crime to be punished in eternal flames for them to use their intelligence for the purpose of understanding his communication if we have the right to use our reason we certainly have the right to act in accordance with it and no god can have the right to punish us for such action the doctrine that future happiness depends upon belief is monstrous it is the infamy of infamies the notion that faith in christ is to be rewarded by an eternity of bliss while a dependence upon reason observation and experience merits everlasting pain is too absurd for refutation and can be relieved only by that unhappy mixture of insanity and ignorance called faith what man who ever thinks can believe that blood can appease god and yet our entire system of religion is based upon that belief the jews pacified jehovah with the blood of animals and according to the christian system the blood of jesus softened the heart of god a little and rendered possible the salvation of a fortunate few it is hard to conceive how the human mind can give assent to such terrible ideas or how any sane man can read the bible and still believe in the doctrine of inspiration whether the bible is true or false is of no consequence in comparison with the mental freedom of the race salvation through slavery is worthless salvation from slavery is inestimable as long as man believes the bible to be infallible that is his master the civilization of this century is not the child of faith but of unbelief the result of free thought 
all that is necessary as it seems to me to convince any reasonable person that the bible is simply and purely of human invention of barbarian invention is to read it read it as you would any other book think of it as you would any other get the bandage of reverence from your eyes drive from your heart the phantom of fear push from the throne of your brain the cowled form of superstition then read the holy bible and you will be amazed that you ever for one moment supposed a being of infinite wisdom goodness and purity to be the author of such ignorance and of such atrocity our ancestors not only had their god factories but they made devils as well these devils were generally disgraced and fallen gods some had headed unsuccessful revolts some had been caught sweetly reclining in the shadowy folds of some fleecy clouds kissing the wife of the god of gods these devils generally sympathized with man there is in regard to them a most wonderful fact in nearly all the theologies mythologic and religious the devils have been much more humane and merciful than the gods no devil ever gave one of his generals an order to kill children and to rip open the bodies of pregnant women such barbarities were always ordered by the good gods the pestilences were sent by the most merciful gods the frightful famine during which the dying child with pallid lips sucked the withered bosom of a dead mother was sent by the loving gods no devil was ever charged with such fiendish brutality one of these gods according to the account drowned an entire world with the exception of eight persons the old the young the beautiful and the helpless were remorselessly devoured by the shoreless sea this the most fearful tragedy that the imagination of ignorant priests ever conceived was the act not of a devil but of god so called whom men ignorantly worship unto this day what a stain such an act would leave upon the character of a devil one of the prophets of one of these gods having in his power a captured king hewed him in pieces in the sight of all the people was ever any imp of any devil guilty of such savagery one of these gods is reported to have given the following directions concerning human slavery if thou buy a hebrew servant six years shall he serve and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing if he came in by himself he shall go out by himself if he were married then his wife shall go out with him if his master have given him a wife and she have borne him sons or daughters the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself and if the servant shall plainly say i love my master my wife and my children i will not go out free then his master shall bring him unto the judges he shall also bring him unto the door or unto the doorpost and his master shall bore his ear with an awl and he shall serve him for ever according to this a man was given liberty upon condition that he would desert for ever his wife and child did any devil ever force upon a husband upon a father so cruel and so heartless an alternative who can worship such a god who can bend the knee to such a monster who can pray to such a fiend all these gods threaten to torment forever the souls of their enemies did any devil make so infamous a threat the basest thing recorded of the devil is what he did concerning job and his family and that was done by the express permission of one of these gods and to decide a little difference of opinion between their serene highnesses as to the character of my servant job the first account we have of the devil is found in that purely scientific book called genesis and is as follows now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the lord god had made and he said unto the woman yea hath god said ye shall not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden and the woman said unto the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden 
but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden god hath said ye shall not eat of it neither shall ye touch it lest ye die and the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die for god doth know that in the day ye eat thereof then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the lord god said behold the man has become as one of us to know good and evil and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live for ever therefore the lord god sent him forth from the garden of eden to till the ground from which he was taken so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life according to this account the promise of the devil was fulfilled to the very letter adam and eve did not die and they did become as gods knowing good and evil the account shows however that the gods dreaded education and knowledge then just as they do now the church still faithfully guards the dangerous tree of knowledge and has exerted in all ages her utmost power to keep mankind from eating the fruit thereof the priests have never ceased repeating the old falsehood and the old threat ye shall not eat of it neither shall ye touch it lest ye die from every pulpit comes the same cry born of the same fear lest they eat and become as gods knowing good and evil for this reason religion hates science faith detests reason theology is the sworn enemy of philosophy and the church with its flaming sword still guards the hated tree and like its supposed founder curses to the lowest depths the brave thinkers who eat and become as gods if the account given in genesis is really true ought we not after all to thank this serpent he was the first schoolmaster the first advocate of learning the first enemy of ignorance the first to whisper in human ears the sacred word liberty the creator of ambition the author of modesty of inquiry of doubt of investigation of progress and of civilization give me the storm and the tempest of thought and action rather than the dead calm of ignorance and faith banish me from eden when you will but first let me eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge some nations have borrowed their gods of this number we are compelled to say is our own the jews having ceased to exist as a nation and having no further use for a god our ancestors appropriated him and adopted their devil at the same time this borrowed god is still an object of some adoration and this adopted devil still excites the apprehensions of our people he is still supposed to be setting his traps and snares for the purpose of catching our unwary souls and is still with reasonable success waging the old war against our god to me it seems easy to account for these ideas concerning gods and devils they are a perfectly natural production man has created them all and under the same circumstances will create them again man has not only created all these gods but he has created them out of the materials by which he has been surrounded generally he has modeled them after himself and has given them hands heads feet eyes ears and organs of speech each nation made its gods and devils speak its language not only but put in their mouths the same mistakes in history geography astronomy and in all matters of fact generally made by the people no god was ever in advance of the nation that created him the negroes represented their deities with black skins and curly hair the mongolian gave to him a yellow complexion and dark almond-shaped eyes the jews were not allowed to paint theirs or we should have seen jehovah with a full beard an oval face and an aquiline nose 
zeus was a perfect greek and jove looked as though a member of the roman senate the gods of egypt had the patient face and placid look of the loving people who made them the gods of northern countries were represented warmly clad in robes of fur those of the tropics were naked the gods of india were often mounted upon elephants those of some islanders were great swimmers and the deities of the arctic zone were passionately fond of whale's blubber nearly all people have carved or painted representations of their gods and these representations were by the lower classes generally treated as the real gods and to these images and idols they addressed prayers and offered sacrifice in some countries even at this day if the people after long praying do not obtain their desires they turn their images off as impotent gods or upbraid them in a most reproachful manner loading them with blows and curses how now dog of a spirit they say we give you lodging in a magnificent temple we gild you with gold feed you with the choicest food and offer incense to you yet after all this care you are so ungrateful as to refuse us what we ask hereupon they will pull the god down and drag him through the filth of the street if in the meantime it happens that they obtain their request then with a great deal of ceremony they wash him clean carry him back and place him in his temple again where they fall down and make excuses for what they have done of a truth they say we were a little too hasty and you were a little too long in your grant why should you bring this beating on yourself but what is done cannot be undone let us not think of it any more if you will forget what is past, we will gild you over brighter again than before. Man has never been at a loss for gods. He has worshipped almost everything, including the vilest and most disgusting beasts. He has worshipped fire, earth, air, water, light, stars, and for hundreds of ages prostrated himself before enormous snakes. Savage tribes often make gods of articles they get from civilized people. The Todas worship a cowbell. The Kotas worship two silver plates, which they regard as husband and wife, and another tribe manufactured a god out of a king of hearts. Man, having always been the physical superior of woman, accounts for the fact that most of the high gods have been males. Had woman been the physical superior, the power supposed to be the rule of nature would have been woman, and instead of being represented in the apparel of man, they would have luxuriated in trains, low-necked dresses, laces, and back hair. Nothing can be plainer than that each nation gives to its god its peculiar characteristics, and that every individual gives to his god his personal peculiarities man has no ideas and can have none except those suggested by his surroundings he cannot conceive of anything utterly unlike what he has seen or felt he can exaggerate diminish combine separate deform beautify improve multiply and compare what he sees what he feels what he hears and all of which he takes cognizance through the medium of the senses but he cannot create. Having seen exhibitions of power, he can say, omnipotent. Having lived, he can say, immortality. Knowing something of time, he can say, eternity. Conceiving something of intelligence, he can say, God. Having seen exhibitions of malice, he can say, devil. A few gleams of happiness having fallen athwart the gloom of his life, he can say, Heaven. Pain in its numberless forms having been experienced, he can say, Hell. Yet all these ideas have a foundation in fact, and only a foundation. The superstructure has been reared by exaggerating, diminishing, combining, separating, deforming, beautifying, improving, or multiplying realities, so that the edifice or fabric is but the incongruous grouping of what man has perceived through the medium of the senses. It is as though we should give to a lion the wings of an eagle, the hoofs of a bison, the tail of a horse, the pouch of a kangaroo, and the trunk of an elephant. We have in imagination created an impossible monster. 
and yet the various parts of this monster really exist, so it is with all the gods that man has made. Beyond nature man cannot go even in thought. Above nature he cannot rise, below nature he cannot fall. Man, in his ignorance, supposed that all phenomena were produced by some intelligent powers, and with direct reference to him. To preserve friendly relations with these powers was, and still is, the object of all religions. Man knelt through fear and to implore assistance, or through gratitude for some favor which he supposed had been rendered. He endeavored by supplication to appease some being who, for some reason, had, as he believed, become enraged. The lightning and thunder terrified him. In the presence of the volcano he sank upon his knees. The great forests filled with wild and ferocious beasts, the monstrous serpents crawling in mysterious depths, the boundless sea, the flaming comets, the sinister eclipses, the awful calmness of the stars, and more than all, the perpetual presence of death, convinced him that he was the sport and prey of unseen and malignant powers the strange and frightful diseases to which he was subject, the freezings and burnings of fever, the contortions of epilepsy, the sudden palsies, the darkness of night, and the wild, terrible, and fantastic dreams that filled his brain, satisfied him that he was haunted and pursued by countless spirits of evil. For some reason he supposed that these spirits differed in power, that they were not all alike malevolent that the higher controlled the lower, and that his very existence depended upon gaining the assistance of the more powerful. For this purpose he resorted to prayer, to flattery, to worship, and to sacrifice. These ideas appear to have been almost universal in savage man. For ages all nations supposed that the sick and insane were possessed by evil spirits. For thousands of years the practice of medicine consisted in frightening these spirits away. Usually the priests would make the loudest and most discordant noises possible. They would blow horns, beat upon rude drums, clash cymbals, and in the meantime utter the most unearthly yells. If the noise remedy failed, they would implore the aid of some more powerful spirit. To pacify these spirits was considered of infinite importance. The poor barbarian, knowing that men could be softened by gifts, gave to these spirits that which to him seemed of the most value. With bursting heart he would offer the blood of his dearest child. It was impossible for him to conceive of a god utterly unlike himself, and he naturally supposed that these powers of the air would be affected a little at the sight of so great and so deep a sorrow. It was with the barbarian then as with the civilized now. One class lived upon and made merchandise of the fears of another. Certain persons took it upon themselves to appease the gods, and to instruct the people in their duties to these unseen powers. This was the origin of the priesthood. The priest pretended to stand between the wrath of the gods and the helplessness of man. He was man's attorney at the court of heaven. He carried to the invisible world a flag of truce, a protest, and a request. He came back with a command, with authority, and with power. Man fell upon his knees before his own servant, and the priest, taking advantage of the awe inspired by his supposed influence with the gods, made of his fellow man a cringing hypocrite and slave. Even Christ, the supposed son of God, taught that persons were possessed of evil spirits, and frequently, according to the account, gave proof of his divine origin and mission by frightening droves of devils out of his unfortunate countrymen. Casting out devils was his principal employment, and the devils thus banished generally took occasion to acknowledge him as the true Messiah, which was not only very kind of them, but quite fortunate for him. The religious people have always regarded the testimony of these devils as perfectly conclusive, and the writers of the New Testament quote the words of these imps of darkness with great satisfaction. The fact that Christ could withstand the temptations of the devil was considered as conclusive evidence that he was assisted by some god, or at least by some being superior to man. 
St. Matthew gives an account of an attempt made by the devil to tempt the supposed Son of God, and it has always excited the wonder of Christians that the temptation was so nobly and heroically withstood. The account to which I refer is as follows. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him upon a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The Christians now claim that Jesus was God. If he was God, of course, the devil knew that fact. And yet, according to this account, the devil took the omnipotent God and placed him upon a pinnacle of the temple, and endeavored to induce him to dash himself against the earth. Failing in that, he took the Creator, owner, and governor of the universe up into an exceeding high mountain, and offered him this world, this grain of sand, if he, the God of all the worlds, would fall down and worship him, a poor devil, without even a tax title to one foot of dirt. Is it possible the devil was such an idiot? Should any great credit be given to this deity for not being caught with such chaff? Think of it! The devil, the prince of sharpers, the king of cunning, the master of finesse, trying to bribe God with a grain of sand that belonged to God. Is there in all the religious literature of the world anything more grossly absurd than this? These devils, according to the Bible, were various kinds. Some could speak and hear, others were deaf and dumb. All could not be cast out in the same way. The deaf and dumb spirits were quite difficult to deal with. St. Mark tells of a gentleman who brought his son to Christ. The boy, it seems, was possessed of a dumb spirit, over which the disciples had no control. Jesus said unto the spirit, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee come out of him, and enter no more into him. Whereupon the deaf spirit, having heard what was said, cried out, being dumb, and immediately vacated the premises. The ease with which Christ controlled this deaf and dumb spirit excited the wonder of his disciples, and they asked him privately why they could not cast that spirit out. To which he replied, this kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Is there a Christian in the whole world who would believe such a story if found in any other book? The trouble is, these pious people shut up their reason and then open their Bible. In the olden times the existence of devils was universally admitted. The people had no doubt upon that subject and from such belief it followed as a matter of course that a person, in order to vanquish these devils, had either to be a god or to be assisted by one. All founders of religions have established their claims to divine origin by controlling evil spirits and suspending the laws of nature. Casting out devils was a certificate of divinity. A prophet, unable to cope with the powers of darkness, was regarded with contempt. The utterance of the highest and noblest sentiments, the most blameless and holy life, commanded but little respect, unless accompanied by power to work miracles and command spirits. This belief in good and evil powers had its origin in the fact that man was surrounded by what he was pleased to call good and evil phenomena. Phenomena affecting man pleasantly were ascribed to good spirits while those affecting him unpleasantly or injuriously were ascribed to evil spirits. It being admitted that all phenomena were produced by spirits, 
the spirits were divided according to the phenomena, and the phenomena were good or bad as they affected man. Good spirits were supposed to be the authors of good phenomena, and evil spirits of the evil, so that the idea of a devil has been as universal as the idea of a god. Many writers maintain that an idea to become universal must be true, that all universal ideas are innate, and that innate ideas cannot be false. If the fact that an idea has been universal proves that it is innate, and if the fact that an idea is innate proves that it is correct, then the believer in innate ideas must admit that the evidence of a god superior to nature, and of a devil superior to nature, is exactly the same, and that the existence of such a devil must be as self-evident as the existence of such a god. The truth is, a god was inferred from good, and a devil from bad phenomena. And it is just as natural and logical to suppose that a devil would cause happiness as to suppose that a god would produce misery. Consequently, if an intelligence, infinite and supreme, is the immediate author of all phenomena, it is difficult to determine whether such intelligence is the friend or enemy of man. If phenomena were all good, we might say they were all produced by a perfectly beneficent being. If they were all bad, we might say they were produced by a perfectly malevolent power. But as phenomena are, as they affect man, both good and bad, they must be produced by different and antagonistic spirits, by one who is sometimes actuated by kindness and sometimes by malice, or all must be produced of necessity and without reference to their consequences upon man. The foolish doctrine that all phenomena can be traced to the interference of good and evil spirits has been, and still is, almost universal. That most people still believe in some spirit that can change the natural order of events is proven by the fact that nearly all resort to prayer. Thousands at this very moment are probably imploring some supposed power to interfere in their behalf. Some want health restored, some ask that the loved and absent be watched over and protected, some pray for riches, some for rain, some want diseases stayed, some vainly ask for food, some ask for revivals, a few ask for more wisdom, and now and then one tells the Lord to do as he thinks best. Thousands ask to be protected from the devil, some, like David, pray for revenge, and some implore even God not to lead them into temptation. All these prayers rest upon and are produced by the idea that some power not only can, but probably will, change the order of the universe. This belief has been among the great majority of tribes and nations. All sacred books are filled with the accounts of such interferences, and our own Bible is no exception to this rule. If we believe in a power superior to nature, it is perfectly natural to suppose that such power can and will interfere in the affairs of this world. If there is no interference, of what practical use can such power be? The scriptures give us the most wonderful accounts of divine interference. Animals talk like men. Springs gurgle from dry bones. The sun and moon stop in the heavens in order that General Joshua may have more time to murder. The shadow on a dial goes back ten degrees to convince a petty king of a barbarous people that he is not going to die of a boil. Fire refused to burn, water positively declined to seek its level, but stands up like a wall. Grains of sand become lice, common walking sticks to gratify a mere freak, twist themselves into serpents, and then swallow each other by way of exercise. Murmuring streams, laughing at the attraction of gravitation, run uphill for years, following wandering tribes from a pure love of frolic. Prophecy becomes altogether easier than history. The sons of God become enamored of the world's girls. Women are changed into salt for the purpose of keeping a great event fresh in the minds of man. An excellent article of brimstone is imported from heaven, free of duty. Clothes refuse to wear out for forty years. Birds keep restaurants and feed wandering prophets, free of expense. 
bears tear children in pieces for laughing at old men without wigs muscular development depends upon the length of one's hair dead people come to life simply to get a joke on their enemies and heirs witches and wizards converse freely with the souls of the departed and god himself becomes a stone-cutter and engraver after having been a tailor and dressmaker the veil between heaven and hell was always rent or lifted the shadows of this world the radiance of heaven and the glare of hell mixed and mingled until man became uncertain as to which country he really inhabited man dwelt in an unreal world he mistook his ideas his dreams for real things his fears became terrible and malicious monsters he lived in the midst of furies and fairies nymphs and naiads goblins and ghosts witches and wizards sprites and spooks deities and devils the obscure and gloomy depths were filled with claw and wing with beak and hoof with leering look and sneering mouths with the malice of deformity with the cunning of hatred and with all the slimy forms that fear can draw and paint upon the shadowy canvas of the dark it is enough to make one almost insane with pity to think what man in the long night has suffered of the tortures he has endured surrounded as he supposed by malignant powers and clutched by the fierce phantoms of the air no wonder that he fell upon his trembling knees that he built altars and reddened them even with his own blood no wonder that he implored ignorant priests and impudent magicians for aid no wonder that he crawled groveling in the dust to the temple's door and there in the insanity of despair besought the deaf gods to hear his bitter cry of agony and fear the savage as he emerges from a state of barbarism gradually loses faith in his idols of wood and stone and in their place puts a multitude of spirits as he advances in knowledge he generally discards the petty spirits and in their stead believes in one whom he supposes to be infinite and supreme supposing this great spirit to be superior to nature he offers worship or flattery in exchange for assistance at last finding that he obtains no aid from this supposed deity finding that every search after the absolute must of necessity end in failure finding that man cannot by any possibility conceive of the conditionless he begins to investigate the facts by which he is surrounded and to depend upon himself the people are beginning to think to reason and to investigate slowly painfully but surely the gods are being driven from the earth only upon rare occasions are they even by the most religious supposed to interfere in the affairs of men in most matters we are at last supposed to be free since the invention of steamships and railways so that the products of all countries can be easily interchanged the gods have quit the business of producing famine now and then they kill a child because it is idolized by its parents as a rule they have given up causing accidents on railroads exploding boilers and bursting kerosene lamps cholera yellow fever and smallpox are still considered heavenly weapons but measles itch and ague are now attributed to natural causes as a general thing the gods have stopped drowning children except as a punishment for violating the sabbath they still pay some attention to the affairs of kings men of genius and persons of great wealth but ordinary people are left to shirk for themselves as best they may in wars between great nations the gods still interfere but in prize fights the best man with an honest referee is almost sure to win the church cannot abandon the idea of special providence to give up that doctrine is to give up all the church must insist that prayer is answered that some power superior to nature hears and grants the request of the sincere and humble christian and that this same power in some mysterious way provides for all 
A devout clergyman sought every opportunity to impress upon the mind of his son the fact that God takes care of all his creatures, that the falling sparrow attracts his attentions, and that his loving-kindness is over all his works. Happening one day to see a crane wading in quest of food, the good man pointed out to his son the perfect adaptation of the crane to get his living in that manner. See, said he, how his legs are formed for wading, what a long slender bill he has. Observe how nicely he folds his feet when putting them in or drawing them out of the water. He does not cause the slightest ripple. He is thus enabled to approach the fish without giving them any notice of his arrival. My son, said he, it is impossible to look at that bird without recognizing the design, as well as the goodness of God, in thus providing the means of subsistence. Yes, replied the boy, I think I see the goodness of God, at least so far as the crane is concerned. But, after all, father, don't you think the arrangement is a little tough on the fish? Even the advanced religionist, although disbelieving in any great amount of interference by the gods in this age of the world, still thinks that in the beginning some god made the laws governing the universe. He believes that in consequence of these laws a man can lift a greater weight with than without a lever, that this god so made matter and so established the order of things that two bodies cannot occupy the same space at the same time, so that a body once put in motion will keep moving until it is stopped, so that it is a greater distance around than across a circle, so that a perfect square has four equal sides instead of five or seven. He insists that it took a direct interposition of providence to make the whole greater than a part, and that had it not been for this power superior to nature, twice one might have been more than twice two, and sticks and strings might have had only one end apiece. Like the old Scotch divine, he thanks God that Sunday comes at the end instead of in the middle of the week and that death comes at the close instead of at the commencement of life, thereby giving us time to prepare for that holy day and that most solemn event. These religious people see nothing but design everywhere, and personal intelligent interference in everything. They insist that the universe has been created, and that the adaptation of means to ends is perfectly apparent. They point us to the sunshine, to the flowers, to the April rain, and to all there is of beauty and of use in the world. Did it ever occur to them that a cancer is as beautiful in its development as is the reddest rose, that what they are pleased to call the adaptation of means to ends is as apparent in the cancer as in the April rain? How beautiful the process of digestion! By what ingenious methods the blood is poisoned, so that the cancer shall have food! By what wonderful contrivances the entire system of man is made to pay tribute to this divine and charming cancer! See by what admirable instrumentalities it feeds itself from the surrounding, quivering, dainty flesh! See how it gradually but surely expands and grows, by what marvelous mechanism it is supplied with long and slender roots that reach out to the most secret nerves of pain for sustenance and life. What beautiful colors it presents! Seen through the microscope, it is a miracle of order and beauty. All the ingenuity of man cannot stop its growth. Think of the amount of thought it must have required to invent a way by which the life of one man might be given to produce one cancer. Is it possible to look upon it and doubt that there is design in the universe, and that the inventor of this wonderful cancer must be infinitely powerful, ingenious, and good? We are told that the universe was designed and created and that it is absurd to suppose that matter has existed from eternity, but that it is perfectly self-evident that a god has. 
if a god created the universe then there must have been a time when he commenced to create back of that time there must have been an eternity during which there had existed nothing absolutely nothing except this supposed god according to this theory this god spent an eternity so to speak in an infinite vacuum and in perfect idleness admitting that a god did create the universe the question then arises of what did he create it it certainly was not made of nothing nothing considered in the light of a raw material is a most decided failure it follows then that a god must have made the universe out of himself he being the only existence the universe is material and if it was made of god the god must have been material with this very thought in mind anaximander of miletus said creation is the decomposition of the infinite it has been demonstrated that the earth would fall to the sun only for the fact that it is attracted by other worlds and those worlds must be attracted by other worlds still beyond them and so on without end this proves the material universe to be infinite if an infinite universe has been made out of an infinite god how much of the god is left End part one of Robert G. Ingersoll's lecture on gods. This is a LibriVox recording, read by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during April 2007. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll, Volume 1 Chapter 1, Part 2, Ingersoll's Lecture on Gods The idea of a creative deity is gradually being abandoned, and nearly all truly scientific minds admit that matter must have existed from eternity. It is indestructible, and the indestructible cannot be created it is the crowning glory of our century to have demonstrated the indestructibility and the eternal persistence of force neither matter nor force can be increased nor diminished force cannot exist apart from matter matter exists only in connection with force and consequently a force apart from matter and superior to nature is a demonstrated impossibility force then must have also existed from eternity and could not have been created matter in its countless forms from dead earth to the eyes of those we love and force in all its manifestations from simple motions to the grandest thought deny creation and defy control thought is a form of force we walk with the same force with which we think man is an organism that changes several forms of force into thought force man is a machine into which we put what we call food and produce what we call thought think of that wonderful chemistry by which bread was changed into the divine tragedy of hamlet a god must not only be material but he must be an organism capable of changing other forms of force into thought force this is what we call eating therefore if the god thinks he must eat that is to say he must of necessity have some means of supplying the force with which to think it is impossible to conceive of a being who can eternally impart force to matter and yet have no means of supplying the force thus imparted if neither matter nor force were created what evidence have we then of the existence of a power superior to nature the theologian will probably reply we have law and order cause and effect and beside all this matter could not have put itself in motion suppose for the sake of an argument that there is no being superior to nature and that matter and force have existed from eternity now suppose that two atoms should come together would there be an effect yes 
suppose they came in exactly opposite directions with equal force they would be stopped to say the least this would be an effect if this is so then you have matter force and effect without a being superior to nature now suppose that two other atoms just like the first two should come together under precisely the same circumstances would not the effect be exactly the same yes like causes producing like effects is what we mean by law and order then we have matter force effect law and order without a being superior to nature now we know that every effect must also be a cause and that every cause must be an effect the atoms coming together did produce an effect and as every effect must also be a cause the effect produced by the collision of the atoms must as to something else have been a cause then we have matter force law order cause and effect without a being superior to nature nothing is left for the supernatural but empty space his throne is a void and his boasted realm is without matter without force without law without cause and without effect but what put all this matter in motion if matter and force have existed from eternity then matter must have always been in motion there can be no force without motion force is forever active and there is and there can be no cessation if therefore matter and force have existed from eternity so has motion in the whole universe there is not even one atom in a state of rest a deity outside of nature exists in nothing and is nothing nature embraces with infinite arms all matter and all force that which is beyond her grasp is destitute of both and can hardly be worth the worship and adoration even of a man there is but one way to demonstrate the existence of a power independent of and superior to nature and that is by breaking if only for one moment the continuity of cause and effect pluck from the endless chain of existence one little link stop for one instant the grand procession and you have shown beyond all contradiction that nature has a master change the fact just for one second that matter attracts matter and a god appears the rudest savage has always known this fact and for that reason always demanded the evidence of miracle the founder of a religion must be able to turn water into wine cure with a word the blind and lame and raise with a simple touch the dead to life it was necessary for him to demonstrate to the satisfaction of his barbarian disciple that he was superior to nature in times of ignorance this was easy to do the credulity of the savage was almost boundless to him the marvelous was the beautiful the mysterious was the sublime consequently every religion has for its foundation a miracle that is to say a violation of nature that is to say a falsehood no one in the world's whole history ever attempted to substantiate a truth by a miracle truth scorns the assistance of miracle nothing but falsehood ever attested itself by signs and wonders no miracle ever was performed and no sane man ever thought he had performed one and until one is performed there can be no evidence of the existence of any power superior to and independent of nature the church wishes us to believe let the church or one of its intellectual saints perform a miracle and we will believe we are told that nature has a superior let this superior for one single instant control nature and we will admit the truth of your assertion we have heard talk enough we have listened to all the drowsy idealless vapid sermons that we wish to hear we have read your bible and the works of your best minds we have heard your prayers, your solemn groans, and your reverential amens. 
all these amount to less than nothing we beg at the doors of your churches for just one little fact we pass our hats along your pews and under your pulpits and implore you for just one fact we know all about your mouldy wonders and your stale miracles we want this year's fact we ask only one give us one fact of charity your miracles are too ancient the witnesses have been dead for nearly two thousand years their reputations for truth and veracity in the neighborhood where they resided is wholly unknown to us give us a new miracle and substantiate it by witnesses who still have the cheerful habit of living in this world do not send us to jericho to hear the winding horns nor put us in the fire with shadrach moshech and abednego do not compel us to navigate the sea with captain jonah nor dine with mr ezekiel there is no sort of use in sending us fox-hunting with samson we have positively lost interest in that little speech so eloquently delivered by balaam's inspired donkey it is worse than useless to show us fishes with money in their mouths and call our attention to vast multitudes stuffing themselves with five crackers and two sardines we demand a new miracle and we demand it now let the church furnish at least one or forever after hold her peace in the olden time the church by violating the order of nature proved the existence of her god at that time miracles were performed with the most astonishing ease they became so common that the church ordered her priests to desist and now this same church the people having found so little sense admits not only that she cannot perform a miracle but insists the absence of miracle the steady unbroken march of cause and effect proves the existence of a power superior to nature the fact is however that the indissoluble chain of cause and effect proves exactly the contrary sir william hamilton one of the pillars of modern theology in discussing this very subject uses the following language the phenomena of matter taken by themselves so far from warranting any interference to the existence of a god would on the contrary ground even an argument to his negation the phenomena of a material world are subjected to immutable laws are produced and reproduced in the same invariable succession and manifest only the blind force of mechanical necessity nature is but an endless series of efficient causes she cannot create but she eternally transforms there was no beginning and there can be no end the best minds even in the religious world admit that in material nature there is no evidence of what they are pleased to call a god they find their evidence in the phenomena of intelligence and very innocently assert that intelligence is above and in fact opposed to nature they insist that a man at least is a special creation that he had somewhere in his brain a divine spark a little portion of the great first cause they say that matter cannot produce thought but that thought can produce matter they tell us that man has intelligence and therefore there must be an intelligence greater than his why not say god has intelligence and therefore there must be an intelligence greater than his so far as we know there is no intelligence apart from matter we cannot conceive of thought except as produced within a brain the science by means of which they demonstrate the existence of an impossible intelligence and an incomprehensible power is called metaphysics or theology the theologians admit that the phenomena of matter tend at least to disprove the existence of any power superior to nature 
because in such phenomena we see nothing but an endless chain of efficient causes, nothing but the force of a mechanical necessity. They therefore appeal to what they denominate the phenomena of mind to establish this superior power. The trouble is that in the phenomena of mind we find the same endless chain of efficient causes, the same mechanical necessity. Every thought must have had an efficient cause. Every motive, every desire, every fear, hope, and dream must have been necessarily produced. There is no room in the mind of a man for providence or change. The facts and forces governing thought are as absolute as those governing the motions of the planets. A poem is produced by the forces of nature, and is as necessarily and naturally produced as mountains and seas. You will seek in vain for a thought in man's brain without its efficient cause. Every mental operation is the necessary result of certain facts and conditions. Mental phenomena are considered more complicated than those of matter, and consequently more mysterious. Being more mysterious, they are considered better evidence of the existence of a god. No one infers a god from the simple, from the known, from what is understood, but from the complex, from the unknown and incomprehensible. Our ignorance is God. What we know is science. When we abandon the doctrine that some infinite being created matter and force, and enacted a code of laws for their government, the idea of interference will be lost. The real priest will then be not the mouthpiece of some pretended deity, but the interpreter of nature. From that moment the church ceases to exist. The tapers will die out upon the dusty altar. The moths will eat the fading velvet of pulpit and pew. The Bible will take its place with the Shastras, Puranas, Vedas, Eddas, Sagas, and Korans, and the fetters of a degrading faith will fall from the minds of men. But, says the religionist, you cannot explain everything, you cannot understand everything, and that which you cannot explain, that which you do not comprehend, is my God. We are explaining more every day, we are understanding more every day, consequently your God is growing smaller every day. Nothing daunted, the religionist then insists that nothing can exist without a cause, except cause, and that this uncaused cause is God. To this we again replied, every cause must produce an effect, because until it does produce an effect, it is not a cause. Every effect must in its turn become a cause. Therefore, in the nature of things, there cannot be a last cause, for the reason that a so-called last cause would necessarily produce an effect, and that effect must of necessity become a cause. The converse of these propositions must be true. Every effect must have had a cause, and every cause must have been an effect. Therefore there could have been no first cause. A first cause is just as impossible as a last effect. Beyond the universe there is nothing, and within the universe the supernatural does not and cannot exist. The moment these great truths are understood and admitted, a belief in general or special providence becomes impossible. From that instant men will cease their vain efforts to please an imaginary being, and will give their time and attention to the affairs of this world. They will abandon the idea of attaining any object by prayer and supplication. The element of uncertainty will, in a great measure, be removed from the domain of the future, and man, gathering courage from a succession of victories over the obstructions of nature, will attain a serene grandeur unknown to the disciples of any superstition. 
the plans of mankind will no longer be interfered with by the finger of a supposed omnipotence, and no one will believe that nations or individuals are protected or destroyed by any deity whatever. Science, freed from the chains of pious custom and evangelical prejudice, will, within her sphere, be supreme. The mind will investigate without reverence, and publish its conclusions without fear. Agassiz will no longer hesitate to declare the mosaic cosmogony utterly inconsistent with the demonstrated truths of geology, and will cease pretending any reverence for the Jewish scriptures. The moment science succeeds in rendering the church powerless for evil, the real thinkers will be outspoken. The little flags of truce carried by timid philosophers will disappear, and the cowardly parley will give place to victory, lasting and universal. If we admit that some infinite being has controlled the destinies of persons and people, history becomes a most cruel and bloody farce age after age the strong have trampled upon the weak the crafty and heartless have ensnared and enslaved the simple and innocent and nowhere in the annals of mankind has any god succored the oppressed man should cease to expect aid from on high by this time he should know that heaven has no ear to hear and no hand to help the present is the necessary child of all the past. There has been no chance, and there can be no interference. If abuses are destroyed, man must destroy them. If slaves are freed, man must free them. If new truths are discovered, man must discover them. If the naked are clothed, if the hungry are fed, if justice is done, if labor is rewarded, if superstition is driven from the mind, if the defenseless are protected, and if the right finally triumphs, all must be the work of man. The grand victories of the future must be won by man, and by man alone. Nature, so far as we can discern, without passion and without intention, forms, transforms, and retransforms forever. She neither weeps nor rejoices. She produces man without purpose and obliterates him without regret. She knows no distinction between the beneficial and the hurtful, poison and nutrition, pain and joy, life and death, smiles and tears are alike to her. She is neither merciful nor cruel. She cannot be flattered by worship, nor melted by tears. She does not know even the attitude of prayer. She appreciates no difference between poison in the fangs of snakes and mercy in the hearts of men. Only through man does nature take cognizance of the good, the true, and the beautiful. And so far as we know, man is the highest intelligence. And yet man continues to believe that there is some power independent of and superior to nature, and still endeavors by form, ceremony, supplication, hypocrisy, to obtain its aid. His best energies have been wasted in the service of this phantom. The horrors of witchcraft were all born of an ignorant belief in the existence of a totally depraved being superior to nature, acting in perfect independence of her laws. And all religious superstition has had for its basis a belief in at least two beings, one good and the other bad, both of whom could arbitrarily change the order of the universe. The history of religion is simply the story of man's efforts in all ages to avoid one of these powers and to pacify the other. Both powers have inspired little else than abject fear, the cold calculating sneer of the devil and the frown of God were equally terrible. 
in any event man's fate was to be arbitrarily fixed forever by an unknown power superior to all law and to all fact until this belief is thrown aside man must consider himself the slave of phantom masters neither of whom promise liberty in this world nor in the next man must learn to rely upon himself reading bibles will not protect him from the blasts of winter but houses fires and clothing will to prevent famine one plough is worth a million sermons and even patent medicines will cure more diseases than all the prayers uttered since the beginning of the world although many eminent men have endeavored to harmonize necessity and free will the existence of evil and the infinite power and goodness of god they have succeeded only in producing learned and ingenious failures immense efforts have been made to reconcile ideas utterly inconsistent with the facts by which we are surrounded and all persons who have failed to perceive the pretended reconciliation have been denounced as infidels atheists and scoffers the whole power of the church has been brought to bear against philosophers and scientists in order to compel a denial of the authority of demonstration and to induce some judas to betray reason one of the saviors of mankind during that frightful period known as the dark ages faith reigned with scarcely rebellious subject her temples were carpeted with knees and the wealth of nations adorned her countless shrines the great painters prostituted their genius to immortalize her vagaries while the poets enshrined them in song at her bidding man covered the earth with blood the scales of justice were turned with gold and for her use were invented all the cunning instruments of pain she built cathedrals for god and dungeons for men she peopled the clouds with angels and the earth with slaves for centuries the world was retracing its steps going steadily back toward barbaric night a few infidels a few heretics cried halt to the great rabble of ignorant devotion and made it possible for the genius of the nineteenth century to revolutionize the cruel creeds and superstitions of mankind the thoughts of man in order to be of any real worth must be free under the influence of fear the brain is paralyzed and instead of bravely solving a problem for itself tremblingly adopts the solution of another as long as a majority of men will cringe to the very earth before some petty prince or king what must be the infinite abjectness of their little souls in the presence of their supposed creator and god under such circumstances what can their thoughts be worth the originality of repetition and the mental vigor of acquiescence are all that we have any right to expect from the christian world as long as every question is answered by the word god scientific inquiry is simply impossible as fast as phenomena are satisfactorily explained the domain of the power supposed to be superior to nature must decrease while the horizon of the known must as constantly continue to enlarge it is no longer satisfactory to account for the fall and rise of nations by saying it is the will of god such an explanation puts ignorance and education upon exact equality and does away with the idea of really accounting for anything whatever will the religionist pretend that the real end of science is to ascertain how and why god acts science from such a standpoint would consist in investigating the law of arbitrary action and in a grand endeavor to ascertain the rule necessarily obeyed by infinite caprice 
from a philosophical point of view science is knowledge of the laws of life of the condition of happiness of the facts by which we are surrounded and the relations we sustain to men and things by means of which man so to speak subjugates nature and bends the elemental powers to his will making blind force the servant of his brain a belief in special providence does away with the spirit of investigation and is inconsistent with personal efforts why should man endeavor to thwart the designs of god which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit under the influence of this belief man basking in the sunshine of a delusion considers the lilies of the field and refuses to take any thought for the morrow believing himself in the power of an infinite being who can at any moment dash him to the lowest hell or raise him to the highest heaven he necessarily abandons the idea of accomplishing anything by his own efforts so long as this belief was general the world was filled with ignorance superstition and misery the energies of man were wasted in a vain effort to obtain the aid of this power supposed to be superior to nature for countless ages even men were sacrificed upon the altar of this impossible god to please him mothers have shed the blood of their own babies martyrs have chanted triumphant songs in the midst of flames priests have gorged themselves with blood nuns have forsworn the ecstasies of love old men have tremblingly implored women have sobbed and entreated every pain has been endured and every horror has been perpetrated through the dim long years that have fled humanity has suffered more than can be conceived most of the misery has been endured by the weak the loving and the innocent women have been treated like poisonous beasts and little children trampled upon as though they had been vermin numberless altars have been reddened even with the blood of babies beautiful girls have been given to slimy serpents whole races of men doomed to centuries of slavery everywhere there has been outrage beyond the power of genius to express during all these years the suffering have supplicated the withered lips of famine have prayed the pale victims have implored and heaven has been deaf and blind of what use have the gods been to man it is no answer to say that some god created the world established certain laws and then turned his attention to other matters leaving his children weak ignorant and unaided to fight the battle of life alone it is no solution to declare that in some other world this god will render a few or even all of his subjects happy what right have we to expect that a perfectly wise good and powerful being will ever do better than he has done and is doing the world is filled with imperfections if it was made by an infinite being what reason have we for saying that he will render it nearer perfect than it is now if the infinite father allows a majority of his children to live in ignorance and wretchedness now what evidence is there that he will ever improve their condition will god have more power will he become more merciful will his love for his poor creatures increase can the conduct of infinite wisdom power and love ever change is the infinite capable of any improvement whatever we are informed by the clergy that this world is a kind of school that the evils by which we are surrounded are for the purpose of developing our souls and that only by suffering can men become pure strong virtuous and grand supposing this to be true what is to become of those who die in infancy the little children according to this philosophy can never be developed they were so unfortunate as to escape the ennobling influences of pain and misery and as a consequence are doomed to an eternity of mental inferiority 
if the clergy are right on this question none are so unfortunate as the happy and we should envy only the suffering and distressed if evil is necessary to the development of man in this life how is it possible for the soul to improve in the perfect joy of paradise since paley found his watch the argument of design has been relied upon as unanswerable the church teaches that this world and all that it contains were created substantially as we now see them that the grasses the flowers the trees and all animals including man were special creations and that they sustain no necessary relation to each other the most orthodox will admit that some earth has been washed into the sea that the sea has encroached a little upon the land and that some mountains may be a trifle lower than in the morning of creation the theory of gradual development was unknown to our fathers the idea of evolution did not occur to them our fathers looked upon the then arrangement of things as the primal arrangement the earth appeared to them fresh from the hands of a deity they knew nothing of the slow evolutions of countless years but supposed that the almost infinite variety of vegetable and animal forms had existed from the first suppose that upon some island we should find a man a million years of age and suppose that we should find him in the possession of a most beautiful carriage constructed upon the most perfect model and suppose further that he should tell us that it was the result of several hundred thousand years of labor and of thought that for fifty thousand years he used as flat a log as he could find before it occurred to him that by splitting the log he could have the same surface with only half the weight that it took him many thousand years to invent wheels for this log that the wheels he first used were solid and that fifty thousand years of thought suggested the use of spokes and tire that for many centuries he used the wheels without linchpins that it took a hundred thousand years more to think of using four wheels instead of two that for ages he walked behind the carriage when going downhill in order to hold it back and that only by a lucky chance he invented the tongue would we conclude that this man from the very first had been an infinitely ingenious and perfect mechanic suppose we found him living in an elegant mansion and he should inform us that he lived in that house for five hundred thousand years before he thought of putting on a roof and that he had but recently invented windows and doors would we say that from the beginning he had been an infinite accomplished and scientific architect does not an improvement in the things created show the corresponding improvement in the creator would an infinitely wise good and powerful god intending to produce man commence with the lowest possible forms of life with the simplest organism that can be imagined and during immeasurable periods of time slowly and almost imperceptibly improve upon the rude beginning until man was evolved would countless ages thus be wasted in the production of awkward forms afterward abandoned can the intelligence of man discover the least wisdom in covering the earth with crawling creeping horrors that live only upon the agonies and pangs of others can we see the propriety of so constructing the earth that only an insignificant portion of its surface is capable of producing an intelligent man who can appreciate the mercy of so making the world that all animals devour animals so that every mouth is a slaughterhouse and every stomach a tomb is it possible to discover infinite intelligence and love in universal and eternal carnage what would we think of a father who should give a farm to his children and before giving them possession should plant upon it thousands of deadly shrubs and vines should stock it with ferocious beasts and poisonous reptiles should take pains to put a few swamps in the neighborhood to breed malaria 
should so arrange matters that the ground would occasionally open and swallow a few of his darlings, and besides all this should establish a few volcanoes in the immediate vicinity that might at any moment overwhelm his children with rivers of fire. Suppose that this father neglected to tell his children which of the plants were deadly, that the reptiles were poisonous, failed to say anything about the earthquakes, and kept the volcano business a profound secret. Would we pronounce him angel or fiend? And yet this is exactly what the orthodox God has done. According to the theologians, God prepared this globe expressly for the habitation of his loved children. And yet he filled the forests with ferocious beasts, placed serpents in every path, stuffed the world with earthquakes, and adorned its surface with mountains of flame. Notwithstanding all this, we are told that the world is perfect, that it was created by a perfect being, and is therefore necessarily perfect. The next moment these same persons will tell us that the world was cursed, covered with brambles, thistles, and thorns, and that man was doomed to disease and death, simply because our poor dear mother ate an apple, contrary to the command of an arbitrary god. A very pious friend of mine, having heard that I had said the world was full of imperfections, asked me if the report was true. Upon being informed that it was, he expressed great surprise that any one could be guilty of such presumption. He said that in his judgment it was impossible to point out an imperfection. Be kind enough, said he, to name even one improvement that you could make if you had the power. Well, said I, I would make good health catching instead of disease. The truth is, it is impossible to harmonize all the ills and pains and agonies of this world with the idea that we were created by and are watched over and protected by an infinitely wise, powerful, and beneficent God who is superior to and independent of nature. The clergy, however, balance all the real ills of this life with the expected joys of the next. We are assured that all is perfection in heaven. There the skies are cloudless. There all is serenity and peace. Here empires may be overthrown, dynasties may be extinguished in blood, millions of slaves may toil neath the fierce rays of the sun and the cruel strokes of the lash, yet all is happiness in heaven. Pestilence may strew the earth with corpses of the loved, the survivors may bend above them in agony, yet the placid bosom of heaven is unruffled. Children may expire vainly asking for bread. Babies may be devoured by serpents, while the gods sit smiling in the clouds. The innocent may languish unto death in the obscurity of dungeons. Brave men and heroic women may be changed to ashes at the bigot's stake, while heaven is filled with song and joy. Out on the wide sea, in darkness and in storm, the shipwrecked struggle with the cruel waves, while the angels play upon their golden harps. The streets of the world are filled with the diseased, the deformed, and the helpless. The chambers of pain are crowded with the pale forms of the suffering, while the angels float and fly in the happy realms of day. In heaven, they are too happy to have sympathy, too busy singing to aid the imploring and distressed. Their eyes are blinded, their ears are stopped, and their hearts are turned to stone by the infinite selfishness of joy. The saved mariner is too happy when he touches the shore to give a moment's thought to his drowning brothers. With the indifference of happiness, with the contempt of bliss, Heaven barely glances at the miseries of earth. Cities are devoured by the rushing lava. The earth opens and thousands perish. Women raise their clasped hands towards heaven, but the gods are too happy to aid their children. The smiles of the deities are unacquainted with the tears of men. 
the shouts of heaven drown the sobs of earth having shown how man created gods and how he became the trembling slave of his own creation the questions naturally arise how did he free himself even a little from these monarchs of the sky from these despots of the clouds from this aristocracy of the air how did he even to the extent that he has outgrow his ignorant abject terror and throw off the yoke of superstition probably the first thing that tended to disabuse his mind was the discovery of order of regularity of periodicity in the universe from this he began to suspect that everything did not happen purely with reference to him he noticed that whatever he might do the motions of the planets were always the same that eclipses were periodical and that even comets came at certain intervals this convinced him that eclipses and comets had nothing to do with him and that his conduct had nothing to do with them he perceived that they were not caused for his benefit or injury he thus learned to regard them with admiration instead of fear he began to suspect that famine was not sent by some enraged and revengeful deity but resulted often from the neglect and ignorance of man he learned that diseases were not produced by evil spirits he found that sickness was occasioned by natural causes and would be cured by natural means he demonstrated to his own satisfaction at least that prayer is not a medicine he found by sad experience that his gods were of no practical use as they never assisted him except when he was perfectly able to help himself at last he began to discover that his individual action had nothing whatever to do with strange appearances in the heavens that it was impossible for him to be bad enough to cause a whirlwind or good enough to stop one after many centuries of thought he about half concluded that making mouths at a priest would not necessarily cause an earthquake he noticed and no doubt with considerable astonishment that very good men were occasionally struck by lightning while very bad ones escaped he was frequently forced to the painful conclusion and it is the most painful to which any human being ever was forced that the right did not always prevail he noticed that the gods did not interfere in behalf of the weak and innocent he was now and then astonished by seeing an unbeliever in the enjoyment of most excellent health he finally ascertained that there could be no possible connection between an unusually severe winter and his failure to give sheep to a priest he began to suspect that the order of the universe was not constantly being changed to assist him because he repeated a creed he observed that some children would steal after having been regularly baptized he noticed a vast difference between religions and justice and that the worshippers of the same god took delight in cutting each other's throats he saw that these religious disputes filled the world with hatred and slavery at last he had the courage to suspect that no god at any time interferes with the order of events he learned a few facts and these facts positively refused to harmonize with the ignorant superstitions of his fathers finding his sacred books incorrect and false in some particulars his faith in their authenticity began to be shaken finding his priests ignorant on some points he began to lose respect for the cloth this was the commencement of intellectual freedom the civilization of man has increased just to the same extent that religious power has decreased the intellectual advancement of man depends upon how often he can exchange an old superstition for a new truth the church never enabled a human being to make even one of these exchanges on the contrary all her power has been used to prevent them 
in spite however of the church man found that some of his religious conceptions were wrong by reading his bible he found that the ideas of his god were more cruel and brutal than those of the most depraved savage he also discovered that this holy book was filled with ignorance and that it must have been written by persons wholly unacquainted with the nature of the phenomena by which we are surrounded and now and then some man had the goodness and courage to speak his honest thoughts in every age some thinker some doubter some investigator some hater of hypocrisy some despiser of sham some brave lover of the right has gladly proudly and heroically braved the ignorant fury of superstition for the sake of man and truth these divine men were generally torn to pieces by the worshippers of the gods socrates was poisoned because he lacked reverence for some of the deities christ was crucified by the religious rabble for the crime of blasphemy nothing is more gratifying to a religionist than to destroy his enemies at the command of god religious persecution springs from a due admixture of love towards god and hatred towards man the terrible religious wars that inundated the world with blood tended at least to bring all religion into disgrace and hatred thoughtful people began to question the divine origin of a religion that made its believers hold the rights of others in absolute contempt a few began to compare christianity with the religions of heathen people and were forced to admit that the difference was hardly worth dying for they also found that other nations were even happier and more prosperous than their own they began to suspect that their religion after all was not of much real value for three hundred years the christian world endeavored to rescue from the infidel the empty sepulchre of christ for three hundred years the armies of the cross were baffled and beaten by the victorious hosts of an impudent impostor this immense fact sowed the seeds of distrust throughout all christendom and millions began to lose confidence in a god who had been vanquished by mohammed the people also found that commerce made friends where religion made enemies and that religious zeal was utterly incompatible with peace between nations or individuals they discovered that those who loved the gods most were apt to love men least that the arrogance of universal forgiveness was amazing that the most malicious had the effrontery to pray for their enemies and that humility and tyranny were the fruit of the same tree for ages a deadly conflict has been waged between a few brave men and women of thought and genius upon the one side and the great ignorant religious mass on the other this is the war between science and faith the few have appealed to reason to honor to law to freedom to the known and to happiness here in this world the many have appealed to prejudice to fear to miracle to slavery to the unknown and to misery hereafter the few have said think the many have said believe the first doubt was the womb and cradle of progress and from the first doubt man has continued to advance men began to investigate and the church began to oppose the astronomer scanned the heavens while the church branded his grand forehead with the word infidel and now not a glittering star in all the vast expanse bears a christian name in spite of all religion the geologist penetrated the earth read her history in books of stone and found hidden within her bosom souvenirs of all the ages old ideas perished in the retort of the chemist useful truths took their places one by one religious conceptions have been placed in the crucible of science and thus far nothing but dross has been found a new world has been discovered by the microscope 
everywhere has been found the infinite in every direction man has investigated and explored and nowhere in earth or stars has been found the footstep of any being superior to or independent of nature nowhere has been discovered the slightest evidence of any interference from without these are the sublime truths that enable man to throw off the yoke of superstition these are the splendid facts that snatched the sceptre of authority from the hands of the priests in the vast cemetery called the past are most of the religions of men and there too are nearly all their gods the sacred temples of india were ruins long ago over column and cornice over the painted and pictured walls cling and creep the trailing vines brahma the golden with four heads and four arms vishnu the sombre the punisher of the wicked with his three eyes his crescent and his necklace of skulls shiva the destroyer red with seas of blood kali the goddess draupadi the white-armed and krishna the christ all passed away and left the thrones of heaven desolate along the banks of the sacred nile isis no longer wandering weeps searching for the dead osiris the shadow of typhon's scowl falls no more upon the waves the sun rises as of yore and his golden beams still smite the lips of memnon but memnon is as voiceless as the sphinx the sacred fanes are lost in desert sands the dusty mummies are still waiting for the resurrection promised by their priests and the old beliefs wrought in curiously sculptured stone sleep in the mystery of a language lost and dead odin the author of life and soul vilian ve and the mighty giant emir strode long ago from the icy halls of the north and thor with iron glove and glittering hammer dashes mountains to the earth no more broken are the circles and the cromlechs of the ancient druids fallen upon the summits of the hills and covered with the centuries moss are the sacred cairns the divine fires of persia and of the aztecs have died out in the ashes of the past and there is none to rekindle and none to feed the holy flames the harp of orpheus is still the drained cup of bacchus has been thrown aside venus lies dead in stone and her white bosom heaves no more with love the streams still murmur but no naiads bathe the trees still wave but in the forest isles no dryads dance the gods have flown from high olympus not even the beautiful women can lure them back and danae lies unnoticed naked to the stars hushed for ever are the thunders of sinai lost are the voices of the prophets and the land once flowing with milk and honey is but a desert and waste one by one the myths have faded from the clouds one by one the phantom host has disappeared and one by one facts truths and realities have taken their places the supernatural has almost gone but the natural remains the gods have fled but man is here nations like individuals have their periods of youth of manhood and decay religions are the same the same inexorable destiny awaits them all the gods created by the nations must perish with their creators they were created by men and like men they must pass away the deities of one age are the bywords of the next the religion of one day and country is no more exempt from the sneer of the future than others have been when india was supreme brahma sat upon the world's throne when the sceptre passed to egypt isis and osiris received the homage of mankind greece with her fierce valor swept to empire and zeus put on the purple of authority the earth trembled with the tread of rome's intrepid sons and jove grasped with mailed hand the thunderbolts of heaven rome fell and christians from her territory with the red sword of war carved out the ruling nations of the world and now christ sits upon the old throne 
who will be his successor day by day religious conceptions grow less and less intense day by day the old spirit dies out of book and creed the burning enthusiasm the quenchless zeal of the early church have gone never never to return the ceremonies remain but the ancient faith is fading out of the human heart the worn-out arguments fail to convince and denunciations that once blanched the faces of a race excite in us only derision and disgust as time rolls on the miracles grow mean and small and the evidences our fathers thought conclusive utterly fail to satisfy us there is an irrepressible conflict between religion and science and they cannot peaceably occupy the same brain nor the same world while utterly discarding all creeds and denying the truth of all religions there is neither in my heart nor upon my lips a sneer for the hopeful loving and tender souls who believe that from all this discord will result a perfect harmony that every evil will in some mysterious way become a good and that above and over all there is a being who in some way will reclaim and glorify every one of the children of men but for those who heartlessly try to prove that salvation is almost impossible that damnation is almost certain that the highway of the universe leads to hell who fill life with fear and death with horror who curse the cradle and mock the tomb it is impossible to entertain other than feelings of pity contempt and scorn reason observation and experience the holy trinity of science have taught us that happiness is the only good that the time to be happy is now and the way to be happy is to make others so this is enough for us in this belief we are content to live and die if by any possibility the existence of a power superior to and independent of nature shall be demonstrated there will then be time enough to kneel until then let us stand erect notwithstanding the fact that infidels in all ages have battled for the rights of man and have at all times been the fearless advocates of liberty and justice we are constantly charged by the church with tearing down without building again the church should by this time know that it is utterly impossible to rob men of their opinions the history of religious persecutions fully establishes the fact that the mind necessarily resists and defies every attempt to control it by violence the mind necessarily clings to old ideas until prepared for the new the moment we comprehend the truth all erroneous ideas are of necessity cast aside a surgeon once called upon a poor cripple and kindly offered to render him any assistance in his power the surgeon began to discourse very learnedly upon the nature and origin of disease of the curative properties of certain medicines of the advantages of exercise air and light and of the various ways in which health and strength could be restored these remarks were so full of good sense and discovered so much profound thought and accurate knowledge that the cripple becoming thoroughly alarmed cried out do not i pray you take away my crutches they are my only support and without them i should be miserable indeed i am not going said the surgeon to take away your crutches i am going to cure you and then you will throw the crutches away yourself for the vagaries of the clouds the infidels propose to substitute the realities of the earth for the superstition the splendid demonstrations and achievements of science and for the theological tyranny the chainless liberty of thought we do not say we have discovered all that our doctrines are the all in all in truth 
we know of no end to the development of man we cannot unravel the infinite complications of matter and force the history of one monad is as unknown as that of the universe one drop of water is as wonderful as all the seas one leaf as all the forests and one grain of sand as all the stars we are not endeavoring to chain the future but to free the present we are not foregoing fetters for our children, but we are breaking those our fathers made for us. We are the advocates of inquiry, of investigation and thought. This of itself is an admission that we are not perfectly satisfied with all our conclusions. Philosophy has not the egotism of faith. While superstition builds walls and creates obstructions, science opens all the highways of thought. We do not pretend to have circumnavigated everything and to have solved all difficulties, but we do believe that it is better to love men than to fear gods, that it is grander and nobler to think and investigate for yourself than to repeat a creed. We are satisfied that there can be but little liberty on earth while men worship a tyrant in heaven. We do not expect to accomplish everything in our day, but we want to do what good we can, and to render all the service possible in the holy cause of human progress. We know that doing away with gods and supernatural persons and powers is not an end. It is a means to an end the real end being the happiness of man. Felling forests is not the end of agriculture. Driving pirates from the sea is not all there is of commerce. We are laying the foundations of a grand temple of the future, not the temple of all the gods, but of all the people, wherein with appropriate rites will be celebrated the religion of humanity. We are doing what little we can to hasten the coming of the day when society shall cease producing millionaires and mendicants, gorged indolence and famished industry, truth in rags and superstition robed and crowned. We are looking for the time when the useful shall be the honorable, and when reason, throned upon the world's brain, shall be the king of kings and the god of gods. End of Ingersoll's Lecture on the Gods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during April 2007. Ingersoll's Lecture on Ghosts, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the book Lectures of Colonel R. G. Ingersoll, Ingersoll's Lecture on Ghosts. Ladies and gentlemen, in the first place, allow me to tender my sincere thanks to the clergy of this city. I feel that I am greatly indebted to them for this magnificent audience. It has been said, and I believe it myself, that there is a vast amount of intolerance in the church of today. But when twenty-four clergymen, three of whom I believe are bishops, act as my advance agents, without expecting any remuneration or reward in this world, I must admit that perhaps I was mistaken on the question of intolerance. And I will say further that against those men I have not the slightest feeling in the world. Every man is the product of his own surroundings. He is the product of every circumstance that has ever touched him. He is the product, to a certain degree, of the religion and creed of his day. And when men show the slightest intolerance, I blame the creed. I blame the religion. I blame the superstition that forced them to do so. I do not blame those men." Allow me to say further that this world is not in my judgment yet perfect. I am doing in a very feeble way, to be sure, but I am still endeavoring, according to my idea, to make this world just a little better, to give a little more liberty to men, a little more liberty to women. 
I believe in the government of kindness. I believe in truth, in investigation, in free thought. I do not believe that the hand of want will be eternally extended to the world. I do not believe that the prison will forever scar the ground. I do not believe that the shadow of the gallows will forever curse the earth. I do not believe that it will always be true that the men who do the most work will have the least to wear and the least to eat. I do believe that the time will come when liberty and morality and justice, like the rings of Saturn, will surround the world, that the world will be better, and every true man and every free man will do what he can to hasten the coming of the religion of human advancement. I understand that for the thousands and thousands of years that have gone by, all questions have been settled by religion. I understand that during all this time the people have gotten their information from the sacerdotal class, from priests. I know that when India was supreme they worshipped Brahma and Vishnu, and that when Rome held in its hand the red sword of war they worshipped Jove, and I know now that our religion has swept to the top. Any man living in India a few hundred or thousand years ago would have said, this is the only true religion. Why? Because here is the only true civilization. A man afterward, living in Egypt, would have said, This is the only true religion, because we have the best civilization. A Greek in Athens would have said, This is the only true religion. And a Roman would have said, We have the true religion. And now, those religions all having died, although they were all true religions, we say ours is the only religion, because we are the greatest commercial nation in the world. There will come other nations. There will come other religions. Man has made every religion in this world, in my judgment, and the religion has been good or bad according as the men who made it were good or bad. If they were savages and barbarians, they made a god like the Jehovah of the Jews. If they were civilized, if they were kind and tender, they filled the heavens with kindness and love. Every man makes his own god. Show me the god a man worships, and I will tell you what kind of man he is. Everyone makes his own god, everyone worships his own god, and if you are a civilized man, you will have a civilized god. And we have been civilizing ours for hundreds and hundreds of years. He is getting better every day. I am going to tell you tonight just exactly what I think. The other lecture I delivered here was my conservative lecture. This is my radical one. We even hear it suggested that our religion, our Bible, has given us all we have of prosperity and greatness and grandeur. I deny it. We have become civilized in spite of it, and I will show you tonight that the obstruction that every science has had is what we have been pleased to call our religion, or superstition. I had a conversation with a gentleman once. And these gentlemen are always mistaking something that goes along with a thing for the cause of the thing. And he stated to me that his particular religion was the cause of all advancement. I said to him, no, sir. The causes of all advancement, in my judgment, are plug hats and suspenders. And I said to him, you go to Turkey, where they are semi-barbarians, and you won't find a pair of suspenders or a plug hat in all that country. You go to Russia, and you will find now and then a pair of suspenders at Moscow or St. Petersburg. You go on down till you strike Austria, and black hats begin. Then you go on to Paris, Berlin, and New York, and you will find everybody wears suspenders, and everybody wears black hats. Wherever you find education and music, there you will find black hats and suspenders. He said that any man who said to him that plug hats and suspenders had done more for mankind than the Bible and religion, he would not talk to. As a matter of fact, we are controlled today by men who do not exist. We are controlled today by phenomena that never did exist. We are controlled by ghosts and dead men, 
and in the grasp of death is a sceptre that controls the living present i propose that we shall govern ourselves i propose that we shall let the past go and let the dead past bury the dead past i believe the american people have brains enough and nerve enough and courage enough to control and govern themselves without any assistance from dust or ghosts that is my doctrine and i am going to do what i can while i live to increase that feeling of independence and manhood in the american people we can control ourselves i believe in the gospel of this world i believe in happiness right here i do not believe in drinking skim milk all my life with the expectation of butter beyond the clouds i believe in the gospel i say in this world this is a mighty good world there are plenty of good people in this world there is lots of happiness in this world and i say let us in every way we can increase it i envy every man who is content with his lot whether he is poor or whether he is rich i tell you the man that tries to make somebody else happy and who owns his own soul nobody having a mortgage or deed of trust upon his manhood or liberty this world is a pretty good world for such a man i do not care i am going to say my say whether i make money or grow poor no matter whether i get high office or walk along the dusty highway of the common i am going to say my say and i had rather be a farmer and live on forty acres of land live in a log cabin that i built myself and have a little grassy path going down to the spring so that i can go there and hear the waters gurgling and know that it is coming out from the lips of the earth like a poem whispering to the white pebbles i would rather live there and have some hollyhocks at the corner of the house and the larks singing and swinging in the trees and some lattice over the window so that the sunlight can fall checkered on the babe in the cradle i had rather live there and have the freedom of my own brain i had rather do that than live in a palace of gold and crawl a slimy hypocrite through this world superstition has done enough harm already every religion nearly suspects everything that is pleasant everything that is joyous and they always have a notion that god feels best when we feel worst they have chained the andromeda of joy to the cold rock of ignorance and fear there to be devoured by the dragon of superstition church and state are two vultures that have fed upon the heart of chained prometheus i say let the human race have a chance let every man think for himself and express that thought there is no wrath in the serene heavens there is no scowl in the blue of the sky upon the throne of the universe tyranny does not sit as king the speaker here took from his pocket a pair of spectacles and adjusted them saying i am sorry to admit it i have got to come to it I hate to put on a pair of spectacles, but the other day, as I was putting them on, a thought struck me. I see progress in this. To progress is to overcome the obstacles of nature, and in order to overcome this obstacle of the loss of sight, man invented spectacles. Spectacles led man to the telescope with which he read all the starry heavens and had it not been for the failure of sight we wouldn't have seen a millionth part that we have in the first place we owe nothing but truth to the dead i am going to tell the truth about them there are three theories by which men account for all phenomena for everything that happens first the supernatural in the olden time everything that happened some deity produced some spirit some devil some hobgoblin some dryad some fairy some spook something except nature first then the supernatural and a barbarian looking at the wide mysterious sea wandering through the depths of the forest encountering the wild beasts troubled by strange dreams accounted for everything by the actions of spirits good and bad second the supernatural and natural there is where the religious world is today a mingling of the supernatural and natural 
the idea being that god created the world and imposed upon men certain laws and then let them run and if they ever got into any trouble then he would do a miracle and accomplish any good that he desired to do third and that is the grand theory the natural between these theories there has been from the dawn of civilization a conflict in this great war nearly all the soldiers have been in the ranks of the supernatural the believers in the supernatural insist that matter is controlled and directed entirely by powers from without the naturalists maintain that nature acts from within that nature is not acted upon that the universe is all there is that nature with infinite arms embraces everything that exists and that the supposed powers beyond the limits of the materially real are simply ghosts you say ah this is materialism this is the doctrine of matter what is matter i take a handful of earth in my hands and into that dust i put seeds and arrows from the eternal quiver of the sun smite it and the seeds grow and bud and blossom and fill the air with perfume in my sight do you understand that do you understand how this dust and these seeds and that light and this moisture produced that bud and that flower and that perfume do you understand that any better than you do the production of thought do you understand that any better than you do a dream do you understand that any better than you do the thoughts of love that you see in the eyes of the one you adore can you explain it can you tell what matter is have you the slightest conception yet you talk about matter as though you were acquainted with its origin as though you had compelled with clenched hands the very rocks to give up the secret of existence do you know what force is can you account for molecular action are you familiar with chemistry can you account for the loves and the hatreds of the atoms is there not something in matter that forever excludes you can you tell what matter really is before you cry materialism you had better find what matter is can you tell of anything without a material basis is it possible to imagine the annihilation of a single atom is it possible for you to conceive of the creation of a single atom can you have a thought that is not suggested to you by what you call matter did any man or woman or child ever have a solitary thought dream or conception that was not suggested to them by something they had seen in nature can you conceive of anything the different parts of which have been suggested to you by nature can you conceive of an animal with the hoofs of a bison with the pouch of a kangaroo with the head of a buffalo with the tail of a lion with the scales of a fish with the wings of a bird and yet every part of this impossible monster has been suggested to you by nature you say time therefore you can think eternity you say pain therefore you can think hell you say strength therefore you can think omnipotence you say wisdom therefore you can think infinite wisdom everything you see everything you can dream of or think of has been suggested to you by your surroundings by nature man cannot rise above nature below nature man cannot fall imagine if you please the creation of a single atom can any one here imagine the creation out of nothing of one atom can any one here imagine the destruction of one atom can you imagine an atom being changed to nothing can you imagine nothing being changed to an atom there is not a solitary person here with an imagination strong enough to think either of the creation of an atom or the annihilation of an atom matter and the universe are the same yesterday today and forever there is just as much matter in the universe today as there ever was and as there ever will be 
there is just as much force and just as much energy as there ever was or ever will be but it is continually taking different shapes and forms one day it is a man another day it is animal another day it is earth another day it is metal another day it is gas it gains nothing and it loses nothing our fathers denounced materialism and accounted for all phenomena how by the caprice of gods and devils for thousands of years it was believed that ghosts good ghosts bad ghosts benevolent and malevolent in some mysterious way produced all phenomena that disease and health happiness and misery fortune and misfortune peace and war life and death success and failure were but arrows shot by those ghosts or shadowy phantoms to reward or punish mankind that they were displeased or pleased by our actions that they blessed the earth with harvest or cursed it with famine that they fed or starved the children of men that they crowned or uncrowned kings, that they controlled war, that they gave prosperous voyages, allowing the brave mariner to meet his wife and children inside the harbor bar, or strewed the sad shore with wrecks of ships and the bodies of men. Formerly these ghosts were believed to be almost innumerable. Earth, air, and water were filled with these phantoms, but in modern times they have greatly decreased in number because the second proposition that i stated the supernatural and the natural has generally been adopted but the remaining ghosts are supposed to perform the same functions as of yore let me say right here that the object of every religion ever made by man has been to get on the good side of supposed powers has been to petition the gods to stop the earthquakes to stop famine to stop pestilence it has always been something that man should do to prevent being punished by the powers of the air or to get from them some favors it has always been believed that these ghosts could in some way be appeased that they could be bettered by sacrifices by prayer by fasting by the building of temples and cathedrals by shedding the blood of men and beasts by forms by ceremonies by kneelings by prostrations and flagellations by living alone in the wild desert by the practice of celibacy by inventing instruments of torture by destroying men women and children by covering the earth with dungeons by burning unbelievers and by putting chains upon the thoughts and manacles upon the lips of men by believing things without evidence by believing things against evidence by disbelieving and denying demonstrations by despising facts by hating reason by discouraging investigation by making an idiot of yourself all these have been done to appease the winged monsters of the air in the history of our poor world no horror has been omitted no infamy has been left undone by believers in ghosts and all the shadows were born of cowardice and malignity they were painted by the pencil of fear upon the canvas of ignorance by that artist called superstition from these ghosts our fathers received their information these ghosts were the schoolmasters of our ancestors they were the scientists the philosophers the geologists the legislators the astronomers the physicians the metaphysicians and historians of the past let me give you my definition of metaphysics, that is to say, the science of the unknown, the science of guessing. Metaphysics is where two fools get together, and each one admits that neither one can prove, and both say, hence we infer. That is the science of metaphysics. For this, these ghosts were supposed to have the only experience and real knowledge they inspired men to write books and the books were sacred 
if facts were found to be inconsistent with these books so much the worse for the facts and especially for the discoverers of these facts it was then and still is believed that these sacred books are the basis of the idea of immortality to give up the idea that these books were inspired is to renounce the idea of immortal life i deny it men existed before books and all the books that were ever written were written in my judgment by men and the idea of immortality was not born of a book but was born of the man who wrote the book the idea of immortality like the great sea has ebbed and flowed in the human heart beating its countless waves of hope and joy against the shores of time and was not born of any book nor of any religion nor of any creed it was born of human affection and it will continue to ebb and flow beneath the clouds and mists of doubt and darkness as long as love kisses the lips of death it is the rainbow of hope shining upon the tears of grief we love therefore we wish to live and the foundation of the idea of immortality is human affection and human love and i have a thousand times more confidence in the affections of the human heart in the deep and splendid feelings of the human soul than i have in any book that ever was or ever can be written by mortal man from the books written by those ghosts we have at least ascertained that they knew nothing whatever of the world in which we live did they know anything about the other upon every point where contradiction is possible the ghosts have been contradicted by these ghosts by these citizens of the air by this aristocracy of the clouds the affairs of government were administered all authority to govern came from them the emperors kings and potentates every one of them had the divine petroleum poured upon his head the kerosene of authority the emperors kings and potentates had communications from the phantoms man was not considered as the source of power to rebel against the king was to rebel against the ghosts and nothing less than the blood of the offenders could appease the invisible phantoms and by the authority of the ghosts man was crushed and slain and plundered many toiled wearily in the sun and storm that a few favorites of the ghosts might live in idleness and many lived in huts and caves and dens that the few might dwell in palaces and many clothed themselves with rags that a few might robe themselves in purple and gold and many crept and cringed and crawled that a few might tread upon their necks with feet of iron from the ghosts men received not only authority but information they told us the form of the earth they informed us that eclipses were caused by the sins of man especially the failure to pay tithes that the universe was made in six days that gazing at the sky with a telescope was dangerous that trying to be wise beyond what they had written was born of a rebellious and irreverent spirit they told us there was no virtue like belief no crime like doubt that investigation was simply impudence and the punishment therefore violent torment they not only told us all about this world but about two others and if their statements about the other two are as true as they were about this no one can estimate the value of their information for countless ages the world was governed by ghosts and they spared no pains to change the eagle of the human intellect into a bat of darkness to accomplish this infamous purpose to drive the love of truth from the human heart to prevent the advancement of mankind to shut out from the world every ray of intellectual light to pollute every mind with superstition the power of kings the cunning and cruelty of priests and the wealth of nations were used in order to show you the information we got from the ghosts and the condition of the world when the ghosts were the kings let me call your attention to this 
during these years of persecution ignorance superstition and slavery nearly all the people the kings lawyers and doctors learned and unlearned believed in that frightful production of ignorance of fear and faith called witchcraft witchcraft today is religion carried out they believed that man was the sport and prey of devils, that the very air was thick with these enemies of man, and with few exceptions this hideous belief was universal. Under these conditions progress was almost impossible. Fear paralyzed the brain. Progress is born of courage. Fear believes. Courage doubts. Fear falls upon the earth and prays courage stands erect and thinks fear retreats courage advances fear is barbarism courage is civilization fear believes in witchcraft courage in science and in eternal law the facts upon which this terrible belief rested were proved over and over again in nearly every court in europe thousands confessed themselves guilty admitted they had sold themselves to the devil they gave the particulars of the sale told what they said and what the devil replied they confessed themselves guilty when they knew that confession was death knew that their property would be confiscated and their children left to beg their bread this is one of the miracles of history one of the strangest contradictions of the human mind without doubt they really believed themselves guilty in the first place they believed in witchcraft as a fact and when charged with it they became insane they had read the account of the witch of endor calling up the dead body of samuel he is an old man he has his mantle on they had read the account of saul stooping to the earth and conversing with the spirit that had been called from the region of space by a witch they had read a command from the almighty thou shalt not suffer a witch to live and they believed the world was full of witches or else the almighty would not have made a law against them they believed in witchcraft and when they were charged with it they probably became insane and in their insanity they confessed their guilt they found themselves abhorred and deserted charged with a crime they could not disprove like a man in quicksand every effort only sunk them deeper caught in this frightful web at the mercy of the devotees of superstition hope fled and nothing remained but the insanity of confession the whole world appeared insane in the time of james i a man was burned for causing a storm at sea with the intention of drowning one of the royal family but i do not think it would have been much of a crime if he had been really guilty how could he disprove it how could he show that he did not cause a storm at sea all storms were at that time supposed to be inspired by the devil the people believed that all storms were caused by him or by persons whom he assisted i implore you to remember that the men who believed these things wrote our creeds and our confessions of faith and it is by their dust that i am asked to kneel and pay implicit homage instead of investigating and i implore you to recollect that they wrote our creeds a woman was tried and convicted before sir matthew hale one of the greatest judges and lawyers of england for having caused children to vomit crooked pins think of that the learned judge charged the intelligent jury that there was no doubt as to the existence of witches that it was established by all history and expressly taught by the bible the woman was hung and her body was burned sir thomas more declared that to give up witchcraft was to throw away the sacred scriptures john wesley too was a firm believer in ghosts and insisted upon their existence after all laws upon the subject had been repealed in england and i beg of you to remember that john wesley was the founder of the methodist church 
in new england a woman was charged with being a witch and with having changed herself into a fox while in that condition she was attacked and bitten by some dogs and a committee of three men was ordered by the court to examine this woman they removed her clothing and searched for what they were pleased to call witch spots that is to say spots into which a needle could be thrust without giving pain they reported to the court that such spots were found she denied that she had ever changed herself into a fox on the report of the committee she was found guilty and she was actually executed by our puritan fathers the gentlemen who braved the danger of the deep for the sake of worshipping god and persecuting their fellow men i belong to their blood and the best thing i can say about them and that which rises like a white shaft to their eternal honor is that they were in favor of education a man was attacked by a wolf he defended himself and succeeded in cutting off one of the animal's paws and the wolf ran away he put it in his pocket and carried it home there he found his wife with one of her hands gone and he took that paw from his pocket and put it on her arm and it assumed the appearance of a human hand and he charged his wife with being a witch she was tried she confessed her guilt and she was hung and her body was burned my is it possible did not somebody say something against such an infamous proceeding yes they did there was a young men's association who invited a man to come and give his ideas upon the subject he denounced it he said it was outrageous that it was nonsensical that it was infamous and the moment he went away the young men met and passed a resolution that he had deceived them and the clergy at that time protested and said of course let the man think if you call that kind of stuff thinking but there was one man belonging to this association who had the courage to stand by the truth whether he believed in what the speaker said or not he had that manliness and i take this opportunity to thank from the bottom of my heart a man i have no idea he agrees with me except in this whatever you do do it like a man and be honest about it people were burned for causing frost in summer for destroying crops with hail for causing storms for making cows go dry for souring beer for putting the devil in emptyings so that they would not rise the life of no one was secure to be charged was to be convicted every man was at the mercy of every other this infamous belief was so firmly seated in the minds of the people that to express a doubt as to its existence was to be suspected yourself they believed that animals were often taken possession of by devils and they believed that the killing of the animal would destroy the devil they absolutely tried convicted and executed dumb beasts at vale in 1470 a rooster was tried upon the charge of having laid an egg and the clergy said they had no doubt of it rooster eggs were used only in making witch ointment this everybody knew the rooster was convicted and with all due solemnity he was burned in the public square so a hog and six pig died for having killed and partially eaten a child the hog was convicted, but the pigs, on account of their extreme youth, were acquitted. As late as 1740, a cow, charged with being possessed of a devil, was tried and was convicted. They used to exercise rats, snakes, and vermin. They used to go through the alleys and streets and fields and warn them to leave within a certain number of days, and if they did not leave, they threatened them with certain pains and penalties which they proceeded to recount but let us be careful how we laugh about those things let us not pride ourselves too much on the progress of our age we must not forget that some of our people are yet in the same intelligent business only a little while ago the governor of minnesota appointed a day of fasting and prayer to see if the lord could not be induced to kill the grasshoppers or send them into some other state 
about the close of the fifteenth century was the excitement in regard to witchcraft and pope innocent the eighth issued a bull directing the inquisitors to be vigilant in searching out and punishing all guilty of this crime forms for the crime were regularly issued for two hundred and fifty years the church was busy in punishing the impossible crime of witchcraft by burning hanging and torturing men women and little children protestants were as active as catholics and in geneva five hundred witches were burned at the stake in three months and one thousand were executed in one year in the diocese of Kuro. at least one hundred thousand victims suffered in germany the last execution being in galesburg and taking place in seventeen ninety four and the last in Switzerland, 1780. In England, statutes were passed from Henry the Sixth to James the First, defining the crime and punishment, and the last act passed in the British Parliament was when Lord Bacon was a member of the House. In 1716, Mrs. Hicks and daughter, nine years of age, were hung for selling their souls to the devil and raising a storm at sea by pulling off their stockings and making a lather of soap. In England it has been estimated that at least 30,000 were hung or burned. The last victim executed in Scotland was 1722. She was an innocent old woman who had so little idea of her condition that she rejoiced at the sight of the fire destined to consume her to ashes. She had a daughter lame in her hands a circumstance accounted for from the fact that the witch had been used to transfer her daughter into a pony and get her shod by the devil her intelligent ancestors in sixteen ninety two nineteen persons were executed in salem massachusetts for the crime of witchcraft it was thought in those days that men and women made contracts with the devil and those contracts were confirmed at a meeting of witches and ghosts over which the devil presided these contracts in some cases were for a few years others for life general assemblages of witches were held once a year to these they rode from great distances on brooms and dogs and there they did homage to the prince of hell and offered him sacrifices in 1836 the populace of Holland plunged into the sea a woman reputed to be a sorceress, and as the miserable woman persisted in rising to the surface, she was pronounced guilty and was beaten to death. It was believed that the devil could transform people into any shape he pleased, and whoever denounced this idea was denounced as an infidel that the believers in witchcraft appealed to the devil, that with the devil were associated innumerable spirits who ranged over the world endeavoring to torment mankind, that these spirits possessed a power and wisdom transcending the limits of human faculties. They believed the devil could carry persons hundreds of miles in a few seconds. They believed this because they knew that Christ had been carried by the devil in the same manner into a high mountain and placed upon a pinnacle. According to their account, the prince of the air had absolutely taken the god of this infinite universe, the creator of all its shining, wheeling stars. He had been absolutely taken by the devil to a pinnacle of the temple, and there had been tempted by the devil to cast himself to the earth. Take from the church itself the threat and fear of hell, and it becomes an extinct volcano. With the doctrine of hell taken from the church, that is the end of the fall of man. That is the end of the scheme of atonement. Take from them the idea of an eternal place of torment, and the church is thrown back simply upon facts and dean stanley the leading ecclesiastic of great britain only the other day in winchester abbey said science will be the only theology of the future morality is the only religion of the years to come notwithstanding all the infamous things laid to the charge of the church we are told that the civilization of to-day is the child of what we are pleased to call superstition 
let me call your attention to what they received from their fears of these ghosts let me give you an outline of the sciences as taught by these philosophers there is one thing that a man is interested in if he is in anything and that is in the science of medicine a doctor is so to speak in partnership with nature he is a preserver if he is worthy of the name and now i want to show what they have gotten from these ghosts upon the science of medicine according to them all of the diseases were produced as a punishment by the good ghosts or out of pure malignity by the bad ones there were properly speaking no diseases the sick were simply possessed by ghosts the science of medicine consisted in knowing how to persuade these ghosts to vacate the premises and for thousands of years all diseases were treated with incantations hideous noises with the beating of drums and gongs everything was done to make the position of a ghost as unpleasant as possible and they generally succeeded in making things so disagreeable that if the ghost did not leave the patient died these ghosts were supposed to be different in rank power and dignity now then a man pretended to have won the favor of some powerful ghost who gave him power over the little ones such a man became a very great physician it was found that a certain kind of smoke was exceedingly offensive to the nostrils of your ordinary ghost with this smoke the sick room would be filled until the ghost vanished or the patient died it was also believed that certain words when properly pronounced were the most effective weapons for it was for a long time supposed that latin words were the best i suppose because latin was a dead language for thousands of years medicine consisted in driving the devils out of men in some instances bargains and promises were made with the ghosts one case is given where a multitude of devils traded a man off for a herd of swine in this transaction the devils were the losers the swine having immediately drowned themselves in the sea this idea of disease appears to have been almost universal and is not yet extinct the contortions of the epileptic the strange twitching of those afflicted with cholera were all seized as proof that the bodies of men were filled with vile and malignant spirits whoever endeavored to account for these things by natural causes whoever endeavored to cure disease by natural means was denounced as an infidel to explain anything was a crime it was to the interest of the sacerdotal class that all things should be accounted for by the will and power of god and the devil the moment it is admitted that all phenomena are within the domain of the natural and that all the prayers in the world cannot change one solitary fact the necessity for the priest disappears religion breathes the idea of miracles take from the minds of men the idea of the supernatural and superstition ceases to exist for this reason the church has always despised the man who explains the wonderful the moment that it began to be apparent that prayer could do nothing for the body the priest shifted his ground and began praying for the soul after the devil was substantially abandoned in the practice of medicine and when it was admitted that god had nothing to do with ordinary coughs and colds it was still believed that all the diseases were sent by him as punishment for the people it was thought to be a kind of blasphemy to even stay the ravages of pestilence formerly when a pestilence fell upon a people the arguments of the priest were boundless he told the people that they had refused to pay their tithes and they had doubted some of the doctrines of the church that in their hearts they had contempt for some of the priests of the lord and god was now taking his revenge and the people for the most part believed this issue of falsehood and hastened to fall upon their knees and to pour out their wealth upon the altars of hypocrisy the church never wanted disease to be absolutely under the control of man 
Timothy Dwight, president of Yale College, preached a sermon against vaccination. His idea was that if God had decreed that through all eternity certain men should die of smallpox, it was a frightful sin to endeavor to prevent it, that plagues and pestilence were instruments in the hands of God with which to gain the love and worship of mankind. To find the cure for the disease was to take the punishment from the church. No one tries to cure the ague with prayer, because quinine has been found to be altogether more reliable. Just as soon as a specific is found for a disease, that disease is left out of the list of prayer. The number of diseases with which God from time to time afflicts mankind is continually decreasing, because the number of diseases that man can cure is continually increasing. In a few years all diseases will be under the control of man. The science of medicine has but one enemy, superstition. Man was afraid to save his body for fear he would lose his soul. Is it any wonder that the people in those days believed in and taught the infamous doctrine of eternal punishment that makes God a heartless monster and man a slimy hypocrite and slave? The ghosts were also historians, and wrote the grossest absurdities. They wrote as though they had been eye-witnesses of every occurrence. They told all the past, they predicted all the future, with an impudence that amounted to sublimity. They said that the Tartars originally came from hell, and that they were called Tartars because that was one of the names of hell. These gentlemen accounted for the red on the breasts of robins from the fact that those birds used to carry water to the unhappy infants in hell. Other eminent historians say that Nero was in the habit of vomiting frogs. When I read that, I said some of the croakers of the present day would be better for such a vomit. Others say that the walls of a city fell down in answer to prayer. They tell us that King Arthur was not born like other mortals, that he had great luck in killing giants, that one of the giants that he killed wore clothes woven from the beards of kings that he had slain, and, to cap the climax, the authors of this history were rewarded for having written the only reliable history of their country. These are the men from whom we get our creeds and our confessions of faith. In all the histories of those days there is hardly a truth. Facts were not considered of any importance. They wrote, and the people believed that the tracks of Pharaoh's chariot were still visible upon the sands of the Red Sea, and that they had been miraculously preserved as perpetual witnesses of the miracles that had been performed, and they said to any man who denied it, Go there, and you will find the tracks still upon the sand. They accounted for everything as the work of good and evil spirits. With cause and effect, they had nothing to do. Facts were in no way related to each other. God, governed by infinite caprice, filled the world with miracles and disconnected events, and from his quiver came the arrows of pestilence and death. The moment the idea is abandoned that everything in this universe is natural, that all conception of history becomes impossible, that the ghost of the present is not the child of the past, the present is not the mother of the future. In the domain of superstition all is accident and caprice, and do not, I pray you, forget that the writers of our creeds and confessions of faith believed this to be a world of chance. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing happens by chance. In the wide universe everything is necessarily produced. Every effect has behind it a cause. Every effect is in its turn a cause. And there is in the wide domain of the infinite not room enough for a miracle. When I say this, I mean this is my idea. I may be wrong, but that is my idea. It was believed by our intelligent ancestors that all law derived its greatness and force from the fact that it had been communicated to man by ghosts. 
of course it is not pretended that the ghosts told everybody the law but they told it to a few and the few told it to the people and the people as a rule paid them exceedingly well for the trouble it was a long time before the people commenced making laws for themselves and strange as it may appear most of their laws are vastly superior to the ghost article through the web and woof of human legislation gradually began to run and shine and glitter the golden thread of justice during these years of darkness it was believed that rather than see an act of injustice done rather than see the guilty triumph some ghost would interfere and i do wish from the bottom of my heart that that was the truth there never was forced upon my heart a more frightful conviction than this the right does not always prevail there never was forced upon my mind a more cruel conclusion than this innocence is not always a sufficient shield i wish it was i wish too that man suffered nothing but that which he brings upon himself and yet i find that in nine districts in india between the first day of last january and the first day of june two million eight hundred thousand people starve to death and that little children with their lips upon the breasts of famine died wasted away and why simply because a little while before the wind did not veer the one hundredth part of a degree and send clouds over the country freighted with rain freighted with love and joy but if that wind had just turned that way there would have been happy men women and children all clad in the garments of health I wish that I could know in my heart that there was some power that would see to it that men and women got exact justice somewhere. I do wish that I knew the right would prevail, that innocence was an infinite shield. During these years it was believed that rather than see an act of injustice done, some ghost would interfere. This belief, as a rule, gave great satisfaction to the victorious party, and, as the other man was dead, no complaint was ever made by him. This doctrine was a sanctification of brute force and chance. Prisoners were made to grasp hot irons, and if it burned them, their guilt was established. Others were tied hands and feet and cast into the sea, and if they sank, the verdict of guilt was unanimous. If they did not sink, then they said water is such a pure element that it refuses to take a guilty person, and consequently he is a witch or wizard. Why, in England, persons accused of crime could appeal to the cross and to a piece of sacramental bread. If he could swallow this without choking, he was acquitted and this practice was continued until the time of King Edward, who was choked to death, after which it was discontinued. This is the end of Part 1 of Ingersoll's Lecture on Ghosts, part of the collected Lectures of Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during April 2007. Ingersoll's Lecture on Ghosts, Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lectures of Colonel R. G. Ingersoll, Lecture Number Two, Ghosts. Ghosts and their followers always took delight in torturing with unusual pain any infraction of their laws, and generally death was the penalty. Sometimes, when a man committed only murder, he was permitted to flee to a place of refuge, murder being only a crime against man. But for saying certain words, or denying certain doctrines, or for worshipping wrong ghosts, or for failing to pray to the right one, or for laughing at a priest, or for saying that wine was not blood, or bread was not flesh, or for failing to regard ram's horns as artillery, or for saying that a raven, as a rule, was a poor landlord, 
death, produced by all the ways that ingenuity or hatred could devise, was the penalty suffered by these men. I tell you to-night, law is a growth, law is a science. Right and wrong exist in the nature of things. Things are not right because they are commanded. They are not wrong because they are prohibited. They are prohibited because we believe them wrong. They are commended because we believe them right. There are real crimes enough without creating artificial ones. All progress in legislation for a thousand years has consisted in repealing the laws of the ghosts. The idea of right and wrong is born of man's capacity to enjoy and suffer. If man could not suffer, if he could not inflict injury upon his brother, if he could neither feel nor inflict punishment, the idea of law, the idea of right, the idea of wrong, never could have entered into his brain. If man could not suffer, if he could not inflict suffering, the word conscience never would have passed the lips of man. There is one good, happiness. There is one sin, selfishness. All laws should be for the preservation of the one and the destruction of the other. Under the regime of the ghosts, the laws were not understood to exist in the nature of things. They were supposed to be irresponsible commands, and these commands were not supposed to rest upon reason. They were simply the product of arbitrary will. These penalties for the violations of those laws were as cruel as the penalties were absurd. There were over two hundred offenses for which man was punished with death. Think of it! And these laws are said to have come from a most merciful God. And yet we have become civilized to that degree in this country that in the state of New York there is only one crime punishable with death. Think of it! Did I not tell you that we were now civilizing our gods? The tendency of those horrible laws, the tendency of those frightful penalties, was to blot the idea of justice from the human soul. Now I want to show you how perfectly every department of human knowledge, or rather of ignorance, was saturated with superstition. I will for a moment refer to the science of language. It was thought by our fathers that Hebrew was the original language, that it was taught to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden by the Almighty Himself. Every fact inconsistent with that idea was thrown away. According to the ghosts, the trouble at the Tower of Babel accounted for the fact that all the people did not speak the Hebrew language. The Babel question settled all questions in the science of language. After a time, so many facts were found to be so inconsistent with the Hebrew idea that it began to fall into disrepute, and other languages began to be used. Andrew Kent published a work on the science of language in which he stated that God spoke to Adam, and Adam answered in Hebrew, and that the serpent probably spoke to Eve in French. In 1580, another celebrated work was published at Antwerp, in which the whole matter was put at rest, showing beyond a doubt that the language spoken in Paradise was neither more nor less than plain Holland Dutch. Another celebrated writer, a contemporary of Sir Isaac Newton, discouraged the idea that all languages could be traced to one. He maintained that language was of natural growth that we speak as naturally as we grow, we talk as naturally as sings a bird, or as blooms and blossoms a flower. Experience teaches us that this be so. Words are continually dying and continually being born. Words are the garments of thought. Through the lapse of time some were as rude as the skins of wild beasts, and others pleasing and cultured like silk and gold. Words have been born of hatred and revenge, of love and self-sacrifice and fear, of agony and joy the stars have fashioned them, and in them mingled the darkness and the dawn. Every word that we get from the past is, so to speak, a mummy robed in the linen of the grave. They are the crystallizations of human history, of all that man enjoyed, of all that man has suffered 
his victories and defeats, all that he has lost and won. Words are the shadows of all that has been, they are the mirrors of all that is. The ghosts also enlightened our fathers in astronomy and geology. According to them the world was made out of nothing, and a little more nothing having been taken than was used in the construction of the world, the stars were made out of the scraps that were left over. Cosmos, in the sixth century, taught that the stars were impelled by angels who carried them upon their shoulders, rolled them in front of them, or drew them after. He also taught that each angel who pushed a star took great pains to observe what the other angels were doing, so that the relative distances between the stars might always remain the same. He stated that this world was a vast body of water with a strip of land on the outside, that Adam and Eve lived on the outer strip, that their descendants were drowned on the outer strip, all except Noah and his family. He accounted for night and day by saying that on the outer strip of land was a mountain around which the sun revolved, producing darkness when it was hidden from sight and daylight when it emerged. He also declared the earth to be flat. This he proved by many passages from the Bible. Among other reasons for believing the earth to be flat, he referred to a passage in the New Testament which says that Christ shall come again in glory and power, and every eye shall see him, and said, Now if the world is round, how are the people on the other side going to see Christ when he comes? That settled the question, and the church not only endorsed this book, but declared that whoever believed either less or more was a heretic, and would be dealt with as such. In those blessed days ignorance was a king, and science was an outcast. The church knew that the moment the earth ceased to be the center of the universe, and became a mere speck in the starry sphere of existence, every religion would become a thing of the past. In the name and by the authority of the ghosts, men enslaved their fellow men, they trampled upon the rights of women and children. In the name and by the authority of ghosts, they bought and sold each other, they filled heaven with tyrants and the earth with slaves, they filled the present with intolerance and the future with horror. In the name and by the authority of the ghosts, they declared superstition to be the real religion. In the name and by the authority of the ghosts, they imprisoned the human mind, they polluted the conscience, they subverted justice, and they sainted hypocrisy. I have endeavored in some degree to show you what has been and always will be when men are governed by superstition. When they destroy the sublime standard of reason, when they take the words of others and do not investigate them themselves, even the great men of those days appear nearly as weak as the most ignorant. One of the greatest men of the world, an astronomer second to none, discoverer of the three great laws that explain the solar system, was an astrologer, and believed that he could predict the career of a man by finding what star was in the ascendant at his birth. He believed in what is called the music of the spheres, and he ascribed the qualities of the music, alto, bass, tenor, and treble, to certain of the planets. Another man kept an idiot whose words he put down and then put them together in such a manner as to make promises, and waited patiently to see that they were fulfilled. Luther believed he had actually seen the devil, and discussed points of theology with him. The human mind was enchained. Every idea almost was a mystery. Facts were looked upon as worthless. Only the wonderful was worth preserving. Devils were thought to be the most industrious beings in the universe, and with these imps every occurrence of an unusual character was connected. There was no order, certainty, everything depended upon ghosts and phantoms, and man for the most part considered himself at the mercy of malevolent spirits. 
he protected himself as best he could with holy water and with tapers and wafers and cathedrals he made noises to frighten the ghosts and music to charm them he fasted when he was hungry and he feasted when he was not he believed everything unreasonable he humbled himself he crawled in the dust he shut the doors and windows and excluded every ray of light from his soul and he delayed not a day to repair the walls of his own prison and from the garden of the human heart they plucked and trampled into the bloody dust the flowers and blossoms they denounced man as totally depraved they made reason blasphemy they made pity a crime nothing so delighted them as painting the torments and tortures of the damned over the worm that never dies they grew poetic according to them the cries ascending from hell were the perfume of heaven they divided the world into saints and sinners and all the saints were going to heaven and all the sinners yonder now then you stand in the presence of a great disaster a house is on fire and there is seen at a window the frightened face of a woman with a babe in her arms appealing for help humanity cries out will some one go to the rescue they do not ask for a methodist a baptist or a catholic they ask for a man all at once there starts from the crowd one that nobody ever suspected of being a saint one may be with a bad reputation but he goes up the ladder and is lost in the smoke and flame and a moment after he emerges and the great circles of flame hiss around him in a moment more he has reached the window in another moment with the woman and child in his arms he reaches the ground and gives his fainting burden to the bystanders and the people all stand hushed for a moment as they always do at such times and then the air is rent with acclamations tell me that that man is going to be sent to hell to eternal flames who is willing to risk his life rather than a woman and child should suffer from the fire one moment i despise that doctrine of hell any man that believes in eternal hell is afflicted with at least two diseases petrifaction of the heart and petrifaction of the brain i have seen upon the field of battle a boy sixteen years of age struck by a fragment of a shell i have seen him fall i have seen him die with a curse upon his lips and the face of his mother in his heart tell me that his soul will be hurled from the field of battle where he lost his life that his country might live where he lost his life for the liberties of man tell me that he will be hurled from that field to eternal torment i pronounce it an infamous lie and yet according to these gentlemen that is to be the fate of nearly all the splendid fellows in this world i had in my possession a little while ago a piece of fresco that used to adorn a church at stratford-on-avon the place where shakespeare lived and there was a picture representing the morning of the resurrection and people were getting out of their graves and devils were grabbing them by their heels and there was an immense monster with jaws open so wide that a man could walk down its throat and the flames were issuing therefrom and there were devils driving people in droves down the throat of this monster and there was an immense kettle in which they had put these men and the fire was being stirred under it and hot pitch was being poured on top and little devils were setting it on fire and then on the walls there were hundreds hung up by their tongues to hooks and nails and then the saved there were some five or six saved upon the horizon and they had a most self-satisfied grin of i told you so at the risk of being tiresome i have said that i have to show the direction of the human mind in slavery the effects of a widespread ignorance and the result of fear i want to convince you that every form of slavery physical or mental is a viper that will finally fill with poison the breast of any man alive i want to show you that there should be republicanism in the domain of thought as well as in civil government the first step towards progress is for man to cease to be the slave of the creatures of his creation 
men found at last that the event is more valuable than the prophecy, especially if it never comes to pass. They found that diseases were not produced by spirits, that they could not be cured by frightening them away. They found that death was as natural as life. They began to study the anatomy and chemistry of the human body, and they found that all was natural, and the conjurer and the sorcerer were dismissed, and the physician and surgeon were employed. They learned that being born under a star or planet had nothing to do with their luck. The astrologer was discharged, and the astronomer took his place. They found that the world had swept through the constellation for millions of ages. They found that diseases were produced as easily as grass, and were not sent as punishment on men for failing to believe a creed. They found that man, through intelligence, could take advantage of the affairs of its nature, that he could make the waves, the winds, the flames, and the lightnings slaves at his bidding to administer to his wants. They found the ghosts knew nothing of benefit to man, that they were entirely ignorant of history, that they were bad doctors and worse surgeons, that they knew nothing of the law and less of justice, that they were poor politicians, that they were tyrants, and that they were without brains and utterly destitute of hearts. The condition of this world during the Dark Ages shows exactly the result of enslaving the souls of men. In those days there was no liberty. Liberty was despised, and the laborer was considered but little above the beast. Ignorance like a vast cowl covered the brain of the world. Superstition ran riot, and credulity sat upon the throne of the soul. Murder and hypocrisy were the companions of man, and industry was a slave. Every country maintained that it was no robbery to take the property of Mohammedans by force, and no murder to kill the owner. Lord Bacon was the first man who maintained that a Christian country was bound to keep its plighted faith with a Mohammedan nation. Every man who could read or write was suspected of being a heretic in those days. Only one person in forty thousand could read or write. All thought was discouraged. The whole earth was ruled by the mitre and scepter, by the altar and throne, by fear and force, by ignorance and faith, by ghouls and ghosts. In the fifteenth century the following law was in force in England. Whosoever reads the scripture in the mother tongue shall forfeit land, cattle, life, and goods for themselves and their heirs forever, and should be condemned for heretics to God, enemies to the crown, and traitors to the land. During the period this law was in force, thirty-nine were hanged and their bodies burned. In the sixteenth century men were burned because they failed to kneel to a procession of monks. Even the reformers, so-called, had no idea of liberty only when in the minority. The moment they were clothed with power, they began to exterminate with fire and sword. Castillo, and I want you to recollect it, was the first minister in the world that declared in favor of universal toleration. Castillo was pursued by John Calvin like a wild beast. Calvin said that by such a monstrous doctrine he crucified Christ afresh, and they pursued that man until he died. Recollect it. They can't do that nowadays. You don't know how splendid I feel about the liberty I have. The horizon is filled with glory, and the air is filled with wings. If there are any in this world who think they had better not tell what they really think, because it will take bread from their little children, because it will take clothing from their families, don't do it. Don't make martyrs of yourselves. I don't believe in martyrdom. Go right along with them. Go to church and say amen as near the right place as you can. I will do your talking for you. They can't take the bread away from me. I will talk. Bodemus, a lawyer of France, wrote a few words in favor of freedom of conscience. Montaigne was the first to raise his voice against torture in France. 
but what was the voice of one man against the terrible cry of ignorant infatuated malevolent millions i intend to do what little i can and i am going to do it kindly i am going to appeal to reason and to charity to justice to science and to the future for my part i glory in the fact that in the new world in the united states liberty of conscience was first granted to man and that the constitution of the united states was the first great decree entered in the high court of human equity forever divorcing church and state it is the grandest step ever taken by the human race and the declaration of independence was the first document that retired ghosts from politics it is the first document that said authority does not come from the phantoms of the air authority is not from that direction it comes from the people themselves the declaration of independence enthroned man and dethroned the phantoms you will ask what has caused this change in three hundred years i answer the inventions and discoveries of the few the brave thoughts and heroic utterances of the few the acquisition of a few facts getting acquainted with our mother nature besides this you must remember that every wrong in some way tends to abolish itself it is hard to make a lie last always a lie will not fit the truth it will only fit another lie told on purpose to fit it nothing but truth lives the nobles and kings quarrelled the priests began to dispute and the millions began to get their rights in fourteen forty one printing was discovered at that time the past was a vast cemetery without an epitaph the ideas of men had mostly perished in the brains that had produced them printing gives an opening for thought it preserves ideas it made it possible for a man to bequeath to the world the wealth of his thoughts about the same time or a little before the moors had gone into europe and it can be truthfully said that science was thrust into the brain of europe upon the point of a moorish lance they gave us paper and what is printing without paper a bird without wings i tell you paper has been a splendid thing the discovery of america whose shores were trod by the restless feet of adventure and the people of every nation out of this strange mingling of facts and fancies came the great republic every fact has pushed a superstition from the brain and a ghost from the cloud every mechanical art is an educator every loom every reaper every mower every steamboat every locomotive every engine every press every telegraph is a missionary of science and an apostle of progress every mill every furnace with its wheels and levers in which something is made for the convenience for the use and the comfort and the well-being of man is my kind of church and every schoolhouse is a temple education is the most radical thing in this world to teach the alphabet is to inaugurate a revolution to build a schoolhouse is to construct a fort every library is an arsenal filled with the weapons and ammunition of progress every fact is a monitor with sides of iron and a turret of steel i thank the inventors and discoverers i thank columbus and magellan i thank locke and hume bacon and shakespeare i thank fulton and watt franklin and morse who made the lightning the messenger of man I thank Luther for protesting against the abuses of the church, but denounce him because he was an enemy of liberty. I thank Calvin for writing a book in favor of religious freedom, but I abhor him because he burned Servetus. I thank the Puritans for saying that resistance to tyrants is obedience to God, and yet I am compelled to admit that they were tyrants themselves. 
i thank thomas paine because he was a believer in liberty i thank voltaire that great man who for half a century was the intellectual monarch of europe and who from his throne at the foot of the alps pointed the finger of scorn at every hypocrite in christendom i thank the inventors i thank the discoverers the thinkers and the scientists and i thank the honest millions who have toiled i thank the brave men with brave thoughts they are the atlases upon whose broad and mighty shoulders rests the grand fabric of civilization they are the men who have broken and are still breaking the chains of superstition we are beginning to learn that to swap off a superstition for a fact to ascertain the real is to progress all that gives us better bodies and minds and clothes and food and pictures grander music better heads better hearts and that makes us better husbands and wives and better citizens all these things combined produce what we call the progress of the human race man advances only as he overcomes the obstacles of nature it is done by labor and thought labor is the foundation without great labor it is impossible to progress without labor on the part of those who conduct all great industries of life of those who battle with the obstacles of the sea on the part of the inventors the discoverers and the brave heroic thinkers no surplus is produced and from the surplus produced by labor spring the schools and universities the painters the sculptors the poets the hopes the loves and the aspirations of the world the surplus has given us the books it has given us all there is of beauty and eloquence i am aware there is a vast difference of opinion as to what progress is and that many denounce my ideas i know there are many worshippers of the past they see no beauty in anything from which they do not blow the dust of ages with the breath of praise they see nothing like the ancients no orators poets or statesmen like those who have been dust for thousands of years in a sermon on a certain evening some time ago the rev dr mcgee of albany new york stated that colonel ingersoll referring to jesus christ called him a dirty little jew i denounce that as a dirty little lie i have as much reverence for any man who ever did what he believed was right and died in order to benefit mankind as any man in this world do they treat an opponent with fairness are they investigating do they pull forward or do they hold back is science indebted to the church for a single fact let us know what it is what church has been the asylum for a persecuted truth what reform has been inaugurated by the church did the church abolish slavery no who commenced it such men as garrison and pillsbury and wendell phillips they were the titans that attacked the monster and not a solitary one of them ever belonged to a church has the church raised its voice against war no are men restrained by superstition are men restrained by what you call religion i used to think they were not now i admit they are no man has ever been restrained from the commission of a real crime but from an artificial one he has there was a man who committed murder they got the evidence but he confessed that he did it what did you do it for money did you get any money yes how much fifteen cents what kind of man was he a laboring man i killed what did you do with the money i bought liquor with it did he have anything else i think he had some meat and bread what did you do with that I ate the bread and threw away the meat. It was Friday. So, you see, it will restrain in some things. Just to the extent that man has freed himself from the dominion of ghosts, he has advanced. To that extent he has freed himself from the tyrant's poison. 
man has found that he must give liberty to others in order to have it himself he has found that a master is a slave that a tyrant is also a slave he has found that governments should be administered by men for men that the rights of all are to be protected that woman is at least the equal for man that men existed before books that all creeds were made by men that the few have a right to contradict what the pulpit asserts that man is responsible to himself and to others true religion must be free without liberty the brain is a dungeon and the mind a convict the slave may bow and cringe and crawl but he cannot worship he cannot adore true religion is the perfume of the free and grateful air true religion is the subordination of the passions to the intellect it is not a creed it is a life the theory that is afraid of investigation is not deserving of a place in the human mind i do not pretend to tell what all the truth is i do not pretend to have fathomed the abyss nor to have floated on outstretched wings level with the heights of thought i simply plead for freedom i denounce the cruelties and horrors of slavery i ask for light and air for the souls of men i say take off those chains break those manacles free those limbs release that brain i plead for the right to think to reason to investigate i ask that the future may be enriched with the honest thoughts of men i implore every human being to be a soldier in the army of progress i will not invade the rights of others you have no right to erect your toll-gates upon the highways of thought you have no right to leap from the hedges of superstition and strike down the pioneers of the human race you have no right to sacrifice the liberties of man upon the altars of ghosts believe what you may preach what you desire have all the forms and ceremonies you please exercise your liberties in your own way and extend to all others the same right i attack the monsters the phantoms of imagination that have ruled the world i attack slavery i ask for room room for the human mind why should we sacrifice a real world that we have for one we know not of why should we enslave ourselves why should we forge fetters for our own hands why should we be the slaves of phantoms phantoms that we create ourselves the darkness of barbarism was the womb of these shadows in the light of science they cannot cloud the sky for ever they have reddened the hands of man with innocent blood they made the cradle a curse and the grave a place of torment they blinded the eyes and stopped the ears of the human race they subverted all the ideas of justice by promising infinite rewards for finite virtues and threatening infinite punishment for finite offences i plead for light for air for opportunity i plead for individual independence i plead for the rights of labor and of thought i plead for a chainless future let the ghosts go justice remains let them disappear men women and children are left let the monster fade away the world remains with its hills and seas and plains with its seasons of smiles and frowns its springs of leaf and bud its summer of shade and flower its autumn with the laden boughs when the withered banners of the corn are still and gathered fields are growing strangely wan while death poetic death with hands that color whate'er they touch weaves in the autumn wood her tapestries of gold and brown the world remains with its winters and homes and firesides where grow and bloom the virtues of our race 
all these are left and music with its sad and thrilling voice and all there is of art and song and hope and love and aspiration high all these remain let the ghosts go we will worship them no more man is greater than these phantoms humanity is grander than all the creeds than all the books humanity is the great sea and these creeds and books and religions are but the waves of a day humanity is the sky and these religions and dogmas and theories are but the mists and clouds changing continually destined finally to melt away let the ghosts go we will worship them no more let them cover their eyeless sockets with their fleshless hands and fade forever from the imaginations of men end of ingersoll's lecture on ghosts this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain this has been the second lecture from Lectures of Colonel R. G. Ingersoll, read for you by Ted Lorm in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during April 2007. Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. Lecture number three, Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell. Ladies and gentlemen, the idea of a hell was born of revenge and brutality on the one side, and cowardice on the other. In my judgment, the American people are too brave, too charitable, too generous, too magnanimous to believe in the infamous dogma of an eternal hell. I have no respect for any human being who believes in it. I have no respect for the man who will pollute the imagination of childhood with that infamous lie. I have no respect for the man who will add to the sorrows of this world with the frightful dogma. I have no respect for any man who endeavors to put that infinite cloud, that infinite shadow, over the heart of humanity. I want to be frank with you. I dislike this doctrine. I hate it. I despise it. I defy this doctrine. For a good many years the learned intellects of Christendom have been examining into the religions of other countries in the world, the religions of the thousands that have passed away. They examined into the religions of Egypt, the religion of Greece, the religion of Rome, and of the Scandinavian countries. In the presence of the ruins of those religions, the learned men of Christendom insisted that those religions were baseless, that they are fraudulent, but they have all passed away. While this was being done, the Christianity of our day applauded, and when the learned men got through with the religions of other countries, they turned their attention to our religion. By the same mode of reasoning, by the same methods, by the same arguments that they used with the old religions, they were overturning the religion of our day. Why? Every religion in this world is the work of man. Every one. Every book has been written by man men existed before the books if books had existed before man i might admit there was such a thing as a sacred volume in my judgment man has made every religion and made every book there is another thing to which i wish to call your attention man never had an idea man will never have an idea except those supplied to him by his surroundings every idea in the world that man has came to him by nature man cannot conceive of anything the hint of which you have not received from your surroundings you can imagine an animal with the hoof of a bison with the pouch of the kangaroo with the wings of an eagle with the beak of a bird and with the tail of the lion and yet every point of this monster you borrowed from nature everything you can think of everything you can dream of is borrowed from your surroundings everything 
and there is nothing on this earth coming from any other sphere whatever man has produced every religion in the world and why because each generation bodes forth the knowledge and the belief of the people at the time it was made and in no book is there any knowledge found except that of the people who wrote it in no book is there found any knowledge except that of the time in which it was written barbarians have produced and always will produce barbarian religions barbarians have produced and always will produce ideas in harmony with their surroundings and all the religions of the past were produced by barbarians every one of them we are making religions today we are making religions tonight that is to say we are changing them and the religion of today is not the religion of one year ago what changed it science has done it education and the growing heart of man has done it we are making these religions every day and just to the extent that we become civilized ourselves will we improve the religion of our fathers if the religion of one hundred years ago compared with the religion of today is so low what will it be in one thousand years if we continue making the inroads upon orthodoxy which we have been making during the last twenty-five years what will it be fifty years from tonight it will have to be remonetized by that time or else it will not be legal tender in my judgment every religion that stands by appealing to miracles is dishonor every religion in the world has denounced every other religion as a fraud that proves to me that they all tell the truth about others why suppose mr smith should tell mr brown that he smith saw a corpse get out of the grave and that when he first saw it it was covered with the worms of death and that in his presence it was reclothed in healthy beautiful flesh and then suppose mr brown should tell mr smith i saw the same thing myself i was in a graveyard once and i saw a dead man rise suppose then that smith should say to brown you're a liar and brown should reply to smith and you're a liar what would you think it would simply be because smith never having seen it himself didn't believe brown and brown never having seen it didn't believe smith had now if smith had really seen it and brown told him he had seen it too then smith would regard it as a corroboration of his story and he would regard brown as one of his principal witnesses but on the contrary he says you never saw it so when a man says i was upon mount sinai and there i met god and he told me stand aside and let me drown these people and another man says to him i was upon a mountain and there i met the supreme brahma and moses says that's not true and contends that the other man never did see brahma and he contends that moses never did see god that is in my judgment proof that they both speak truly every religion then has charged every other religion with having been an unmitigated fraud and yet if any man had ever seen the miracle himself his mind would be prepared to believe that another man had seen the same thing whenever a man appeals to a miracle he tells what is not true truth relies upon reason and the undeviating course of all the laws of nature now we have a religion that is some people have i do not pretend to have religion myself i believe in living for this world that's my doctrine in living here now today tonight that's my doctrine to make everybody happy that you can now let the future take care of itself and if i ever touch the shores of another world i will be just as ready and anxious to get into some remunerative employment as anybody else now we have got in this country a religion which men have preached for about eighteen hundred years and just in proportion as their belief in that religion has grown great men have grown mean and wicked just in proportion as they have ceased to believe it men have become just and charitable 
and if they believe it to-night as they once believed it i wouldn't be allowed to speak in the city of new york it is from the coldness and infidelity of the churches that i get my right to preach and i say it to their credit now we have a religion what is it they say in the first place that all this vast universe was created by a deity i don't know whether it was or not they say too that had it not been for the first sin of adam there would never have been any devil in this world and if there had been no devil there would have been no sin and if there had been no sin there never would have been any death for my part i am glad there was somebody had to die to give me room and when my turn comes i'll be willing to let somebody else take my place but whether there is another life or not if there is any being who gave me this i shall thank him from the bottom of my heart because upon the whole my life has been a joy now they say because of this first sin all men were consigned to eternal hell and this because adam was our representative well i always had an idea that my representative ought to live somewhere about the same time i do i always had an idea that i should have some voice in choosing my representative and if i had a voice i never should have voted for the old gentleman called adam now in order to regain man from the frightful hell of eternity christ himself came to this world and took upon himself flesh and in order that we might know the road to eternal salvation he gave us a book and that book is called the bible and whenever that bible has been read men have immediately commenced cutting each other's throats wherever that bible has been circulated they have invented inquisitions and instruments of torture and they commenced hating each other with all their hearts but i am told now we are all told that this bible is the foundation of civilization but i say that this bible is the foundation of hell and we shall never get rid of the dogma of hell until we get rid of the idea that it is an inspired book now what does the bible teach i am not going to talk about what this minister or that minister says it teaches the question is ought a man to be sent to eternal hell for not believing this bible to be the work of a merciful father and the only way to find out is to read it and a very few people do read it now i will read a few passages this is the book to be read in the schools in order to make our children charitable and good this is the book that we must read in order that our children may have ideas of mercy charity and justice does the bible teach mercy now be honest i read i will make mine arrows drunk with blood and the sword shall devour flesh deuteronomy thirty two forty two pretty good start for a merciful god that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the same psalms ninety eight twenty three again and the lord thy god will put out those nations before thee by little and little thou mayest not consume them at once lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee deuteronomy seven twenty two but the lord thy god shall deliver them unto thee and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed and he shall deliver their kings into thine hand and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven there shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou have destroyed them deuteronomy seven twenty three and twenty four so joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by waters of merom suddenly and they fell upon them and the lord delivered them into the land of israel who smote them and chased them into the great zidon and into misrephothimeam and unto the valley of mizpeth eastward and they smote them until they left them none remaining and joshua did unto them as the lord bade him he hewed their horses and burnt their chariots with fire 
and joshua at that time turned back and took hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword for hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms and they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword utterly destroying them there was not any left to breathe and he burnt hazor with fire and all the cities of those kings, and all the kings of them, did Joshua take, and smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burnt none of them, save Hazor only, that did Joshua burn. And all the spoil of these cities, and the cattle, the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword, brave, until they had destroyed them. Neither left they any to breathe, as the moral God had commanded them. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took all that land, the hills, and all the south country, and all the land of Goshen, and the valley of the same, even from the Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, even unto Balgad in the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took, and smote them, and slew them. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hevites, the inhabitants of Gideon. All other they took in battle." For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them, as the Lord commanded Moses. And at that time came Joshua, and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debit, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel." Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod there remained. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. Joshua 11 seven to twenty three when thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it then proclaim peace unto it and if it shall be if it make thee answer of peace and open unto thee then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee and they shall serve thee and if it will make no peace with thee but will make war against thee then thou shalt besiege it and when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women, and the little ones, and the cattle, and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself, and thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities, which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations, but of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them. Deuteronomy 20, 10-17 neither the old men nor the women nor the maidens nor the sweet dimpled babe smiling upon the lap of his mother were to be spared and he said unto them thus saith the lord god of israel a merciful god indeed put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor Exodus thirty two twenty seven. Now recollect, these instructions were given to an army of invasion, and the people who were slayed were guilty of the crime of fighting for their homes. Oh, most merciful God! 
the old testament is full of curses vengeance jealousy and hatred and of barbarity and brutality now do you not for one moment believe that these words were written by the most merciful god don't pluck from the heart the sweet flowers of piety and crush them by superstition do not believe that god ever ordained the murder of innocent women and helpless babes do not let this supposition turn your hearts into stone when anything is said to have been written by the most merciful god and the thing is not merciful then i deny it and say he never wrote it i will live by the standard of reason and if thinking in accordance with reason takes me to perdition then i will go to hell with my reason rather than to heaven without it now does this bible teach political freedom or does it teach political tyranny does it teach a man to resist oppression does it teach a man to tear from the throne of tyranny the crowned thing and robber called a king let us see let every soul be subject to the higher powers for there is no power but of god the powers that are ordained of god romans twelve one all the kings and princes and governors and thieves and robbers that happened to be in authority were placed there by the infinite father of all whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of god and when george washington resisted the power of george the third he resisted the power of god and when our fathers said resistance to tyrants is obedience to god they falsified the bible itself for he is the minister of god to thee for good but if thou do that which is evil be afraid for he beareth not the sword in vain for he is the minister of god revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath but also for conscience sake romans thirteen four and five i deny this wretched doctrine wherever the sword of rebellion is drawn to protect the rights of man i am a rebel wherever the sword of rebellion is drawn to give man liberty to clothe him in all his just rights i am on the side of that rebellion i deny that the rulers are crowned by the most high the rulers are the people and the presidents and others are but the servants of the people all authority comes from the people and not from the aristocracy of the air upon these texts of scripture which i have just read rest the thrones of europe and these are the voices that are repeated from age to age by brainless kings and heartless kings does the bible give woman her rights is this bible humane does it treat woman as she ought to be treated or is it barbarian let us see let the woman learn in silence with all subjection one timothy two eleven if a woman would know anything let her ask her husband I imagine the ignorance of a lady who had only that source of information but i suffer not a woman to teach not to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence for adam was first formed then eve what magnificent reason and adam was not deceived but the woman being deceived was in the transgression splendid but i would have you know that the head of every man is christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of christ is god that is to say there is as much difference between the woman and man as there is between christ and man this is the liberty of woman for the man is not of the woman but the woman is of the man it was the man's cut till that was taken not the woman's neither was the man created for the woman well what was he created for but the woman was created for the man wives submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the lord there's liberty for the husband is the head of the wife even as christ is the head of the church and he is the saviour of the body therefore as the church is subject unto christ so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything good again even the saviour didn't put man and woman upon an equality 
the man could divorce the wife but the wife could not divorce the husband and according to the old testament the mother had to ask for forgiveness for being the mother of babes splendid here is something from the old testament when thou goest forth to war against thine enemies and the lord thy god hath delivered them into thine hands and thou hast taken them captive and seest among the captives a beautiful woman and has a desire unto her that thou wouldst have her to thy wife then thou shalt bring her to thine house and she shall shave her head and pare her nails deuteronomy twenty one ten through twelve that is in self-defense i suppose this sacred book this foundation of human liberty of morality does it teach concubinage and polygamy read the thirty-first chapter of numbers read the twenty-first chapter of deuteronomy read the blessed lives of abraham of david or of solomon and then tell me that the sacred scripture does not teach polygamy and concubinage all the language of the world is not sufficient to express the infamy of polygamy it makes a man a beast and woman a stone it destroys the fireside and makes virtue an outcast and yet it is the doctrine of the bible the doctrine defended by luther and melanchthon it takes from our language those sweetest words father husband wife and mother and takes us back to barbarism and fills our hearts with the crawling slimy serpents of loathsome lust does the bible teach the existence of devils of course it does yes it teaches not only the existence of a good being but a bad being this good being had to have a home that home was heaven this bad being had to have a home and that home was hell this hell is supposed to be nearer to earth than i would care to have it and to be peopled with spirits spooks hobgoblins and all the fiery shapes with which the imagination of ignorance and fear could people that horrible place and the bible teaches the existence of hell and this big devil and all these little devils the bible teaches the doctrine of witchcraft and makes us believe that there are sorcerers and witches and that the dead could be raised by the power of sorcery does anybody believe it now then said saul unto his servants seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit that i may go to her and inquire of her and his servants said to him behold there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at endor and saul disguised himself and put on other raiment and he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night and he said i pray thee divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom i shall name unto thee that was a pretty good spiritual seance and the woman said unto him behold thou knowest what saul hath done how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die and saul sware to her by the lord saying as the lord liveth there shall be no punishment happen to thee for this thing then said the woman whom shall i bring up unto thee and he said bring me up samuel and when the woman saw samuel she cried with a loud voice and the woman spoke to saul saying why hast thou deceived me for thou art saul and the king said unto her be not afraid for what sawest thou and the woman said unto saul i saw gods ascending out of the earth and he said unto her what form is he of and she said an old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle and saul perceived that it was samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself one samuel twenty eight seven through fourteen in another place he declares that witchcraft is an abomination unto the lord he wanted no rivals in this business now what does the new testament teach then was jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil and when he had fasted forty days and forty nights he was afterward and hungered and when the tempter came to him he said if thou be the son of god command that these stones be made bread 
but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of god then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, hell cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Matthew 4, 1-7 is it possible that any one can believe that the devil absolutely took god almighty and put him on the pinnacle of the temple and endeavored to persuade him to jump down is it possible again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him all these things will i give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me then saith jesus unto him get thee hence satan for it is written thou shalt worship the lord thy god and him only shalt thou serve matthew four eight through ten now the devil must have known at that time that he was god and god at that time must have known that the other was the devil how could the latter be conceived to have the impudence to promise god a world in which he did not have a tax title to an inch of land then the devil leaveth him and behold angels came and ministered unto him matthew four eleven and they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the gadarenes and when he was come out of the ship immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him no not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces neither could any man tame him and always night and day he was in the mountains and tombs crying and cutting himself with stones but when he saw jesus afar off he came and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said what have i to do with thee jesus thou son of the most high god i adjure thee by god that thou torment me not for he said unto him come out of the man thou unclean spirit and he asked him what is thy name and he answered saying my name is legion for we are many and he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding and all the devils besought him saying send us into the swine that we may enter into them and forthwith jesus gave them leave and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea they were about two thousand and were choked in the sea mark five one through thirteen now i will ask a question should reasonable men in the nineteenth century in the united states of america believe that that was an actual occurrence if my salvation depends upon believing that i am lost i have never experienced the signs by which it is said a believer may be known i deny all the witch stories in this world these fables of devils have covered the world with blood they have filled the world with fear and i am going to do what i can to free the world of these insatiate monsters small and great they have filled the world with monsters they have made the world a synonym of liar and ferocity and it is this book that ought to be read in all the schools this book that teaches man to enslave his brother if it is larceny to steal the result of labor how much more is it larceny to steal the laborer himself moreover of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you of them shall ye buy and of their families that are with you which they begat in your land and they shall be your possession and ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them for a possession they shall be your bondmen for ever but over your brethren the children of israel ye shall not rule one over another with rigor 
Leviticus 25, 45, 46. Why? Because they are not as good as you will buy of the heathen roundabout? Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. If the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, or unto the door-post, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him for ever. Exodus 21, 1-6 this is the doctrine which has ever lent itself to the chains of slavery, and makes a man imprison himself rather than desert his wife and children. I hate it. Now listen to the New Testament, the tidings of great joy for all people. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Ephesians 6, 5 and 6. Splendid Doctrine. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. 1 Peter 2, 18 and 19. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. He was afraid they might not work all the time, so he adds, not with the eye service as men pleases, but in the singleness of heart, fearing God. Read the twenty-first chapter of Exodus 7 to 11. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men servants do. If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her to himself, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. And if he do not these three unto her, then shall she go out free, without money. Servants, be obedient to your masters, is the salutation of the most merciful God, to one who works for nothing, and who receives upon his naked back the lash, as legal tender for service performed. Servants, be obedient to your masters, is the salutation of the most merciful God, to the slave mother bending over her infant's grave. Servants, be obedient to your masters, is the salutation to a man endeavoring to escape pursuit, followed by savage bloodhounds, and with his eye fixed upon the northern star. This book ought to be read in the schools, so that our children will love liberty. What does this same book say of the rights of little children? Let us see how they are treated by the most merciful God. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold of him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. Abraham was commanded to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, and he intended to obey. The boy was not consulted. Did you ever hear the story of Jephthah's daughter? 
returning him jephthah said and jephthah vowed a vow unto the lord and said if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of ammon into mine hands then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when i return in peace from the children of ammon shall surely be the lord's and i will offer it up for a burnt offering so Jephthah passed over into the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And he smote them from Aroer, even till thou come to Minneth, even twenty cities, and unto the plain of the vineyards, with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and, behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dance, and she was his only child. Besides her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass, when he saw her, that he rent his clothes, and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, forasmuch as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even to the children of Ammon. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may go up and down upon the mountains, and bewail my virginity, I and my fellows. And he said, Go. And he sent her away for two months, and she went with her companions, and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass, at the end of two months, that she returned unto her father, who did with her according to his vow which he had vowed. Is there in the history of the world a sadder story than this? Can a God who would accept such a sacrifice be worthy of the worship of civilized men? I believe in the rights of children. I plead for the republic of home, for the democracy of the fireside, and for this I am called a heathen and a devil by those who believe in the cheerful and comforting doctrine of eternal damnation. Read the book of Job. Read that God met the devil, and asked him where he had been, and he said, Walking up and down the country. And the Lord said to him, Have you noticed my man Job over there, how good he is? And the devil said, Of course he's good. You give him everything he wants. Just take away his property, and he'll curse you. You just try it. And he did try it, and took away his goods. But Job still remained good. The devil laughed and said he had not been tried enough. Then the Lord touched his flesh, but he was still true. Then he took away his children, but he remained faithful. And in the end, to show how much Job made by his fidelity, his property was all doubled, and he had more children than ever. If you have a child and you love it, would you be satisfied with a God who would destroy it? and endeavor to make it up by giving you another that was better looking? No! You want that one! You want no other! And yet this is the idea of the love of children taught in the Bible. End of Part 1 of Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell, Part 2 of 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ingersoll's Lecture on Hell, Part 2, from the book Lectures of Colonel R. G. Ingersoll. Does the Bible teach you freedom of religion? Today we say that every man has a right to worship God or not, to worship him as he pleases. Is it the doctrine of the Bible? Let us see. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, 
let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known thou nor thy fathers namely of the gods of the people which are round about you nigh unto thee or far off from thee from the one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth thou shalt not consent unto him nor hearken unto him neither shall thine eye pity him neither shalt thou spare neither shalt thou conceal him but thou shalt surely kill him thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death and afterwards the hand of all the people and thou shalt stone him with stones that he die because he has sought to thrust thee away from the lord thy god which brought thee out of the land of egypt from the house of bondage deuteronomy thirteen six through ten and do you know according to that if your wife your wife that you love as your own soul if you had lived in palestine and your wife had said to you let us worship a sun whose golden beams clothe the world in glory let us worship the sun let us bow to that great luminary i love the sun because it gave me your face because it gave me the features of my babe let us worship the sun it was then your duty to lay your hands upon her your eye must not pity her but it was your duty to cast the first stone against that tender and loving breast i hate such doctrine i hate such books i hate gods that will write such books i tell you that it is infamous if there be found among you within any of thy gates which the lord thy god giveth thee man or woman that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the lord thy god in transgressing his covenant and hath gone and served other gods and worshipped them either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven which i have not commanded and it be told thee and thou hast heard of it and inquired diligently and behold it be true and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in israel then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates even that man or that woman and shalt stone them with stones till they die deuteronomy seventeen two through five that is the religious liberty of the bible that's it and this god taught that doctrine to the jews and said to them any one that teaches a different religion kill him now let me ask and i want to do it reverently if as is contended god gave these frightful laws to the flesh and come among the jews and taught a different religion and these jews in accordance with the laws which this same god gave them crucified him did he not reap what he had sown the mercy of all this comes in what is called the plan of salvation what is that plan according to this great plan the innocent suffer for the guilty to satisfy a law what sort of law must it be that would be satisfied with the suffering of innocence according to this plan the salvation of the whole world depends upon the bigotry of the jews and the treachery of judas according to the same plan we all would have gone to eternal hell according to the same plan there would have been no death in the world if there had been no sin and if there had been no death you and i would not have been called into existence and if we did not exist we could not have been saved so we owe our salvation to the bigotry of the jews and the treachery of judas and we are indebted to the devil for our existence i speak this reverently it strikes me that what they call the atonement is a kind of moral bankruptcy under its merciful provisions man is allowed the privilege of sinning credit and whenever he is guilty of a mean action he says charge it in my judgment this kind of bookkeeping breeds extravagance in sin suppose we had a law in new york that every merchant should give credit to every man who asked it under pain and penitentiary and that every man should take the benefit of the bankruptcy statute any saturday night doesn't the credit system in morals breed extravagance in sin that's the question 
who's afraid of punishment which is so far away whom does the doctrine of hell stop the great the rich the powerful no the poor the weak the despised the mean did you ever hear of a man going to hell who died in new york worth a million of dollars or with an income of twenty five thousand a year did you did you ever hear of a man going to hell who rode in a carriage never they are the gentlemen who talk about their assets and who say hell is not for me it is for the poor i have all the luxuries i want give that to the poor who goes to hell tramps let me tell you a story there was once a frightful rain and all the animals held a convention to see whose fault it was and the fox nominated the lion for chairman the wolf seconded the motion and the hyena said that suits when the convention was called to order the fox was called upon to confess his sins he stated however that it would be much more appropriate for the lion to commence first thereupon the lion said i am not conscious of having committed evil it is true i have devoured a few men but for what other purpose were men made and they all cheered and were satisfied the fox gave his views upon the goose question and the wolf admitted that he had devoured sheep and occasionally had killed a shepherd but all acquainted with the history of my family will bear me out when i say that shepherds have been the enemies of my family from the beginning of the world then way in the rear there arose a simple donkey with a kind of abrahamic countenance he said i expect it's me i had eaten nothing for three days except three thistles i was passing a monastery the monks were at mass the gates were opened leading to a yard full of sweet clover i knew it was wrong but i did slip in and took a mouthful but my conscience smote me and i went out and all the animals shouted he's the fellow and in two minutes they had his hide on the fence that's the kind of people that go to hell now this doctrine of hell that has been such a comfort to my race which so many ministers are pleading for has been defended for ages by the fathers of the church your preacher says that the sovereignty of god implies that he has an absolute unlimited and independent right to dispose of his creatures as he will because he made them has he suppose i take this book and change it immediately into a servient human being would i have a right to torture it because i made it no on the contrary i would say having brought you into existence it is my duty to do the best for you i can they say god has a right to damn me because he made me i deny it Another one says God is not obliged to save even those who believe in Christ, and that he can either bestow salvation upon his children or retain it without any diminution of his glory. Another one says God may save any sinner whatsoever consistently with his justice. Let a natural person, and I claim to be one, moral or immoral wise or unwise let him be as just as he can no matter what his prayers be what pains he may have taken to be saved or whatever circumstances he may be in god according to this writer can deny him salvation without the least disparagement of his glory his glories will not be in the least obscured there is no natural man, be his character what it may, but God may cast down to hell without being charged with unfair dealing in any respect with regard to that man. Theologians tell us that God's design in the creation was simply to glorify himself. Magnificent object. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Revelations 14, 1 through 10. 
do you know nobody would have had an idea of hell in this world if it hadn't been for volcanoes they were looked upon as the chimneys of hell the idea of eternal fire never would have polluted the imagination of man but for them an eminent theologian describing hell says there is no recounting the millions of ages a damned shall suffer all arithmetic ends here and all sense too they shall have nothing to do in passing away this eternity but to conflict with torments god shall have no other use or employment for them these words were said by gentlemen who died christians and who are now in the harp business in the world to come another declares there is nothing to keep any man or christian out of hell except the mere pleasure of god and their pains never grow any easier by their becoming accustomed to them it is also declared that the devil goes about like a lion ready to doom the wicked did it never occur to you what a contradiction it is to say that the devil will persecute his own friends he wants all the recruits he can get why then should he persecute his friends in my judgment he should give them the best hell affords it is in the very nature of things that torments inflicted have no tendency to bring a wicked man to repentance then why torment him if it will not do him good it is simply unadulterated revenge all the punishment in the world will not reform a man unless he knows that he who inflicts it upon him does it for the sake of reformation and really and truly loves him and has his good at heart punishment inflicted for gratifying the appetite makes man afraid but debases him various reasons are given for punishing the wicked first that god will vindicate his injured majesty well i am glad of that second he will glorify his justice think of that third he will show and glorify his grace every time the saved shall look upon the damned in hell it will cause in them a lively and admiring sense of the grace of god every look upon the damned will double the ardor and the joy of the saints in heaven can the believing husband in heaven look down upon the torments of the unbelieving wife in hell and then feel a thrill of joy that's the old doctrine not of our days we are too civilized for that oh but it is the doctrine that if you saw your wife in hell the wife you love who in your last sickness nursed you that perhaps supported you by her needle when you were ill the wife who watched by your couch night and day and held your corpse in her loving arms when you were dead the sight would give you great joy that doctrine is not preached to-day they do not preach that the sight would give you joy but they do preach that it will not diminish your happiness that is the doctrine of every orthodox minister in new york and i repeat that i have no respect for men who preach such doctrines the sight of the torments of the damned in hell will increase the ecstasy of the saints forever on this principle man never enjoys a good dinner so much as when a fellow-creature is dying of famine before his eyes or he never enjoys the cheerful warmth of his own fireside so greatly as when a poor and abandoned wretch is dying on his doorstep the saints enjoy the ecstasy and the groans of the tormented are music to them I say here tonight that you cannot commit a sin against an infinite being. I can sin against my brother or my neighbor because I can injure them. There can be no sin where there is no injury. Neither can a finite being commit infinite sin. An old saint believed that hell was in the interior of the earth, and that the rotation of the earth was caused by the souls trying to get away from the fire the old church at stratford-on-avon shakespeare's home is adorned with pictures of hell and the like one of the pictures represents resurrection morning people are getting out of their graves and devils are catching hold of their heels 
in one place there is a huge brass monster and devils are driving scores of lost souls into his mouth over hot fires hang cauldrons with fifty or sixty people in each and devils are poking the fires people are hung up on hooks by their tongues and devils are lashing them up in the right-hand corner are some of the saved with grins on their faces stretching from ear to ear they seem to say aha what did i tell you some of the old saints gentlemen who died in the odor of sanctity and are now in the harp business insisted that heaven and hell would be plainly in view of each other only a few years ago rev j furness an appropriate name published a little pamphlet called a sight in hell i remember when i first read that my little child seven years old was ill and in bed I thought she would not hear me, and I read some of it aloud. She arose and asked, Who says that? I answered, That's what they preach in some of the churches. I never will enter a church as long as I live, she said, and she never has. The doctrine of Orthodox Christianity is that the damned shall suffer torment forever and ever, and if you were a wanderer, footsore, weary, with parched tongue dying for a drop of water and you met one who divided his poor portion with you and died as he saw you reviving if he was an unbeliever and you a believer and you died and went to heaven and he called to you from hell for a draught of water it would be your duty to laugh at him rev mr spurgeon says that everywhere in hell will be written the words for ever they will be branded on every wave of flame. They will be forged in every link of every chain. They will be seen in every lurid flash of brimstone. Everywhere will be those words forever. Everybody will be yelling and screaming them. Just think of that picture of the mercy and justice of the eternal Father of us all if these words are necessary why are they not written now everywhere in the world on every tree and every field and on every blade of grass i say i am entitled to have it so i say that it is god's duty to furnish me with the evidence here is another good book read in every sunday school a splendid book pollock's course of time every copy in the world of such books as that ought to be burned well the author pretends to have gone to hell and i think that he ought to have stopped there the lecturer read the passage from the work descriptive of the torments of the damned and proceeded and that book is put into the hands of children in order that they may love and worship the most merciful god in old time they had to find a place for hell and they found a hundred places for it one says that it was under lake avernus but the Christians thought differently. One divine tells us that it must be below the earth because Christ descended into hell. Another gives it as his opinion that hell is in the sun, and he tells us that nobody without an express revelation from God can prove that it is not there. Most likely. Well, he had the idea, at all events, of utilizing the damned as fuel to warm the earth but i will quote from another poet if it is lawful to call him a poet i mean tupper colonel ingersoll quoted from that orthodox author and continued another divine preached a sermon no further back than eighteen seventy six in which he said that the damned will grow worse and the same divine says that the devil was the first universalist then i am on the side of the devil the fact is that you have got not merely to believe the bible but you must also believe in a certain interpretation of it and mind you you must also believe in the doctrine of the trinity i want to explain what that is so that you may never have an excuse for not knowing it i quote from the best theologian that ever wrote then he went on to give in substance the athanasian definition of the trinity winding up with a long string of adjectives culminating in the description entirely incomprehensible 
If you don't understand it after that, it is your own fault. Now you must believe in that doctrine. If you do not, all the orthodox churches agree in condemning you to everlasting flames. We have got to burn through all our lives simply with the view of making them happy. We are taught to love our enemies, to pray for those that persecute us, to forgive. Should not the merciful God practice what he preaches? I say that reverently. Why should he say forgive your enemies if he will not himself forgive? Why should he say pray for those that despise and persecute you, but if they refuse to believe his doctrine he will burn them forever? I cannot believe it. Here is a little child residing in the purlieus of the city, some boy who is taught that it is his duty to steal by his mother, who applauds his success and pats him on the head and calls him a good boy. Would it be just to condemn him to an eternity of torture? Suppose there is a God. Let us bring to this question some common sense. I care nothing about the doctrines of religions or creeds of the past. Let us come to the bar of the nineteenth century and judge matter by what we know, by what we think, by what we love. But they say to us, if you throw away the Bible, what are we to depend on then? But no two persons in the world agree as to what the Bible is what they are to believe, and what they are not to believe. It is like a guidepost that has been thrown down in some time of disaster, and has been put up the wrong way. Nobody can accept its guidance, for nobody knows where it would direct him. I say, tear down the useless guidepost. But they answer, oh, do not do that, or we will have nothing to go by. I would say, old church, you take that road and I will take this. Another minister has said that the Bible is the great town clock at which we all may set our watches. But I have said to a friend of that minister, suppose we all should set our watches by that town clock. There would be many persons to tell you that in old times the long hand was the hour hand, and besides the clock hasn't been wound up for a long time. I say, let us wait till the sun rises and set our watches by nature. For my part, I am willing to give up heaven, to get rid of hell. I had rather there should be no heaven than that any solitary soul should be condemned to suffer forever and ever. But they tell me that the Bible is the good book. Now in the Old Testament there is not, in my judgment, a single reference to another life. Is there a burial service mentioned in it in which a word of hope is spoken at the grave of the dead? The idea of eternal life was not born of any book. That wave of hope and joy ebbs and flows and will continue to ebb and flow as long as love kisses the lips of death. Let me tell you a tale of the Persian religion, of a man who, having done good for long years of his life, presented himself at the gates of paradise, but the gates remained closed against him. He went back and followed up his good works for seven years longer, and the gates of paradise still remained shut against him. He toiled in works of charity until at last they were opened unto him. Think of that, pursued the lecturer, and send out your missionaries among those people. There is no religion but goodness, but justice, but charity. Religion is not theory, it is life. It is not intellectual conviction, it is divine humanity, and nothing else. Colonel Ingersoll here told another tale from the Hindu of a man who refused to enter paradise without a faithful dog, urging that ingratitude was the blackest of all sins. And the God, he said, admitted him, dog and all. Compare that religion with the orthodox tenets of the city of New York. There is a prayer which every Brahmin prays, in which he declares that he will never enter into a final state of bliss alone, but that everywhere he will strive for universal redemption. 
that never will he leave the world of sin and sorrow but remain suffering and striving and sorrowing after universal salvation compare that with the orthodox idea and send out your missionaries to the benighted hindus the doctrine of hell is infamous beyond all power to express i wish there were words mean enough to express my feelings of loathing on this subject what harm has it not done what waste places has it not made it has planted misery and wretchedness in this world it peoples the future with selfish joys and lurid abysses of eternal flame but we are getting more sense every day we begin to despise those monstrous doctrines if you want to better men and women change their conditions here don't promise them something somewhere else one biscuit will do more good than all the tracts that were ever peddled in the world give them more whitewash more light more air you have to change men physically before you change them intellectually i believe the time will come when every criminal will be treated as we now treat the diseased and sick when every penitentiary will become a reformatory and that if criminals go to them with hatred in their bosoms they will leave them without feelings of revenge let me tell you the story of orpheus and eurydice eurydice had been carried away by the god of hell and orpheus her lover went in quest of her he took with him his lyre and played such exquisite music that all hell was amazed ixion forgot his labors at the wheel the daughters of danaeus ceased from their hopeless task tantalus forgot his thirst even pluto smiled and for the first time in the history of hell the eyes of the furies were wet with tears as it was with the lyre of orpheus so it is to-day with the great harmonies of science which are rescuing from the prisons of superstition the torn and bleeding heart of man end of ingersoll's lecture on hell this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain this is the third lecture from Lectures of Colonel R. G. Ingersoll, read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during May 2007. Ingersoll's Lecture on Individuality This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. Lecture number four, Ingersoll's Lecture on Individuality, an Arraignment of the Church. His soul was like a star and dwelt apart. On every hand are the enemies of individuality and mental freedom custom meets us at the cradle and leaves us only at the tomb our first questions are answered by ignorance and our last by superstition we are pushed and dragged by countless hands along the beaten track and our entire training can be summed up in the word suppression our desire to have a thing or to do a thing is considered as conclusive evidence that we ought to do it at every turn we run not to have it and ought not against a cherubim and a flaming sword guarding some entrance to the eden of our desire we are allowed to investigate all subjects in which we feel no particular interest and to express the opinions of the majority with the utmost freedom we are taught that liberty of speech should never be carried to the extent of contradicting the dead witnesses of a popular superstition society offers continual rewards for self-betrayal and they are nearly all earned and claimed and some are paid we have all read accounts of christian gentlemen remarking when about to be hanged how much better it would have been for them if they had only followed a mother's advice but after all how fortunate it is for the world that the maternal advice has not been followed 
how lucky it is for us all that it is somewhat unnatural for a human being to obey universal obedience is universal stagnation disobedience is one of the conditions of progress select any age of the world and tell me what would have been the effect of implicit obedience suppose the church had had absolute control of the human mind at any time would not the word liberty and progress have been blotted from the human speech in defiance of advice the world has advanced suppose the astronomers had controlled the science of astronomy suppose the doctors had controlled the science of medicine suppose kings had been left to fix the form of government suppose our fathers had taken the advice of paul who was subject to the powers that be because they are ordained of god suppose the church could control the world today we would go back to chaos and old night philosophy would be branded as infamous science would again press its pale and thoughtful face against the prison bars and round the limbs of liberty would climb the bigot's flame it is a blessed thing that in every age some one has had individuality enough and courage enough to stand by his own convictions some one who had the grit to say his say i believe it was magellan who said the church says the earth is flat but i have seen its shadow on the moon and i have more confidence even in a shadow than in the church on the prow of his ship were disobedience defiance scorn and success the trouble with most people is that they bow to what is called authority they have a certain reverence for the old because it is old they think a man is better for being dead especially if he has been dead a long time and that the forefathers of their nation were the greatest and best of all mankind all these things they implicitly believe because it is popular and patriotic and because they were told so when very small and remember distinctly of hearing mother read it out of a book and they are all willing to swear that mother was a good woman it is hard to overestimate the influence of early training in the direction of superstition you first teach children that a certain book is true that it was written by god himself that to question its truth is sin and to deny it is a crime and that should they die without believing that book they will be forever damned without benefit of clergy the consequence is that before they read that book they believe it to be true when they do read their minds are wholly unfitted to investigate its claim they accept it as a matter of course in this way reason is overcome the sweet instincts of humanity are blotted from the heart and while reading its infamous pages even justice throws aside her scales shrieking for revenge and charity with bloody hands applauds a deed of murder in this way we are taught that the revenge of man is the justice of god that mercy is not the same everywhere in this way the ideas of our race have been subverted in this way we have made tyrants bigots and inquisitors in this way the brain of man has become a kind of palimpsest upon which and over the writings of nature superstition has scribbled her countless lies our great trouble is that most teachers are dishonest they teach as certainties those things concerning which they entertain doubts they do not say we think this is so but we know this is so they do not appeal to the reason of the pupil but they command his faith they keep all doubts to themselves they do not explain they assert all this is infamous in this way you make christians but you cannot make men you cannot make women you can make followers but no leaders disciples but no christs 
you may promise power honor and happiness to all those who will blindly follow but you cannot keep your promise an eastern monarch said to a hermit come with me and i will give you power i have all the power that i know how to use replied the hermit come said the king i will give you wealth i have no wants that money can supply i will give you honor ah honor cannot be given it must be earned come said the king making a last appeal and i will give you happiness no said the man of solitude there is no happiness without liberty and he who follows cannot be free you shall have your liberty too then i will stay and all the king's courtiers thought the hermit a fool now and then somebody examines and in spite of all keeps up his manhood and has courage to follow where his reason leads then the pious get together and repeat wise saws and exchange knowing nods and most prophetic winks the stupidly wise sit owl-like on the dead limbs of the tree of knowledge and solemnly hoot wealth sneers and fashion laughs and respectability passes on the other side and scorn points with all her skinny fingers and like the snakes of superstition writhe and hiss and slander lends her tongue and infamy her brand perjury her oath and the law its power and bigotry tortures and the church kills the church hates a thinker precisely for the same reason that a robber dislikes a sheriff or that a thief despises the prosecuting witness tyranny likes courtiers flatterers followers fawners and superstition wants believers disciples zealots hypocrites and subscribers the church demands worship the very thing that man should give to no being human or divine to worship another is to degrade yourself worship is awe and dread and vague fear and blind hope it is the spirit of worship that elevates the one and degrades the many and manacles even its own hands the spirit of worship is the spirit of tyranny the worshipper always regrets that he is not the worshipped we should all remember that the intellect has no knees and that whatever the attitude of the body may be the brave soul is always found erect whoever worships abdicates whoever believes at the commands of power tramples his own individuality beneath his feet and voluntarily robs himself of all that renders man superior to brute the despotism of faith is justified upon the ground that christian countries are the grandest and most prosperous of the world at one time the same thing could have been truly said in india in egypt in greece in rome and in every other country that has in the history of the world swept to empire this argument proves too much not only but the assumption upon which it is based is utterly false numberless circumstances and countless conditions have produced the prosperity of the christian world the truth is that we have advanced in spite of religious zeal ignorance and opposition the church has won no victories for the rights of man over every fortress of tyranny has waved and still waves the banner of the church wherever brave blood has been shed the sword of the church has been wet on every chain has been the sign of the cross the altar and the throne have leaned against and supported each other who can appreciate the infinite impudence of one man assuming to think for others who can imagine the impudence of a church that threatens to inflict eternal punishment upon those who honestly reject its claims and scorn its pretensions in the presence of the unknown we have all an equal right to guess 
over the vast plain called life we are all travelers and not one traveler is perfectly certain that he is going in the right direction true it is that no other plain is so well supplied with guide-boards at every turn and crossing you find them and upon each one is written the exact direction and distance one great trouble is, however, that these boards are all different, and the result is that most travelers are confused in proportion to the number they read. Thousands of people are around each of these signs, and each one is doing his best to convince the traveler that his particular board is the only one upon which the least reliance can be placed and that if his road is taken the reward for so doing will be infinite and eternal while all the other roads are said to lead to hell and all the makers of the other guide boards are declared to be heretics hypocrites and liars well says a traveller you may be right in what you say but allow me at least to read some of the other directions and examine a little into their claims I wish to rely a little upon my own judgment in a matter of such great importance. No, sir, shouts the zealot, that is the very thing you are not allowed to do. You must go my way, without investigation, or you are as good as damned already. Well, says the traveller, if that is so, I believe I had better go your way and so most of them go along taking the word of those who know as little as themselves now and then comes one who in spite of all threats calmly examines the claims of all and as calmly rejects them all these travellers take roads of their own and are denounced by all the others as infidels and atheists in my judgment every human being should take a road of his own every mind should be true to itself should think investigate and conclude for itself this is a duty alike incumbent upon pauper and prince every soul should repel dictation and tyranny no matter from what source they come from earth or heaven from men or gods besides every traveller upon this vast plain should give to every other traveller his best idea as to the road that should be taken each is entitled to the honest opinion of all and there is but one way to get an honest opinion upon any subject whatever the person giving the opinion must be free from fear the merchant must not fear to lose his custom, the doctor his practice, nor the preacher his pulpit. There can be no advance without liberty. Suppression of honest inquiry is retrogression, and must end in intellectual night. The tendency of orthodox religion today is towards mental slavery and barbarism not one of the orthodox ministers dare preach what he thinks if he knows that a majority of his congregation think otherwise he knows that every member of his church stands guard over his brain with a creed like a club in his hand he knows that he is not expected to search after the truth but that he is employed to defend the creed every pulpit is a pillory in which stands a hired culprit defending the justice of his own imprisonment is it desirable that all should be exactly alike in their religious convictions is any such thing possible do we not know that there are no two persons alike in the whole world no two trees no two leaves no two anythings that are alike infinite diversity is the law religion tries to force all minds into one mould knowing that all cannot believe the church endeavors to make all say that they believe she longs for the unity of hypocrisy and detests the splendid diversity of individuality and freedom nearly all people stand in great horror of annihilation and yet to give up your individuality is to annihilate yourself mental slavery is mental death and every man who has given up his intellectual freedom is the living coffin of his dead soul 
In this sense, every church is a cemetery, and every creed an epitaph. We should all remember that to be like other folks is to be unlike ourselves, and that nothing can be more detestable in character than servile imitation. The great trouble with imitation is that we are apt to ape those who are in reality far below us. After all, the poorest bargain that a human being can make is to trade off his individuality for what is called respectability. There is no saying more degrading than this. It is better to be the tail of a lion than the head of a dog. It is a responsibility to think and act for yourself. Most people hate responsibility. Therefore, they join something and become the tail of some lion. They say, my party can act for me. My church can do my thinking. It is enough for me to pay taxes and obey the lion to which I belong, without troubling myself about the right, the wrong, or the why or the wherefore of anything whatever. These people are respectable. They hate reformers and dislike exceedingly to have their minds disturbed. They regard convictions as very disagreeable things to have. They love forms, and enjoy beyond everything else telling what a splendid tail their lion has, and what a troublesome dog their neighbor is. Besides this natural inclination, to avoid personal responsibility is, and always has been the fact, that every religionist has warned men against the presumption and wickedness of thinking for themselves. The reason has been denounced by all Christendom as the only unsafe guide. The church has left nothing undone to prevent man following the logic of his brain, the plainest facts have been covered with the mantle of mystery. The grossest absurdities have been declared to be self-evident facts. The order of nature has been, as it were, reversed, in order that the hypocritical few might govern the honest many. The man who stood by the conclusion of his reason was denounced as a scorner and hater of God and his holy church. From the organization of the first church until this moment, every member has borne the marks of collar and chain and whip. No man ever seriously attempted to reform a church without being cast out and hunted down by the hounds of hypocrisy. The highest crime against a creed is to change it. Reformation is treason. Thousands of young men are being educated at this moment by the various churches. What for? In order that they may be prepared to investigate the phenomena by which we are surrounded? No. The object, and the only object, is that they may be prepared to defend a creed, that they may learn the arguments of their respective churches and repeat them in the dull ears of a thoughtless congregation. If one, after being thus trained at the expense of the Methodists, turns Presbyterian or Baptist, he is denounced as an ungrateful wretch. Honest investigation is utterly impossible within the pale of any church, for the reason that if you think the church is right, you will not investigate, and if you think it wrong, the church will investigate you. The consequence of this is that most of the theological literature is the result of suppression, of fear, of tyranny and hypocrisy. Every orthodox writer necessarily said to himself, If I write that, my wife and children may want for bread. I will be covered with shame and branded with infamy. But if I write this, I will gain position, power, and honor. My church rewards defenders and burns reformers. Under these conditions, all your Scots, Henrys, and McKnights have written, and weighed in these scales what are their commentaries worth. They are not the ideas and decisions of honest judges, but the sophisms of the paid attorneys of superstition. Who can tell what the world has lost by this infamous system of suppression? How many grand thinkers died with the mailed hand of superstition on their lips? 
how many splendid ideas have perished in the cradle of the brain strangled in the poisonous coils of that python the church for thousands of years a thinker was hunted down like an escaped convict to him who had braved the church every door was shut every knife was open to shelter him from the wild storm to give him a crust of bread when dying to put a cup of water to his cracked and bleeding lips these were all crimes not one of which the church ever did forgive and with the justice taught of god his helpless children were exterminated as scorpions and vipers who at the present day can imagine the courage the devotion to principle the intellectual and moral grandeur it once required to be an infidel to brave the church her racks her faggots her dungeons her tongues of fire to defy and scorn her heaven and her devil and her god they were the noblest sons of earth they were the real saviors of our race the destroyers of superstition and the creators of science they were the real titans who bared their grand foreheads to all the thunderbolts of all the gods the church has been and still is the great robber she has rifled not only the pockets but the brains of the world she is the stone at the sepulchre of liberty the upas tree in whose shade the intellect of man has withered the gorgon beneath whose gaze the human heart has turned to stone under her influence even the protestant mother expects to be in heaven while her brave boy who is fighting for the rights of man shall writhe in hell it is said that some of the indian tribes place the heads of their children between pieces of bark until the form of the skull is permanently changed to us this seems a most shocking custom and yet after all is it as bad as to put the souls of our children in the straitjacket of a creed to so utterly deform their minds that they regard the god of the bible as a being of infinite mercy and really consider it a virtue to believe a thing just because it seems unreasonable every child in the christian world has uttered its wondering protest against this outrage all the machinery of the church is constantly employed in thus corrupting the reason of children in every possible way they are robbed of their own thoughts and forced to accept the statements of others every sunday school has for its object the crushing out of every germ of individuality the poor children are taught that nothing can be more acceptable to god than unreasoning obedience and eyeless faith and that to believe that god did an impossible act is far better than to do a good one yourself they are told that all the religions have been simply the john the baptist of ours that all the gods of antiquity have withered and sunken into the jehovah of the jews that all the longings and aspirations of the race are realized in the motto of the evangelical alliance liberty in non-essentials that all there is or ever was of religion can be found in the apostles creed that there is nothing left to be discovered that all the thinkers are dead and all the living should simply be believers that we have only to repeat the epitaph found on the grave of wisdom that graveyards are the best possible universities and that the children must be forever beaten with the bones of the father it has always seemed absurd to suppose that a god would choose for his companions during all eternity the dear souls whose highest and only ambition is to obey he certainly would now and then be tempted to make the same remark made by an english gentleman to his poor guest this gentleman had invited a man in humble circumstances to dine with him the man was so overcome with honor that to everything the gentleman said he replied yes tired at last with the monotony of acquiescence 
the gentleman cried out for god's sake my good man say no just once so there will be two of us is it possible that an infinite god created this world simply to be the dwelling place of slaves and serfs simply for the purpose of raising orthodox christians that he did a few miracles to astonish them that all the evils of life are simply his punishments and that he is finally going to turn heaven into a kind of religious museum filled with baptist barnacles petrified presbyterians and methodist mummies i want no heaven for which i must give my reason no happiness in exchange for my liberty and no immortality that demands the surrender of my individuality better rot in the windowless tomb to which there is no door but the red mouth of the pallid worm than wear the jewelled collar even of a god religion does not and cannot contemplate man as free she accepts only the homage of the prostrate and scorns the offerings of those who stand erect she cannot tolerate the liberty of thought the wide and sunny fields belong not to her domain the starlit heights of genius and individuality are above and beyond her appreciation and power her subjects cringe at her feet, covered with the dust of obedience. They are not athletes, standing posed by rich life and brave endeavor like the antique statues, but shriveled deformities, studying with furtive glance the cruel face of power. No religionist seems capable of comprehending this plain truth. There is this difference between thought and action for our actions we are responsible to ourselves and to those injuriously affected for thoughts there can in the nature of things be no responsibility to gods or men here or hereafter and yet the protestant has vied with the catholic in denouncing freedom of thought and while i was taught to hate catholicism with every drop of my blood it is only justice to say that in all essential particulars it is precisely the same as every other religion luther denounced mental liberty with all the coarse and brutal vigor of his nature calvin despised from the very bottom of his petrified heart anything that even looked like religious toleration and solemnly declared to advocate it was to crucify christ afresh all the founders of all the orthodox churches have advocated the same infamous tenet the truth is that what is called religion is necessarily inconsistent with free thought a believer is a songless bird in a cage a free thinker is an eagle parting the clouds with tireless wings at present owing to the inroads that have been made by liberals and infidels most of the churches pretend to be in favor of religious liberty of these churches we will ask this question how can a man who conscientiously believes in religious liberty worship a god who does not they say to us we will not imprison you on account of your belief but our god will we will not burn you because you throw away the sacred scriptures but their author will we think it an infamous crime to persecute our brethren for opinion's sake but the god whom we ignorantly worship will on that account damn his own children for ever why is it that these christians do not only detest the infidels but so cordially despise each other why do they refuse to worship in the temples of each other why do they care so little for the damnation of men and so much for the baptism of children why will they adorn their churches with the money of thieves and flatter vice for the sake of subscription why will they attempt to bribe science to certify to the writings of god why do they torture the words of the great into an acknowledgment of the truth of christianity why do they stand with hat in hand before presidents kings emperors and scientists begging like lazarus for a few crumbs of religious comfort why are they so delighted to find an allusion to providence in the message of lincoln 
why are they so afraid that some one will find out that paley wrote an essay in favor of the epicurean philosophy and that sir isaac newton was once an infidel why are they so anxious to show that voltaire recanted that paine died palsied with fear that the emperor julian cried out galilean thou hast conquered that gibbon died a catholic that agassiz had a little confidence in moses that the old napoleon was once complimentary enough to say that he thought christ greater than himself or caesar that washington was caught on his knees at valley forge that blunt old ethan allen told his child to believe the religion of her mother that franklin said don't unchain the tiger that Volney got frightened in a storm at sea, and that Oakes Ames was a wholesale liar. Is it because the foundation of their temple is crumbling, because the walls are cracked, the pillars leaning, the great dome swaying to its fall, and because science has written over the high altar its mene mene tekel upharsin, the old words destined to be the epitaph of all religions? every assertion of individual independence has been a step towards infidelity luther started toward humboldt wesley toward bradlaugh to really reform the church is to destroy it every new religion has a little less superstition than the old so that the religion of science is but a question of time i will not say the church has been an unmitigated evil in all respects its history is infamous and glorious it has delighted in the production of extremes it has furnished murderers for its own martyrs it has sometimes fed the body but has always starved the soul it has been a charitable highwayman a generous pirate it has produced some angels and a multitude of devils it has built more prisons than asylums it made a hundred orphans while it cared for one in one hand it carried the alms dish and in the other a sword it has founded schools and endowed universities for the purpose of destroying true learning it filled the world with hypocrites and zealots and upon the cross of its own christ it crucified the individuality of man it has sought to destroy the independence of the soul and put the world upon its knees this is the crime the commission of this crime was necessary to its existence in order to compel obedience it declared that it had the truth and all the truth that god had made it the keeper of all his secrets his agent and his vice agent it declared that all other religions were false and infamous it rendered all compromises impossible and all thought superfluous thought was an enemy obedience was its friend investigation was fraught with danger therefore investigation was suppressed the holy of holies was behind the curtain all this was upon the principle that forgers hate to have the signature examined by an expert and that imposture detests curiosity he that hath ears to hear let him hear has always been one of the favorite texts of the church in short christianity has always opposed every forward movement of the human race across the highway of progress it has always been building breastworks of bibles tracts commentaries prayer books creeds dogmas and platforms and at every advance the christians have gathered behind these heaps of rubbish and shot the poisoned arrows of malice at the soldiers of freedom and even the liberal christian of to-day has his holy of holies and in the niche of the temple of his heart has his idol he still clings to a part of the old superstition and all the pleasant memories of the old belief linger in the horizon of his thoughts like a sunset we associate the memory of those we love with the religion of our childhood it seems almost a sacrilege to rudely destroy the idols that our fathers worshipped and turn their sacred and beautiful truths into the silly fables of barbarism 
some throw away the old testament and cling to the new while others give up everything except the idea that there is a personal god and that in some wonderful way we are the objects of his care even this in my opinion as science the great iconoclast marches onward will have to be abandoned with the rest the great ghost will surely share the fate of the little ones they fled at the first appearance of the dawn and the other will vanish with the perfect day until then the independence of man is little more than a dream overshadowed by an immense personality in the presence of the irresponsible and the infinite the individuality of man is lost and he falls prostrate in the very dust of fear beneath the frown of the absolute man stands a wretched trembling slave beneath his smile he is at best only a fortunate serf governed by a being whose arbitrary will is law chained to the chariot of power his destiny rests in the pleasure of the unknown under these circumstances what wretched object can he have in lengthening out his aimless life and yet in most minds there is a vague fear of what the gods may do and the safe side is considered the best side a gentleman walking among the ruins of athens came upon a fallen statue of jupiter making an exceedingly low bow he said jupiter i salute thee he then added should you ever get up in the world again do not forget i pray you that i treated you politely while you were prostrate <laughs> We all have been taught by the church that nothing is so well calculated to excite the ire of the deity as to express a doubt as to his existence, and that to deny it is an unpardonable sin. Numerous well-attested instances were referred to of atheists being struck dead for denying the existence of God. According to these religious people, God is infinitely above us in every respect, infinitely merciful, and yet he cannot bear to hear a poor finite man honestly question his existence, knowing as he does that his children are groping in darkness and struggling with doubt and fear, knowing that he could enlighten them if he would, he still holds the expression of a sincere doubt as to his existence the most infamous of crimes according to the orthodox logic god having furnished us with imperfect minds has a right to demand a perfect result suppose mr smith should overhear a couple of small bugs holding a discussion as to the existence of mr smith and suppose one should have the temerity to declare upon the honor of a bug that he had examined the whole question to the best of his ability including the argument based upon design and had come to the conclusion that no man by the name of smith had ever lived think then of mr smith flying into an ecstasy of rage crushing the atheist bug beneath his iron heel while he exclaimed i will teach you blasphemous wretch that smith is a diabolical fact what then can we think of god who would open the artillery of heaven upon one of his own children for simply expressing his honest thought and what man who really thinks can help repeating the words of aeneas if there are gods they certainly pay no attention to the affairs of man in religious ideas and conceptions there has been for ages a slow and steady development at the bottom of the ladder speaking of modern times is catholicism and at the top are atheism and science the intermediate rounds of this ladder are occupied by the various sects whose name is legion but whatever may be the truth on any subject has nothing to do with our right to investigate that subject and express any opinion we may form all that i ask is the right i freely accord to all others a few years ago a methodist clergyman took it upon himself to give me a piece of friendly advice although you may disbelieve the bible said he you ought not to say so that you should keep to yourself do you believe the bible said i he replied most assuredly to which i retorted your answer conveys no information to me you may be following your own advice you told me to suppress my opinions 
of course a man who will advise others to dissimulate will not always be particular about telling the truth himself it is the duty of each and every one to maintain his individuality this above all to thine own self be true and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man it is a magnificent thing to be the sole proprietor of yourself it is a terrible thing to wake up at night and say there is nobody in this bed it is humiliating to know that your ideas are all borrowed and that you are indebted to your memory for your principles that your religion is simply one of your habits and that you would have convictions if they were only contagious it is mortifying to feel that you belong to a mental mob and cry crucify him because the others do that you reap what the great and brave have sown and that you can benefit the world only by leaving it surely every human being ought to attain the dignity of the unit surely it is worth something to be one and to feel that the census of the universe would not be complete without counting you surely there is grandeur in knowing that in the realm of thought at least you are without a chain that you have the right to explore all heights and all depths that there are no walls, fences, prohibited places, nor sacred corners in all the vast expanse of thought, that your intellect owes no allegiance to any being, human or divine, that you hold all in fee and upon no condition and by no tenure whatever, that in the world of mind you are relieved from all personal dictation and from the ignorant tyranny of majorities. Surely it is worth something to feel that there are no priests, no popes, no parties, no governments, no kings, no gods to whom your intellect can be compelled to pay a reluctant homage surely it is a joy to know that all the cruel ingenuity of bigotry can devise no prison no lock no cell in which for one instant to confine a thought that ideas cannot be dislocated by racks nor crushed in iron boots nor burned with fire surely it is sublime to think that the brain is a castle and that within its curious bastions and winding halls the soul, in spite of all worlds and all beings, is the supreme sovereign of itself. End of Ingersoll's Lecture on Individuality This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Ingersoll's Lecture on Individuality is the fourth lecture from the book Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll read for you by ted delorme in fort mill south carolina during may two thousand seven ingersoll's lecture on humboldt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Ingersoll's Lecture on Humboldt. Ladies and gentlemen, great minds seem to be a part of the infinite. Those possessing them seem to be brothers of the mountains and the seas. Humboldt was one of these. He was one of the few great enough to rise above the superstition and prejudice of his time, and to know that experience, observation, and reason are the only basis of knowledge. He became one of the greatest of men in spite of having been born rich and noble, in spite of position. I say in spite of these things, because wealth and position are generally the enemies of genius and the destroyers of talent. It is often said of this or that man that he is a self-made man, that he was born of the poorest and humblest parents, and that with every obstacle to overcome he became great this is a mistake poverty is generally an advantage 
most of the intellectual giants of the world have been nursed at the sad but loving breast of poverty most of those who have climbed highest on the shining ladder of fame commenced at the lowest round they were reared in the straw-thatched cottages of europe in the log houses of america in the factories of the great cities in the midst of toil in the smoke and din of labor and on the verge of want they were rocked by the feet of mothers whose hands at the same time were busy with the needle or the wheel it is hard for the rich to resist the thousand allurements of pleasure and so i say that humboldt in spite of having been born to wealth and high social position became truly and grandly great in the antiquated and romantic castle of tegel by the side of the pine forest on the shore of the charming lake near the beautiful city of berlin the great Humboldt, one hundred years ago to-day, was born, and there he was educated after the method suggested by Rousseau, Campe, the philologist and critic, and the intellectual Kunt being his tutors. There he received the impressions that determined his career. There the great idea that the universe is governed by law took possession of his mind, and there he dedicated his life to the demonstration of this sublime truth he came to the conclusion that the source of man's unhappiness is his ignorance of nature he longed to give a physical description of the universe a grand picture of nature to account for all phenomena to discover the laws governing the world to do away with that splendid delusion called special providence and to establish the fact that the universe is governed by law to establish this truth was and is of infinite importance to mankind that fact is the death knell of superstition it gives liberty to every soul annihilates fear and ushers in the age of reason the object of this illustrious man was to comprehend the phenomena of physical objects in their general connection and to represent nature as one great whole moved and animated by internal forces for this purpose he turned his attention to descriptive botany traversing distant lands and mountain ranges to ascertain with certainty the geographical distribution of plants he investigated the laws regulating the differences of temperature and climate and the changes of the atmosphere he studied the formation of the earth's crust explored the deepest mines ascended the highest mountains and wandered through the craters of extinct volcanoes he became thoroughly acquainted with chemistry with astronomy with terrestrial magnetism and as the investigation of one subject leads to all others for the reason that there is a mutual dependence and a necessary connection between all facts so humboldt became acquainted with all the known sciences his fame does not depend so much upon his discoveries although he discovered enough to make hundreds of reputations as upon his vast and splendid generalizations he was to science what shakespeare was to drama he found so to speak the world full of unconnected facts all portions of a vast system parts of a great machine he discovered the connection that each bears to all put them together and demonstrated beyond all contradiction that the earth is governed by law he knew that to discover the connection of phenomena is the primary aim of all natural investigation he was infinitely practical origin and destiny were questions with which he had nothing to do his surroundings made him what he was in accordance with a law not fully comprehended he was a production of his time great men do not live alone they are surrounded by the great they are the instruments used to accomplish the tendencies of their generation they fulfil the prophecies of their age nearly all of the scientific men of the eighteenth century had the same idea entertained by humboldt but most of them in a dim and confused way there was however a general belief among the intelligent that the world is governed by law and that there really exists a connection between all facts 
or that all facts are simply the different aspects of a general fact, and that the task of science is to discover this connection, to comprehend this general fact, or to announce the laws of things. Germany was full of thought, and her universities swarmed with philosophers and grand thinkers in every department of knowledge. Humboldt was the friend and companion of the greatest poets, historians, philologists, artists, statesmen, critics, and logicians of his time. He was the companion of Schiller, who believed that man would be regenerated through the influence of the beautiful of Goethe, the grand patriarch of German literature, of Weiland, who has been called the Voltaire of Germany, of Herder, who wrote the outlines of a philosophical history of man, of Kotzebue, who lived in the world of romance, or Schliermacher, the pantheist, of Schlegel, who gave to his country the enchanted realm of Shakespeare, of the sublime Kant, author of the first work published in Germany on pure reason of Fichte, the infinite idealist, of Schopenhauer, the European Buddhist who followed the great Gautama to the painless and dreamless Nirvana, and of hundreds of others whose names are familiar to and honored by the scientific world. The German mind had been grandly roused from the long lethargy of the dark ages of ignorance, fear, and faith. Guided by the holy light of reason, every department of knowledge was investigated, enriched, and illustrated. Humboldt breathed the atmosphere of investigation. Old ideas were abandoned. Old creeds, hallowed by centuries, were thrown aside. Thought became courageous. The athlete, reason, challenged to mortal combat the monsters of superstition. No wonder that under these influences Humboldt formed the great purpose of presenting to the world a picture of nature, in order that men might for the first time behold the face of their mother. Europe becoming too small for his genius, he visited the tropics in the New World, where, in the most circumscribed limits, he could find the greatest number of plants, of animals, and the greatest diversity of climate that he might ascertain the laws governing the production and distribution of plants, animals, and men, and the effects of climate upon them all. He sailed along the gigantic Amazon, the mysterious Orinoco, traversed the Pampas, climbed the Andes, until he stood upon the crags of Chimborazo, more than 18,000 feet above the level of the sea, and climbed on until blood flowed from his eyes and lips. For nearly five years he pursued his investigations in the New World, accompanied by the intrepid Bonpland. Nothing escaped his attention. He was the best intellectual organ of these new revelations of science. He was calm, reflective, and eloquent, filled with a sense of the beautiful and the love of truth. His collections were immense and valuable beyond calculation to every science. He endured innumerable hardships, braved countless dangers in unknown and savage lands, and exhausted his fortune for the advancement of true learning. Upon his return to Europe, he was hailed as the second Columbus, as the scientific discoverer of America, as the revealer of a new world, as the great demonstrator of the sublime truth that universe is governed by law. I have seen a picture of the old man sitting upon a mountainside, above him the eternal snow, below smiling valley of the tropics, filled with vine and palm, his chin upon his breast, his eyes deep, thoughtful, and calm, his forehead majestic, grander than the mountain upon which he sat. Crowned with the snow of his whitened hair, he looked the intellectual autocrat of this world. Not satisfied with his discoveries in America, he crossed the steppes of Asia, the wastes of Siberia, the great Ural Range, adding to the knowledge of mankind at every step. His energy acknowledged no obstacle, his life knew no leisure. Every day was filled with labor and with thought. He was one of the apostles of science, and he served his divine master with a self-sacrificing zeal that knew no abatement. 
with an ardor that constantly increased and with a devotion unwavering and constant as the polar star in order that the people at large might have the benefit of his numerous discoveries and his vast knowledge he delivered at berlin a course of lectures consisting of sixty-one free addresses upon the following subjects five upon the nature and limits of physical geography three were devoted to a history of science two to inducements to a study of natural science sixteen on the heavens five on the form density latent heat and magnetic power of the earth and to the polar light four were on the nature of the crust of the earth on hot springs earthquakes and volcanoes two on mountains and the type of their formation two on the form of the earth's surface on the connection of continents and the elevation of soil over ravines three on the sea as a globular fluid surrounding the earth ten on the atmosphere as an elastic fluid surrounding the earth and on the distribution of heat one on the geographic distribution of organized matter in general three on the geography of plants three on the geography of animals and two on the races of men these lectures are what is known as the cosmos and present a scientific picture of the world of infinite diversity in unity of ceaseless motion in the eternal grasp of law these lectures contain the result of his investigation observation and experience they furnish the connection between phenomena they disclose some of the changes through which the earth has passed in the countless ages the history of vegetation animals and men the effects of climate upon individuals and nations the relation we sustain to other worlds and demonstrate that all phenomena whether insignificant or grand exist in accordance with inexorable law there are some truths however that we never should forget superstition has always been the relentless enemy of science faith has been a hater of demonstration hypocrisy has been sincere only in its dread of truth and all religions are inconsistent with mental freedom since the murder of hypatia in the fifth century when the polished blade of greek philosophy was broken by the club of ignorant catholicism until to-day superstition has detested every effort of reason it is almost impossible to conceive of the completeness of the victory that the church achieved over philosophy for ages science was utterly ignored thought was a poor slave an ignorant priest was master of the world faith put out the eyes of the soul the reason was a trembling coward the imagination was set on fire of hell every human feeling was sought to be suppressed love was considered infinitely sinful pleasure was the road to eternal fire and god was supposed to be happy only when his children were miserable the world was governed by an almighty's whim prayers could change the order of things halt the grand procession of nature could produce rain avert pestilence famine and death in all its forms there was no idea of the certain all depended upon divine pleasure or displeasure rather heaven was full of inconsistent malevolence and earth of ignorance everything was done to appease the divine wrath every public calamity was caused by the sins of the people by a failure to pay tithes or for having even in secret felt a disrespect for a priest to the poor multitude the earth was a kind of enchanted forest full of demons ready to devour and theological serpents lurking with infinite power to fascinate and torture the unhappy and impotent soul life to them was a dim and mysterious labyrinth in which they wandered weary and lost guided by priests as bewildered as themselves without knowing that at every step the ariadne of reason offered them the long-lost clue 
the very heavens were full of death the lightning was regarded as the glittering vengeance of god and the earth was thick with snares for the unwary feet of man the soul was supposed to be crowded with the wild beasts of desire the heart to be totally corrupt prompting only to crime virtues were regarded as deadly sins in disguise there was a continual warfare being waged between the deity and the devil for the possession of every soul the latter generally being considered victorious the flood the tornado the volcano were all evidences of the displeasure of heaven and the sinfulness of man the blight that withered the frost that blackened the earthquake that devoured were the messengers of the creator the world was governed by fear against all the evils of nature there was known only the defense of prayer of fasting of credulity and devotion man in his helplessness endeavored to soften the heart of god the faces of the multitude were blanched with fear and wet with tears they were the prey of hypocrites kings and priests my heart bleeds when i contemplate the sufferings endured by the millions now dead of those who lived when the world appeared to be insane when the heavens were filled with an infinite horror who snatched babes with dimpled hands and rosy cheeks from the white breasts of mothers and dashed them into an abyss of eternal flame slowly beautifully like the coming of the dawn came the grand truth that the universe is governed by law that disease fastens itself upon the good and upon the bad that the tornado cannot be stopped by counting beads that the rushing lava pauses not for bended knees the lightning for clasped and uplifted hands nor the cruel waves of the sea for prayer that paying tides causes rather than prevents famine that pleasure is not sin that happiness is the only good that demons and gods exist only in the imagination that faith is a lullaby sung to put the soul to sleep that devotion is a bribe that fear offers to supposed power that offering rewards in another world for obedience in this is simply buying a soul on credit that knowledge consists in ascertaining the laws of nature and that wisdom is the science of happiness slowly grandly beautifully these things are dawning upon mankind from copernicus we learned that this earth is only a grain of sand on the infinite shore of the universe that everywhere we are surrounded by shining worlds vastly greater than our own all moving and existing in accordance with law true the earth began to grow small but man began to grow great the moment the fact was established that other worlds are governed by law it was only natural to conclude that our little world was also under its dominion the old theological method of accounting for physical phenomena by the pleasure and displeasure of the deity was by the intellectual abandoned they found that disease death life thought heat cold the seasons the winds the dreams of man the instinct of animals in short that all physical and mental phenomena are governed by law absolute eternal and inexorable let it be understood by the term law is meant the same invariable relations of succession and resemblance predicated of all facts springing from like conditions law is a fact not a cause it is a fact that like conditions produce like results this fact is law when we say that the universe is governed by law we mean that this fact called law is incapable of change that it is has been and forever will be the same inexorable immutable fact inseparable from all phenomena law in this sense was not enacted or made it could not have been otherwise than as it is 
that which necessarily exists has no creator only a few years ago this earth was considered the real center of the universe all the stars were supposed to revolve around this insignificant atom the german mind more than any other has done away with this piece of egotism Purbach and Mullerus, in the fifteenth century, contributed most to the advancement of astronomy in their day. To the latter the world is indebted for the introduction of decimal fractions, which completed our arithmetical notation, and formed the second of the three steps by which in modern times the science of numbers has been so greatly improved and yet both of these men believed in the most childish absurdities at least in enough of them to die without their orthodoxy having ever been questioned next came the great copernicus and he stands at the head of the heroic thinkers of his time who had the courage and the mental strength to break the chains of prejudice custom and authority and to establish truth on the basis of experience observation and reason he removed the earth, so to speak, from the center of the universe, and ascribed to it a twofold motion, and demonstrated the true position which it occupies in the solar system. At his bidding the earth began to revolve. At the command of his genius it commenced its grand flight amid the eternal constellations around the sun. For fifty years his discoveries were disregarded all at once by the exertions of galileo they were kindled into so grand a conflagration as to consume the philosophy of aristotle to alarm the hierarchy of rome and to threaten the existence of every opinion not founded upon experience observation and reason the earth was no longer considered a universe governed by the caprices of some revengeful deity who had made the stars out of what he had left after completing the world and had stuck them in the sky simply to adorn the night i have said this much concerning astronomy because it was the first splendid step forward the first sublime blow that shattered the lance and shivered the shield of superstition the first real help that man received from heaven because it was the first great lever placed beneath the altar of a false religion the first revelation of the infinite to man the first authoritative declaration that the universe is governed by law the first science that gave the lie direct to the cosmogony of barbarism and because it is the sublimest victory that reason has achieved in speaking of astronomy i have confined myself to the discoveries made since the revival of learning long ago on the banks of the ganges ages before copernicus lived aryabhata taught that the earth is a sphere and revolves on its own axis this however does not detract from the glory of the great german the discovery of the hindu had been lost in the midnight of europe in the age of faith and copernicus was as much a discoverer as though aryabhata had never lived in this short address there is no time to speak of other sciences and to point out the particular evidence furnished by each to establish the dominion of law nor to more than mention the names of descartes the first who undertook to give an explanation of the celestial motions or who formed the vast and philosophic conception of reducing all phenomena of the universe to the same law of montaigne one of the heroes of common sense of galvani whose experiments gave the telegraph to the world of voltaire who contributed more than any other of the sons of men to the destruction of religious intolerance of august comte whose genius erected to itself a monument that still touches the stars of gutenberg watt stevenson arkwright all soldiers of science in the grand army of the dead kings the glory of science is that it is freeing the soul breaking the mental manacles getting the brain out of bondage giving courage to thought filling the world with mercy justice and joy 
science found agriculture ploughing with a stick reaping with a sickle commerce at the mercy of the treacherous waves and the inconstant winds a world without books without schools man denying the authority of reason employing his ingenuity in the manufacture of instruments of torture in building inquisitions and cathedrals it found the land filled with malicious monks with persecuting protestants and the burners of men it found a world full of fear ignorance on its knees credulity the greatest virtue women treated like beasts of burden cruelty the only means of reformation it found the world at the mercy of disease and famine men trying to read their fates in the stars and to tell their fortunes by signs and wonders generals thinking to conquer their enemies by making the sign of the cross or by telling a rosary it found all history full of petty and ridiculous falsehood and the almighty was supposed to spend most of his time turning sticks into snakes drowning boys for swimming on sunday and killing little children for the purpose of converting their parents it found the earth filled with slaves and tyrants the people in all countries downtrodden half naked half starved without hope and without reason in the world such was the condition of man when the morning of science dawned upon his brain and before he had heard the sublime declaration that the universe is governed by law for the change that has taken place we are indebted solely to science the only lever capable of raising mankind abject faith is barbarism reason is civilization to obey is slavish to act from a sense of obligation perceived by the reason is noble ignorance worships mystery reason explains it the one grovels the other soars no wonder that fable is the enemy of knowledge a man with a false diamond shuns the society of lapidaries and it is upon this principle that superstition abhors science in all ages the people have honored those who dishonored them they have worshipped their destroyers they have canonized the most gigantic liars and buried the great thieves in marble and gold under the loftiest monuments sleep the dust of murder imposture has always worn a crown the world is beginning to change because the people are beginning to think to think is to advance everywhere the great minds are investigating the creeds and the superstitions of men the phenomena of nature and the laws of things at the head of this great army of investigators stood humboldt the serene leader of an intellectual host a king by the suffrage of science and the divine right of genius and today we are not honoring some butcher called a soldier some wily politician called a statesman some robber called a king nor some malicious metaphysician called a saint we are honoring the grand Humboldt, whose victories were all achieved in the arena of thought, who destroyed prejudice, ignorance, and error, not men, who shed light, not blood, and who contributed to the knowledge, the wealth, and the happiness of all mankind. His life was pure, his aims lofty, his learning varied and profound, and his achievements vast we honor him because he has ennobled our race because he has contributed as much as any man living or dead to the real prosperity of the world we honor him because he honored us because he labored for others because he was the most learned man of the most learned nation because he left a legacy of glory to every human being for these reasons he is honored throughout the world millions are doing homage to his genius at this moment and millions are pronouncing his name with reverence and recounting what he accomplished 
we associate the name of humboldt with oceans continents mountains and volcanoes with the great plains the wide deserts the snow-lipped craters of the andes with primeval forests and european capitals with wildernesses and universities with savages and savants with the lonely rivers of unpeopled wastes with the peaks and pampas and steppes and cliffs and crags with the progress of the world with every science known to man and with every star glittering in the immensity of space Humboldt adopted none of the soul-shrinking creeds of his day, wasted none of his time in the stupidities, inanities, and contradictions of theological metaphysics. He did not endeavor to harmonize the astronomy and geology of a barbarous people with the science of the nineteenth century. Never for one moment did he abandon the sublime standard of truth. He investigated, he studied, he thought, he separated the gold from the dross in the crucible of his grand brain. He was never found on his knees before the altar of superstition. He stood erect by the grand, tranquil column of reason. He was an admirer, a lover, an adorer of nature, and at the age of ninety, bowed by the weight of nearly a century, covered with the insignia of honor, loved by a nation, respected by a world, with kings for his servants, he laid his weary head upon her bosom, upon the bosom of the universal mother, and with her loving arms around him, sank into that slumber called death. History added another name to the starry scroll of the immortals. The world is his monument. Upon the eternal granite of her hills he inscribed his name, and there, upon everlasting stone, his genius wrote this, the sublimest of truths. The universe is governed by law. End of Ingersoll's Lecture on Humboldt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during May 2007. Ingersoll's Lecture on Which Way This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ingersoll's Lecture on Which Way, from the collection Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll. Ladies and gentlemen, for thousands of years men have been asking the questions, how shall we civilize the world? How shall we protect life, liberty, property, and reputations? How shall we do away with crime and poverty? How clothe and feed and educate and civilize mankind? These are the questions that are asked by thoughtful men and thoughtful women. The question with them is not, what will we do in some other world? Time enough to ask that when we get there. The business we will attend to now is, how are we to civilize the world? What priest shall I ask? What sacred volume shall I search? What oracle can I consult? At what shrine must I bow to find out what is to be done? Each church has a different answer. Each has a different recipe for the salvation of the people, but not while they are in this world. All that is to be done in this world is to get ready for the next. In the first place, I am met by the theological world. Have I the right to inquire? They say, certainly it is your duty to inquire. Each church has a recipe for the salvation of this world, but not while you are in this world. Afterward, they treat time as a kind of pier, a kind of wharf, running out into the great ocean of eternity. And they treat us all as though we were waiting there, sitting on our trunks for the gospel ship. I want to know what to do here. Have I the right to inquire? Yes. If I have the right to inquire, then I have the right to investigate. 
if i have the right to investigate i have the right to accept if i have the right to accept i have the right to reject and what religion have i the right to reject that which does not conform with my reason with my standard of truth and my standard of common sense millions of men have been endeavoring to govern this world by means of the supernatural thousands and thousands of churches exist thousands of cathedrals and temples have been built millions of men have been engaged to preach this gospel and what has been the result in this world will one church have any sympathy with another does the religion of one country have any respect for that of another or does not each religion claim to be the only one and does not the priest of every religion with infinite impudence consign the disciples of all others to eternal fire why is it the churches have failed to civilize this world why is it that the christian countries are no better than any other countries why is it that christian men are no better than any other men why is it that ministers as a class are no better than doctors or lawyers or merchants or mechanics or locomotive engineers and a locomotive engineer is a thousand times more useful give me a good engineer and a bad preacher to go through this world with rather than a bad engineer and a good preacher and there is this curious fact about the believers in the supernatural the priests of one church have no confidence in the miracles and wonders told by the priests of the other churches maybe they know each other a christian missionary will tell the hindu of the miracles in the bible the hindu smiles the hindu tells the christian missionary of the miracles of his sacred books and the missionary looks upon him with pity and contempt no priest takes the word of another i heard once a little story that illustrates this point a gentleman in a little party was telling of a most wonderful occurrence and when he had finished everybody said is it possible why did you ever hear anything like that all united in a kind of wondering chorus except one man he said nothing he was perfectly still and unmoved and one who had been greatly astonished by the story said to him did you hear that story yes well you don't appear to be excited well no he said i am a liar myself there is another trouble with the supernatural it has no honesty it is consumed by egotism it does not think it knows consequently it has no patience with the honest doubter and how has the church treated the honest doubter he has been answered by force by authority by popes by cardinals and bishops and councils and above all by mobs in that way the honest doubter has been answered there is this difference between the minister the church the clergy and the men who believe in this world i might as well state the question i may go further than you the real question is this are we to be governed by a supernatural being or are we to govern ourselves that is the question is god the source of power or does all authority spring in governing from the consent of the governed that is the question in other words is the universe a monarchy a despotism or a democracy i take the democratic side not in a political sense the question is whether this world should be governed by god or by man and when i say god i mean the being that these gentlemen have treated and enthroned upon the ignorance of mankind now let us admit for the sake of argument that the bible is true let us admit for the sake of argument that god once governed this world not that he did but let us admit it and i intend to speak of no god but our god because we all insist that of all the gods ours is the best and if he is not good we need not trouble ourselves about the others let them take care of themselves now the first question is whether this world shall be governed by god or man admitting that the being spoken of in the bible is god he governed this world once there was a theocracy at the start that was the first government of the world now how do you judge of a man 
the best test of a man is how does he use power that is the supreme test of manhood how does he treat those within his control the greater the man the grander the man the more careful he is in the use of power the tenderer he is the nearer just the greater the more merciful the grander the more charitable tell me how a man treats his wife or his children his poor debtors his servants and i will tell you what manner of a man he be that i say is the supreme test and we know to-night how a good and great man treats his inferiors we know that and a man endeavoring to raise his fellow-men higher in the scale of civilization what will that man appeal to will he appeal to the lowest or to the highest that is in man let us be honest will he appeal to prejudice the fortress the armor the sword and shield of ignorance will he appeal to credulity the ring in the nose by which priests lead stupidity will he appeal to the cowardly man will he play upon his fears fear the capital stock of imposture the lever and fulcrum of hypocrisy will he appeal to the selfishness and all the slimy serpents that crawl in the den of savagery or will he appeal to reason the torch of the mind will he appeal to justice will he appeal to charity which is justice in blossom will he appeal to liberty and love these are the questions what will he do what did our god do let us see the first thing we know of him is in the garden of eden how did he endeavor to make his children great and strong and good and free did he say anything to adam and eve about the sacred relation of marriage did he say anything to them about loving children did he say anything to them about learning anything under heaven did he say one word about intellectual liberty did he say one word about reason or about justice did he make the slightest effort to improve them all that he did in the world was to give them one poor little miserable barren command thou shalt not eat of a certain fruit that's all that amounted to anything and when they sinned did this great god take them in the arms of his love and endeavor to reform them no he simply put on them a curse when they were expelled he said to the woman i will greatly multiply thy sorrow in sorrow shalt thou bring forth children thy husband shall rule over thee god made every mother a criminal and placed a perpetual penalty of pain upon human love our god made wives slaves slaves of their husbands our god corrupted the marriage relation and paralyzed the firesides of this world that is what our god did and what did he say to poor adam cursed be the ground for thy sake in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread did he say one word calculated to make him a better man did he put in the horizon of the future one star of hope let us be honest and see what this god did and we will judge of him simply by ordinary common sense after a while cain murdered his brother and he was detected by this god and what did this god say to him did he say one word of the crime of shedding human blood not a word did he say one word calculated to excite in the breast of cain the slightest sorrow for his deed not the slightest did he tell him anything about where abel was nothing did he endeavor to make him a better man not a bit what had he ever taught him before on that subject nothing and so cain went out to the other sons and daughters of adam according to the bible and they multiplied and increased until they covered the earth god gave them no code of laws god never built them a schoolhouse god never sent a teacher god never said a word to them about a future state 
god never held up before their gaze that dazzling reward of heaven never spoke about the lurid gulfs of hell kept divine punishment a perfect secret and without having given them the slightest opportunity simply drowned the world splendid administration cleveland will do better than that and after the waters had gone away then he gave them some commandments i suppose that he saw by that time that they needed guidance and here are the commandments one you may eat all kinds of birds beasts and fishes two you must not eat blood if you do i will kill you three whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed nothing more no good advice not a word about government not a word about the rights of man or woman or children not a word about any law of nature not a word about any science nothing not even arithmetic nothing and so he let them go on and in a little while they came to the same old state and began building the tower of babel and he went there and confounded as they said their languages never said a word to them never told them how foolish it was to try and reach heaven that way and the next we find him talking to abraham and with abraham he makes a contract and how did he do it i will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee fine contract for a god and thereupon he made certain promises to abraham promised to give him the whole world all the nations round about and that his seed should be as the sands of the sea never kept one of his promises not one he made the same promises to isaac and broke every one then he made them all over to jacob and broke every one made them again to moses and broke them all never said a word about anybody behaving themselves not a word finally these people whom he had taken under his special care became slaves in the land of egypt how ashamed god must have been finally he made up his mind to rescue them from that servitude and he sent moses and aaron he never said a word to moses or aaron that pharaoh was wrong he never said a word to them about how the women felt when their male children were taken and destroyed he simply sent moses before pharaoh with a cane in his hand that he could turn into a serpent and when pharaoh called in magicians and they did the same pharaoh laughed and then they made frogs and pharaoh sent for his magicians and they did the same and pharaoh still laughed and this god had infinite power but pharaoh defeated him at every point it puts me in mind of the story that great fenian told when the great excitement was about ireland an irishman was telling about the condition of ireland he said we have got in ireland now over three hundred thousand soldiers all equipped every man of them has got a musket and ammunition they are ready to march at a minute's notice but said the other man why don't they march why said the other man the police won't let them how admirable imagine the infinite god endeavoring to liberate the hebrews and prevented by a king who would not let the children of israel go until he had done some little miracles with sticks think of it but said christians you must wait a little while if you wish to find the foundation of law christians now assert that from sinai came to this world all knowledge of right and wrong and that from its flaming top we received the first ideas of law and justice let us look at those ten commandments which of those ten commandments were new and which of those ten commandments were old thou shalt not kill that was as old as life murder has been a crime also because men object to being murdered if you read the same bible you will find that moses seeing an israelite and an egyptian contending together smote the egyptian and hid his body in the sand after he had committed that crime moses fled from the land 
Why? Simply because there was a law against murder. That is all. Honor thy father and thy mother. That is as old as birth. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That is as old as sex. Thou shalt not steal. That is as old as work, and as old as property. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. That is as old as the earth. Never was there a nation, never was there a tribe on the earth that did not have, substantially, those commandments. What then were new? First, thou shalt worship no other god. Thou shalt have no other god. Why? Because I am a jealous god. Second, thou shalt not make any graven image. Third, thou shalt not take my name in vain. Fourth, thou shalt not work on the Sabbath day. What use were these commandments? None, not the slightest. How much better it would have been if God from Sinai, instead of the commandments, had said, Thou shalt not enslave thy fellow man. No human being is entitled to the results of another's labor. Suppose he had said, Thou shalt not persecute for opinion's sake. Thought and speech must be forever free. Suppose he had said, instead of thou shalt not work on the Sabbath day, a man shall have but one wife, a woman shall have but one husband, husbands shall love their wives, wives shall love their husbands and their children with all their hearts and as themselves. How much better it would have been for this world. Long before Moses was born, the Egyptians taught one God, but afterwards, I believe, in their weakness, they degenerated into a belief in the Trinity. They taught the divine origin of the soul, and taught judgment after death. They taught, as a reward for belief in their doctrine, eternal joy, and as a punishment for non-belief, eternal pain. Egypt, as a matter of fact, was far better governed than Palestine. The laws of Egypt were better than the laws of God. In Egypt, woman was equal with man. Long before Moses was born, there were queens upon the Egyptian throne. Long before Moses was born, they had a written code of laws, and their laws were administered by courts and judges. They had rules of evidence. They understood the philosophy of damages. Long before Moses was born, they had asylums for the insane and hospitals for the sick. Long before God appeared on Sinai, there were schools in Egypt, and the highest office next to the throne was opened to the successful scholar. The Egyptian married but one wife. His wife was called the Lady of the House. Women were not secluded, and above all and over all, the people of Egypt were not divided into castes, and were infinitely better governed than God ever thought of. I am speaking of the God of this Bible. If Moses had remembered more of what he saw in Egypt, his government would have been far better than it was. Long before these commandments were given, Zoroaster taught the Hindus that there was one infinite and supreme God. They had a code of laws, and their laws were administered by judges in their courts. By those laws, at the death of a father, the unmarried daughter received twice as much of his property as his son. Compare those laws with the laws of Moses. So, too, the Romans had their code of laws. The Romans were the greatest lawyers the world produced. The Romans had a code of civil laws, and that code today is the foundation of all law in the civilized world. The Romans built temples to truth, to faith, to valor, to concord, to modesty, to charity, and to chastity. And so with the Grecians. And yet you will find Christian ministers today contending that all ideas of law, of justice, and of right came from Sinai, from the Ten Commandments, from the Mosaic Laws. 
no lawyer who understands his profession will claim that is so no lawyer who has studied the history of law will claim it no man who knows history itself will claim it no man will claim it but an ignorant zealot let us go another step let us compare the ideas of this god with the ideas of uninspired men i am making this long preface because i want to get it out of your minds that the bible is inspired now let us go along a little and see what is god's opinion of liberty nothing is of more value in this world today than liberty liberty of body and liberty of mind without liberty the universe would be as a dungeon into which human beings are flung like poor and miserable convicts intellectual liberty is the air of the soul the sunshine of the mind without it we should be in darkness now Jehovah commanded the Jewish people to take captive the strangers and sojourners amongst them, and ordered that they and their children should be bondsmen and bondswomen forever. Now let us compare Jehovah to Epictetus, a man to whom no revelation was ever made, a man to whom this God did not appear. Let us listen to him. Remember your servants are to be treated as your own brothers, children of the same God. On the subject of liberty, is not Epictetus a better authority than Jehovah, who told the Jews to make bondsmen and bondswomen of the heathen round about? And he said they were to make them their bondsmen and bondswomen forever. Why? Because they were heathen. Why? Because they were not children of the Jews. He was the God of the Jews, and not the rest of mankind. So he said to his chosen people, Pillage upon the enemy, and destroy the people of other gods. Bury the heathen round about. Yet Cicero, a poor pagan lawyer, said this, and he had not even read the Old Testament, had not even had the advantage of being enlightened by the prophets. They who say that we should love our fellow citizens and not foreigners destroy the universal brotherhood of mankind, and with it benevolence and justice would perish forever. Is not Cicero greater than Jehovah? The Bible, inspired by Jehovah, says, If a man smite his servant with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall be punished if he continue a day or two and then die he shall not be punished zeno the founder of the stoics who had never heard of jehovah and never read a word of moses said this no man can be the owner of another and the title is bad whether the slave became a slave by conquest or by purchase the title is bad let us come and see whether Jehovah has any humanity in him. Jehovah ordered the Jewish general to make war, and this was the order. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. And yet Epictetus, whom I have already quoted, said, Treat those in thy power as thou wouldst have thy superiors treat thee. I am on the side of the pagan. Is it possible that a being of infinite goodness said, I will heap mischief upon them, I will send my arrows upon them, they shall be burned with hunger, they shall be devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction? I will also send the teeth of locusts upon them, with the poisonous serpent of the desert, the sound without and the terror within shall destroy both the young men and the virgins, the sucklings also, and the men with gray hairs. While Seneca, a poor uninspired Roman, said, A wise man will not pardon any crime that ought to be punished, but will accomplish in other way all that is sought. He will spare some, he will pardon and watch over some, because of their youth, he will pardon these on account of their ignorance. His clemency will not fail what is sought by justice, but his clemency will fulfill justice. That was said by Seneca. 
can we believe that this jehovah said let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow let his children be continually vagabonds and beg let them seek their bread out of desolate places let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let the stranger spoil his labor let no one extend mercy unto them neither let any favor his fatherless children did jehovah say this surely he had never heard this line this plaintive music from the hindu sweet is the lute to those who have not heard the voices of their own children let us see the generosity of jehovah out of the cloud of darkness on mount sinai he said to the jews thou shalt have no other god before me thou shalt not bow down to any other gods for the lord thy god is a jealous god visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me just think of god saying to people if you do not love me i will damn you contrast this with the words put by the hindu poet into the mouth of brahma i am the same to all mankind they who honestly worship other gods involuntarily worship me i am he that partaketh of all worship i am the reward of worship how perfectly sublime let me read it to you again i am the same to all mankind they who honestly worship other gods involuntarily worship me i am he that partaketh of all worship i am the reward of worship compare these passages the first is a dungeon which crude hands have digged with jealous slime the other is like the dome of the firmament inlaid with constellations is it possible god ever said if a prophet deceive when he hath spoken a thing i the lord hath deceived that prophet compare that passage with the poet a pagan better remain silent the remainder of life than speak falsely can we believe a being of infinite mercy gave this command put every man his sword by his side go from the gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother every man his companion and every man his neighbor consecrate it yourselves this day let every man lay his sword even upon his son upon his brother that he bestow blessing upon me this day surely that was not the outcome of a great magnanimous spirit like that of the roman emperor who declared i had rather keep a single roman citizen alive than slay a thousand enemies compare the last command given to the children of israel with the words of marcus aurelius i have formed an idea of the state in which there is the same law for all and equal rights and equal liberty of speech established for all an empire where nothing is honored so much as the freedom of the citizens i am on the side of the roman emperor what is more beautiful than the old story from sufi there was a man who for seven years did every act of good every kind of charity and at the end of the seven years he mounted the steps to the gate of heaven and knocked a voice cried who is there he cried thy servant o lord and the gates were shut seven other years he did every good work and again mounted the steps to heaven and knocked the voice cried who is there he answered thy slave o god and the gates were shut seven other years he did every good deed and again mounted the steps to heaven and the voice said who is there he replied thyself o god and the gates wide open flew is there anything in our religion so warm or so beautiful as that compare that story from a pagan with the presbyterian religion 
take this story of Indistora, who was a king of Egypt, and started for the place where the horizon touched the earth, where he was to meet God. With him followed Argoon and Bemis and Trabashan. They were taught that when any man started after God in that way, if he had been guilty of any crime, he would fall by the way. Indesthora walked at the head, and suddenly he missed Argoon. He said he was not always merciful in the hour of victory. A little while after he missed Bemis, and said he fought not so much for the rights of man as for his own glory. A little farther on he missed Traubation. He said, My God, I know no reason for his failing to reach the place where the horizon touches the earth and the god Ram appeared to him, and opening the curtains of the sky said to him, Enter. And Indistora said, But where are my brethren? Where are Arjun and Banus and Traubation? And the god said, They sinned in their time, and they are condemned to suffer below. Then said Indisora, I do not wish to enter into your heaven without my friends. If they are below, then I will join them. But the god said, They are here before you. I simply said this to try your soul. Indisora simply turned and said, But what of my dog? The god said, Thou knowest that if the shadow of a dog fall upon the sacrifice it is unclean. How then can a dog enter heaven? And Indisthora replies, I know that, and I know another thing, that ingratitude is the blackest of crimes, whether it be to man or beast. That dog has been my faithful friend. He has followed me, and I will not desert even him. And the god said, Let the dog follow. Compare that with the Bible stories. Long before the advent of Christ, Aristotle said we should conduct ourselves towards others as we would have them conduct themselves toward us. Seneca said, Do not to your neighbor what you would not have your neighbor do to you. Socrates said, Act toward others as you would have others act toward you. Forgive your enemies, render good for evil, and kiss even the hand that is upraised to smite. Krishna said, Cease to do evil. Aim to do well. Love your enemies. It is the law of love that virtue is the only thing that has strength. Poor, miserable pagans! Did you ever hear anything like this? Is it possible that one of the authors of the New Testament was inspired when he said that man was not created for woman, but woman for man? Epictetus said, What is more delightful than to be so dear to your wife as to be on her account dearer even to yourself? Compare that with St. Paul. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. That was inspiration. This was written by a poor, despised heathen. In whatever house the husband is contented with the wife, and the wife with the husband, in that house will fortune dwell. In the house where the woman is not honored, let the curse be pronounced. Where the wife is honored, there God is truly worshipped. I wish Jehovah had said something like that from Sinai. Is there anything as beautiful as this in the New Testament? Shall I tell you where nature is more blessed and fair? It is where those we love abide. Though the space be small, it is ample as earth. Though it be a desert, through it run the rivers of paradise. Compare these things with the curses pronounced in the Old Testament, where you read of the heathen being given over to butchery and death, and the women and babes to destruction. And after you have read them, read the chapters of horror in the New Testament, threatening eternal fire and flame, and then read this, 
the greatest thought uttered by the greatest of human beings the quality of mercy is not strained it droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath it is twice blessed it blesseth him that gives and him that takes tis mightiest in the mighty it becomes the throned monarch better than his crown compare that with your doctrine of the new testament if jehovah was an infinite god and knew things from the beginning he knew that his bible would be a breastwork behind which tyranny and hypocrisy would crouch and knew his bible would be the auction block on which the mother would stand while her babe was sold from her because he knew his bible would be quoted by tyrants that it would be quoted in defense of robbers called kings and by hypocrites called priests he knew that he had taught the jewish people he knew that he had found them free and left them slaves he knew that he had broken every single promise made to them he knew that while other nations advanced in knowledge in art in science his chosen people were subjects still he promised them the world he gave them a desert he promised them liberty and made them slaves he promised them power he gave them exile and any one who reads the old testament is compelled to say that nothing could add to their misery let us be honest how do you account for this religion this world where did it come from you hear every minister say that man is a religious animal that religion is natural while man is an ignorant animal man will be a theological animal and no longer where did we get this religion the savage knew but little of nature but thought that everything happened in reference to him he thought his sins caused earthquakes and that his virtues made the sunshine nothing is so egotistical as ignorance you know and so do i that if no human being existed the sun would shine and that tempests would now and then devastate the earth violets would spread their velvet bosoms to the sun daisies would grow roses would fill the air with perfume and now and then volcanoes would illuminate the horizon with their lurid glare the grass would grow the waters would run and so far as nature is concerned everything would be as joyous as though the earth were filled with happy homes we know the barbarian savage thinks that all this was on his account he thinks that there dwelt two very powerful deities that there was a good one because he knows good things happened to him and that there was a bad one because he knows bad things happened to him behind the evil influence he puts a devil and behind the good an intention of god and then he imagines both these beings are in opposition and that between them they struggle for the possession of his ignorant soul he also thinks that the place where the good deity lives is heaven and that the place where the other deity keeps himself is a place of torture and punishment and about that time other barbarians have chosen to keep the ignorant ones in subjection by means of the doctrine of fear and punishment there is no reforming power in fear you can scare a man maybe so bad that he won't do a thing but you can't scare him so bad he won't want to do it there is no reforming power in punishment or brute force but our barbarians rather imagine that every being would punish in accordance with his power and his dignity and that god would subject them to torture in the same way as those who made him angry they knew the king would inflict torments upon one in his power and they suppose that god would inflict torture according to his power they knew the worst torture was a slow burning fire added to it the idea of eternity and hell was produced that was their idea all meanness revenge selfishness cruelty and hatred of which men here are capable burst into blossom and bore fruit in that one word hell 
In this way, a god of infinite wisdom experimented with man, keeping him between an outstretched abyss beneath and a heaven above. And in time, the man came to believe that he could please God by having read a few sacred books, could count beads, could sprinkle water, eat little square pieces of bread, and that he could shut his eyes and say words to the clouds. But the moment he left this world, nothing remained except to damn him. He was to be kept miserable one day in seven, and he could slander and persecute other men all the other days in the week. That was the chance that God gave a man here. But the moment he left this world, that settled it. He would go to eternal pain, or else to eternal joy. That was the way that the supernatural governed this world, through fear, through terror, through eternity of punishment. And that government, I say tonight, has failed. How has it been kept alive so long? It was born in ignorance. Let me tell you, whoever attacks a creed will be confronted with a list of great men who have believed in it. Probably their belief in that creed was the only weakness they had. But he will be asked, so you know more than all the great men who have taught and all the respectable men who have believed in that faith for the church is always going about to get a certificate from some governor or even perhaps members of the legislature and you are told because so-and-so believed all these things and you have no more talents than they that you should believe the same thing but I contend as against this argument that you should not take the testimony of these men unless you are willing to take at the same time all their beliefs on other subjects. Then again they tell you that the rich people are all on their side, and I say so too. The churches today seek the rich, and poverty unwillingly seeks them. Light thrown from diamonds adorns the repentant here. We are told that the rich, the fortunate, and the holders of place are Christians now. And yet ministers grow eloquent over the poverty of Christ, who was born in a manger, and say that the Holy Ghost passed the titled ladies of the world and selected the wife of a poor mechanic for the mother of God. Such is the difference between theory and practice. The church condemns the men of Jerusalem who held positions and who held the pretensions of the Savior in contempt. They admit that he was so little known that they had to bribe a man to point him out to the soldiers. They assert that he performed miracles, yet he remained absolutely unknown, hidden in the depth of obscurity. No one knew him, and one of his disciples had to be bribed to point him out. Surely he and his disciples could have met the arguments which were urged against their religion at that time. So long as the church honored philosophers, she kept her great men in the majority. How is it now? I say tonight that no man of genius in the world is in the orthodox pulpit, so far as I know. Where are they? Where are the orthodox great men? I challenge the Christian church to produce a man like Alexander Humboldt. I challenge the world to produce a naturalist like Hegel. I challenge the Christian world to produce a man like Darwin. Where in the ranks of orthodoxy are historians like Draper and Buckle? Where are the naturalists like Tyndall, philosophers like Mills and Spencer, and women like George Eliot and Harriet Martineau? You may get tired of the great men argument, but the names of the great thinkers and naturalists and scientists of our time cannot be matched by the supernatural world. What is the next argument they will bring forward? The father and mother argument. You must not disgrace your parents. How did Christ come to leave the religion of his mother? That argument proves too much. There is one way every man can honor his mother. That is by finding out more than she knew. There is one way a man can honor his father, by correcting the old man's errors. 
most people imagine that the creed we have came from the brain and heart of christ they have no idea how it was made they think it was all made at one time they don't understand that it was a slow growth they don't understand that theology is a science made up of mistakes prejudices and falsehoods let me tell you a few facts the emperor constantine who lifted the christian religion into power murdered his wife and his eldest son the very year that he convened the council of nice to decide whether jesus christ was man or god and that was not decided until the year of grace three twenty five then theodosius called a council at constantinople in three eighty one and this council decided that the holy ghost proceeded from the father you see there was a little doubt on that question before this was done then another council was called later to determine who the virgin mary really was and it was solemnly decided that she was the mother of christ in four thirty one and then in four fifty one a council was held in chalcedon by the emperor martian and that decided that christ had two natures a human and a divine in six eighty another council was held at constantinople and in twelve seventy four at lyons it was decided that the holy ghost proceeded not only from the father but from the son and when you take into consideration the fact that a belief in the trinity is absolutely essential to salvation you see how important it was that these doctrines should have been established in twelve seventy four when millions of people had dropped into hell in the interim solely because they had forgotten that question at last we know how religions are made we know how miracles are manufactured we know the history of relics and bones and pieces of the true cross and at last we understand apostolic succession at last we have examined other religions and we find them all the same and we are beginning to suspect that ours is like the rest i think we understand it i read a little story a short time ago from the japanese that throws light upon the question there was an old priest at a monastery this monastery was built over the bones of what he called a saint and people came there and were cured of many diseases this priest had an assistant after the assistant grew up and got quite to understand his business the old priest gave him a little donkey and told him that henceforth he was to take care of himself the young priest started out with his little donkey and asked alms of those he met few gave to him finally he got very poor he could not raise money enough to feed the donkey finally the donkey died he was about to bury it when a thought occurred to him he buried the donkey and sat down on the grave and to the next stranger that passed he said will you not give a little money to erect a shrine over the bones of a sinless one thereupon a man gave money others followed his example a shrine was raised and in a little while a monastery was built over the bones of the sinless one down in the grave the young priest made an orifice so that persons afflicted with any disease could reach down and touch the bones of the sinless one hundreds were thus cured and persons left their crutches as testimonials to the miraculous power of the bones of the sinless one finally the priest became so rich that he thought he would visit his old master he went to the old monastery with a fine retinue his old master asked him how he became so rich and prosperous he replied old age is stupid but youth has thought later on he explained to the old priest how the donkey had died and how he had raised a monastery over the bones of the sinless one and again reminded him that old age is stupid but youth has thought the old priest exclaimed not quite so fast young man not quite so fast don't imagine you worked out anything new this shrine of mine is built over the bones of the mother of your little donkey 
we have now reached a point in the history of the world when we know that theocracy as a form of government is a failure and we see that theology as a foundation of government is an absolute failure we can see that theocracy and theology created not liberty but despotism we know enough of the history of the churches in this world to know that they never can civilize mankind that they are not imbued with the spirit of progress that they are not imbued with the spirit of justice and mercy what i ask you tonight is what has the church done to civilize mankind what has the church done for us how has it added to the prosperity of this world has it ever produced anything nothing why they say it has been charitable how can a beggar be charitable a beggar produces nothing the church has been an eternal and everlasting pauper it is not charitable it is an object of charity and yet it claims to be charitable the giver is the charitable one somebody who has made something somebody who has by his labor produced something he alone can be charitable and let me say another thing the church is always on the wrong side let us take first the episcopal church if you call that a church let me tell you one thing about that church you know what is called the rebellion in england in sixteen eighty eight do you know what caused it i will tell you king james was a catholic and notwithstanding that fact he issued an edict of toleration for the dissenters and catholics and what next did he do he ordered all the bishops to have this edict of toleration read in the episcopal churches they refused to do it most of them you recollect that trial of the seven bishops that is what it was all about they would not read the edict of toleration then what happened a strange thing to say and it is one of the miracles of this world the dissenters in whose favor that edict was issued joined hands with the episcopalians and raised the rebellion against the king because he wanted to give the dissenters liberty and these dissenters and these episcopalians on account of toleration drove king james into exile this is the history of the first rebellion the church of england ever raised against the king simply because he issued an edict of toleration and the poor miserable wretches in whose favor the edict was issued joined hands with their oppressors i want to show you how much the church of england has done for england I get it from good authority. Let me read it to you to show how little influence the Christian Church, the Church of England, had with the government of that country. Let me tell you that up to the reign of George I, there were in that country sixty-seven offenses punishable with death. There is not a lawyer in this city who can think of those offenses and write them down in one day. Think of it, sixty-seven offenses punishable with death now between the accession of george the first and the termination of the reign of george the third there were added a hundred and fifty-nine new crimes punishable with death making in all two hundred and twenty-three crimes in england punishable with death there is no lawyer in this state who can think of that many crimes in a week now during all those years the government was becoming more and more cruel more and more barbarous and we do not find and we have not found that the church of england with its fifteen thousand or twenty thousand ministers with its more than a score of bishops in the house of lords has ever raised its voice or perfected any organization in favor of a more merciful code or in condemnation of the enormous cruelty which the laws were continually inflicting and was not voltaire justified in saying that the english were a people who murdered by law now that is an extract from a speech made by john bright in may eighteen eighty three that shows what the church of england did two hundred and twenty three offences in england punishable with death and no minister no bishop no church organization raising his or its voice against the monstrous cruelty and why 
even then it was better than the law of jehovah and the protestants were as bad as the catholics you remember the time of henry the fourth in france when the edict of nantes was issued simply to give the protestants the right to worship god according to the dictates of their conscience just as soon as that edict was issued the protestants themselves in the cities where they had power prevented the catholics from worshiping their god according to the dictates of their conscience and it was on account of the refusal of those protestants to allow the catholics to worship god as they desired that there was a civil war lasting for seven years in france richelieu came into authority about the second or third year of that war he made no difference between protestants and catholics and it was owing to richelieu that the thirty years war terminated it was owing to richelieu that the peace of westphalia was made in sixteen forty three although i believe he had been dead a year before that time but it was owing to him and it was the first peace ever made between nations on a secular basis with everything religious left out and it was the last great religious war you may ask me what i want well in the first place I want to get theology out of government. It has no business there. Man gets his authority from man, and is responsible only to man. I want to get theology out of politics. Our ancestors in 1776 retired God from politics because of the jealousies among the churches, and the result has been splendid for mankind i want to get theology out of education teach the children what somebody knows not what somebody guesses i want to get theology out of morality and out of charity don't give for god's sake but for man's sake i want you to know another thing that neither protestants nor catholics are fit to govern this world they are not fit to govern themselves. How could you elect a minister of any religion president of the United States? Could you elect a bishop of the Catholic Church, or a Methodist bishop, or Episcopal minister, or one of the elders? No. And why? We are afraid of the ecclesiastic spirit. We are afraid to trust the liberties of men in the hands of people who acknowledge that they are bound by a standard different from that of the welfare of mankind. The history of Italy, France, Spain, Portugal, Cuba, and Brazil all show that slavery existed where Catholicism was a power. I would suggest an education that would rule theology out of the government, and teach people to rely more on themselves and less on providence. There are two ways of living. The broad way of life, lived for others, and the narrow theological way. It is wise to so live that death can be serenely faced, and then if there is another world, the best way to prepare for it is to make the best of this and if there be no other world the best way to live here is to so live as to be happy and make everybody else happy end ingersoll's lecture on which way this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain ingersoll's lecture on which way from the book Lectures of Colonel R. G. Ingersoll, read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during June 2007.